Chapter One of Chrome Yellow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. Chapter One along this particular stretch of line no express had ever passed all the trains the few that there were stopped at all the stations dennis knew the names of those stations by heart bowl tritton spavin delaware nipswich for timpany west bowlby and finally camlot on the water camlot was where he always got out leaving the train to creep indolently onward goodness only knew whither into the green heart of england they were snorting out of west bowlby now it was the next station thank heaven dennis took his chattels off the rack and piled them neatly in the corner opposite his own a futile proceeding but one must have something to do when he had finished he sank back into his seat and closed his eyes it was extremely hot oh this journey it was two hours cut clean out of his life two hours in which he might have done so much so much written the perfect poem for example or read the one illuminating book instead of which his gorge rose at the smell of the dusty cushions against which he was leaning two hours one hundred and twenty minutes anything might be done in that time anything nothing oh he had had hundreds of hours and what had he done with them wasted them spilt the precious minutes as though his reservoir were inexhaustible dennis groaned in the spirit condemned himself utterly with all his works what right had he to sit in the sunshine to occupy corner seats in third-class carriages to be alive none 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 misery and a nameless nostalgic distress possessed them he was twenty-three and oh so agonizingly conscious of the fact the train came bumpingly to a halt here was camlet at least Dennis jumped up, crammed his hat over his eyes, deranged his pile of baggage, leaned out of the window and shouted for a porter, seized a bag in either hand, and had to put them down again in order to open the door. When at last he had safely bundled himself and his baggage onto the platform, he ran up the train towards the van. A bicycle, a bicycle, he said breathlessly to the guard. He felt himself a man of action. The guard paid no attention but continued methodically to hand out one by one the packages labelled to camlet a bicycle dennis repeated a green machine cross-framed name of stone s t o n e all in good time sir said the guard soothingly he was a large stately man with a naval beard one pictured him at home drinking tea surrounded by a numerous family it was in that tone that he must have spoken to his children when they were tiresome all in good time sir dennis's man of action collapsed punctured he left his luggage to be called for later and pushed off on his bicycle he always took his bicycle when he went into the country it was part of the theory of exercise one day one would get up at six o'clock and pedal away to kenilworth or stratford-on-avon anywhere and within a radius of twenty miles there were always norman churches and tudor mansions to be seen in the course of an afternoon's excursion somehow they never did get seen but all the same it was nice to feel that the bicycle was there and that one fine morning one really might get up at six once at the top of the long hill which led up from camlet station he felt his spirits mounting the world he found was good the faraway blue hills the harvest whitening on the slopes of the ridge along which his road led him the treeless skylines that changed as he moved yes they were all good he was overcome by the beauty of those deeply embayed combs scooped in the flanks of the ridge beneath him curves curves he repeated the words slowly trying as he did so to find some term in which to give expression to his appreciation curves no that was inadequate he made a gesture with his hand as though to scoop the achieved expression out of the air and almost fell off his bicycle what was the word to describe the curves of those little valleys they were as fine as the lines of a human body they were informed with the subtlety of art Galb. that was a good word but it was french le gobe evasé de zéhonche 
had one ever read a french novel in which that phrase didn't occur some day he would compile a dictionary for the use of novelists gal gonflé goulou parfum peau pervers podelé poudre vertu volupté but he really must find that word curves curves those little valleys had the lines of a cup moulded round a woman's breast they seemed the dinted imprints of some huge divine body that had rested on these hills cumbrous locutions these but through them he seemed to be getting nearer to what he wanted dinted dimpled wimpled his mind wandered down echoing corridors of assonance and alliteration ever further and further from the point he was enamoured with the beauty of words becoming once more aware of the outer world he found himself on the crest of a descent the road plunged down steep and straight into a considerable valley there on the opposite slope a little higher up the valley stood crome his destination he put on his brakes this view of crome was pleasant to linger over the façade with its three projecting towers rose precipitously from among the dark trees of the garden the house basked in full sunlight the old brick rosily glowed how ripe and rich it was how superbly mellow and at the same time how austere the hill was becoming steeper and steeper he was gaining speed in spite of his brakes he loosed his grip of the levers and in a moment was rushing headlong down five minutes later he was passing through the gate of the great courtyard the front door stood hospitably open he left his bicycle leaning against the wall and walked in he would take them by surprise end of chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two he took nobody by surprise there was nobody to take all was quiet dennis wandered from room to empty room looking with pleasure at the familiar pictures and furniture at all the little untidy signs of life that lay scattered here and there he was rather glad that they were all out it was amusing to wander through the house as though one were exploring a dead deserted pompeii what sort of life would the excavator reconstruct from these remains how would he people these empty chambers there was the long gallery with its rows of respectable and though of course one couldn't publicly admit it rather boring italian primitives its chinese sculptures its unobtrusive dateless furniture there was the panelled drawing-room where the huge chintz-covered armchairs stood oases of comfort among the austere flesh-mortifying antiques there was the morning-room with its pale lemon walls its painted venetian chairs and rococo tables its mirrors its modern pictures there was the library cool spacious and dark book-lined from floor to ceiling rich in portentous folios there was the dining-room solidly port winily english with its great mahogany table its eighteenth-century chairs and sideboard its eighteenth-century pictures family portraits meticulous animal paintings what could one reconstruct from such data there was much of henry wimbush in the long gallery in the library something of anne perhaps in the morning-room that was all among the accumulations of ten generations the living had left but few traces lying on the table in the morning-room he saw his own book of poems what tact he picked it up and opened it it was what the reviewers call a slim volume he read at hazard but silence and the topless dark vault in the lights of luna park and blackpool from the nightly gloom hollows a bright tumultuous tomb he put it down again shook his head and sighed what genius i had then he reflected echoing the aged swift it was nearly six months since the book had been published he was glad to think he would never write anything of the same sort again who could have been reading it he wondered and perhaps he liked to think so perhaps too she had at last recognized herself in the hamadryad of the poplar sapling the slim hamadryad whose movements were like the swaying of a young tree in the wind the woman who was a tree was what he had called the poem 
he had given her the book when it had come out hoping that the poem would tell her what he hadn't dared to say she had never referred to it he shut his eyes and saw a vision of her in a red velvet cloak swaying into the little restaurant where they sometimes dined together in london three quarters of an hour late and he at his table haggard with anxiety irritation hunger oh she was damnable it occurred to him that perhaps his hostess might be in her boudoir it was a possibility he would go and see mrs wimbush's boudoir was in the central tower on the garden front a little staircase corkscrewed up to it from the hall dennis mounted tapped at the door come in ah she was there he had rather hoped she wouldn't be he opened the door priscilla wimbush was lying on the sofa a blotting-pad rested on her knees and she was thoughtfully sucking the end of a silver pencil hello she said looking up i'd forgotten you were coming well here i am i'm afraid said dennis deprecatingly i'm awfully sorry mrs wimbush laughed her voice her laughter were deep and masculine everything about her was manly she had a large square middle-aged face with a massive projecting nose and little greenish eyes the whole surmounted by a lofty and elaborate coiffure of a curiously improbable shade of orange looking at her dennis always thought of wilkie bard as the cantatrice that's why i'm going to sing an opera sing an opera sing an op 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 opera today she was wearing a purple silk dress with a high collar and a row of pearls the costume so richly dowagerish so suggestive of the royal family made her look more than ever like something on the halls what have you been doing all this time she asked well said dennis and he hesitated almost voluptuously he had a tremendously amusing account of london and its doings all ripe and ready in his mind it would be a pleasure to give it utterance well to begin with he said but he was too late mrs wimbush's question had been what the grammarians call rhetorical it asked for no answer it was a little conversational flourish a gambit in the polite game you find me busy at my horoscope she said without even being aware that she had interrupted him a little pained dennis decided to reserve his story for more receptive ears he contented himself by way of revenge with saying oh rather icily did i tell you how i won four hundred on the grand national this year yes he replied still frigid and monosyllabic she must have told him at least six times wonderful isn't it everything is in the stars in the old days before i had the stars to help me i used to lose thousands now she paused an instant well look at that four hundred on the grand national that's the stars dennis would have liked to hear more about the old days but he was too discreet and still more too shy to ask there had been something of a bust-up that was all he knew old priscilla not so old then of course and sprightlier had lost a great deal of money dropped it in handfuls and hatfuls on every race-course in the country she had gambled too the number of thousands varied in the different legends but all put it high henry wimbush was forced to sell some of his primitives a tadeo da pongibonsi an amico de tadeo and four or five nameless sienese to the americans there was a crisis for the first time in his life henry asserted himself and with good effect it seemed priscilla's gay and gadding existence had come to an abrupt end nowadays she spent almost all her time at crome cultivating a rather ill-defined malady for consolation she dallied with new thought and the occult her passion for racing still possessed her and henry who was a kind-hearted fellow at bottom allowed her forty pounds a month betting money most of priscilla's days were spent in casting the horoscopes of horses and she invested her money scientifically as the stars dictated she betted on football too and had a large notebook in which she registered the horoscopes of all the players in all the teams of the league the process of balancing the horoscopes of two elevens one against the other was a very delicate and difficult one a match between the spurs and the villa entailed a conflict in the heavens so vast and so complicated that it was not to be wondered at if she sometimes made a mistake about the outcome such a pity you don't believe in these things dennis such a pity said mrs wimbush in her deep distinct voice i can't say i feel it so ah that's because you don't know what it's like to have faith 
you've no idea how amusing and exciting life becomes when you do believe all that happens means something nothing you do is ever insignificant it makes life so jolly you know here am i at crome dull as ditchwater you'd think but no i don't find it so i don't regret the old days a bit i have the stars she picked up the sheet of paper that was lying on the blotting pad inman's horoscope she explained i thought i'd like to have a little fling on the billiards championship this autumn i have the infinite to keep in tune with she waved her hand and then there's the next world and all the spirits and one's aura and mrs eddy and saying you're not ill and the christian mysteries and mrs besant it's all splendid one's never dull for a moment i can't think how i used to get on before in the old days pleasure running about that's all it was just running about lunch tea dinner theatre supper every day it was fun of course while it lasted but there wasn't much left of it afterwards there's rather a good thing about that in barbecue smith's new book where is it she sat up and reached for a book that was lying on the little table by the head of the sofa do you know him by the way she asked who mr barbecue smith dennis knew of him vaguely barbecue smith was a name in the sunday papers he wrote about the conduct of life he might even be the author of what a young girl ought to know no not personally he said i've invited him for next weekend she turned over the pages of the book here's the passage i was thinking of i marked it i always mark the things i like holding the book almost at arm's length for she was somewhat long-sighted and making suitable gestures with her free hand she began to read slowly dramatically what are thousand pound fur coats what are quarter million incomes she looked up from the page with a histrionic movement of the head her orange coiffure nodded portentously dennis looked at it fascinated was it the real thing and henna he wondered or was it one of those complete transformations one sees in the advertisements what are thrones and sceptres the orange transformation yes it must be a transformation bobbed up again what are the gaieties of the rich the splendours of the powerful what is the pride of the great what are the gaudy pleasures of high society the voice which had risen in tone questioningly from sentence to sentence dropped suddenly and boomed reply they are nothing vanity fluff dandelion seed in the wind thin vapours of fever the things that matter happen in the heart seen things are sweet but those unseen are a thousand times more significant it is the unseen that counts in life mrs wimbush lowered the book beautiful isn't it she said dennis preferred not to hazard an opinion but uttered a non-committal hm ah it's a fine book this a beautiful book said priscilla as she let the pages flick back one by one from under her thumb and here's the passage about the lotus pool he compares the soul to a lotus pool you know she held up the book again and read a friend of mine has a lotus pool in his garden it lies in a little dell embowered with wild roses and eglantine among which the nightingale pours forth its amorous descant all the summer long within the pool the lotuses blossom and the birds of the air come to drink and bathe themselves in its crystal waters ah and that reminds me priscilla exclaimed shutting the book with a clap and uttering her big profound laugh that reminds me of the things that have been going on in our bathing pool since you were here last we gave the village people leave to come and bathe here in the evenings you've no idea of the things that happened she leaned forward speaking in a confidential whisper every now and then she uttered a deep gurgle of laughter mixed bathing saw them out of my window sent for a pair of field glasses to make sure no doubt of it the laughter broke out again dennis laughed too barbecue smith was tossed on the floor it's time we went to see if tea's ready said priscilla she hoisted herself up from the sofa and went swishing off across the room striding beneath the trailing silk dennis followed her faintly humming to himself that's why i'm going to sing an opera sing an opera sing an op 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 opera and then the little twiddly bit of accompaniment at the end ra ra end of chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine
Chapter Three of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three. The terrace in front of the house was a long, narrow strip of turf, bounded along its outer edge by a graceful stone balustrade. Two little summer houses of brick stood at either end. Below the house, the ground sloped very steeply away and the terrace was a remarkably high one from the balusters to the sloping lawn beneath was a drop of thirty feet seen from below the high unbroken terrace wall built like the house itself of brick had the almost menacing aspect of a fortification a castle bastion from whose parapet one looked out across airy depths to distances level with the eye below in the foreground hedged in by solid masses of sculptured yew trees lay the stone-brimmed swimming-pool beyond it stretched the park with its massive elms its green expanses of grass and at the bottom of the valley the gleam of the narrow river on the farther side of the stream the land rose again in a long slope chequered with cultivation looking up the valley to the right one saw a line of blue far-off hills the tea-table had been planted in the shade of one of the little summer houses and the rest of the party was already assembled about it when dennis and priscilla made their appearance henry wimbush had begun to pour out the tea he was one of those ageless unchanging men on the farther side of fifty who might be thirty who might be anything dennis had known him almost as long as he could remember in all those years his pale rather handsome face had never grown any older it was like the pale grey bowler hat which he always wore winter and summer unaging calm serenely without expression next him but separated from him and from the rest of the world by the almost impenetrable barriers of her deafness sat jenny mullion she was perhaps thirty had a tilted nose and a pink and white complexion and wore her brown hair plaited and coiled in two lateral buns over her ears in the secret tower of her deafness she sat apart looking down at the world through sharply piercing eyes what did she think of men and women and things that was something that dennis had never been able to discover in her enigmatic remoteness jenny was a little disquieting even now some interior joke seemed to be amusing her for she was smiling to herself and her brown eyes were like very bright round marbles on his other side the serious moonlike innocence of mary bracegirdle's face shown pink and childish she was nearly twenty-three but one wouldn't have guessed it her short hair clipped like a page's hung in a bell of elastic gold about her cheeks she had large blue china eyes whose expression was one of ingenuous and often puzzled earnestness next to mary a small gaunt man was sitting rigid and erect in his chair in appearance mr scogan was like one of those extinct bird lizards of the tertiary his nose was beaked his dark eye had the shining quickness of a robin's but there was nothing soft or gracious or feathery about him the skin of his wrinkled brown face had a dry and scaly look his hands were the hands of a crocodile his movements were marked by the lizard's disconcertingly abrupt clockwork speed his speech was thin fluty and dry henry wimbush's schoolfellow and exact contemporary mr scogan looked far older and at the same time far more youthfully alive than did that gentle aristocrat with the face like a grey bowler mr scogan might look like an extinct saurian but gombol was altogether and essentially human in the old-fashioned natural histories of the thirties he might have figured in a steel engraving as a type of homo sapiens an honour which at that time commonly fell to lord byron indeed with more hair and less collar gombo would have been completely byronic more than byronic even for gombo was of provencal descent a black-haired young corsair of thirty with flashing teeth and luminous large dark eyes dennis looked at him enviously he was jealous of his talent if only he wrote verse as well as gombo painted pictures still more at the moment he envied gombo his looks his vitality his easy confidence of manner was it surprising that anne should like him like him it might even be something worse dennis reflected bitterly as he walked at priscilla's side down the long grass terrace 
between gombo and mr scogan a very much lowered deck-chair presented its back to the new arrivals as they advanced towards the tea-table gombo was leaning over it his face moved vivaciously he smiled he laughed again he made quick gestures with his hands from the depths of the chair came up a sound of soft lazy laughter dennis started as he heard it that laughter how well he knew it what emotions it evoked in him he quickened his pace in her low deck chair anne was nearer to lying than to sitting her long slender body reposed in an attitude of listless and indolent grace within its setting of light brown hair her face had a pretty regularity that was almost doll-like and indeed there were moments when she seemed nothing more than a doll when the oval face with its long lashed pale blue eyes expressed nothing when it was no more than a lazy mask of wax she was henry wimbush's own niece that bowler-like countenance was one of the wimbush heirlooms it ran in the family appearing in its female members as a blank doll face but across this dollish mask like a gay melody dancing over an unchanging fundamental bass passed anne's other inheritance quick laughter light ironic amusement and the changing expressions of many moods she was smiling now as dennis looked down at her her cat smile he called it for no very good reason the mouth was compressed and on either side of it two tiny wrinkles had formed themselves in her cheeks an infinity of slightly malicious amusement lurked in those little folds in the puckers about the half-closed eyes and the eyes themselves bright and laughing between the narrowed lids the preliminary greeting spoken dennis found an empty chair between gombo and jenny and sat down how are you jenny he shouted to her jenny nodded and smiled in mysterious silence as though the subject of her health were a secret that could not be publicly divulged how's london been since i went away anne inquired from the depth of her chair the moment had come the tremendously amusing narrative was waiting for utterance well said dennis smiling happily to begin with has priscilla told you of our great antiquarian find henry wimbush leaned forward the most promising of buds was nipped to begin with said dennis desperately there was the ballet last week mr wimbush went on softly and implacably we dug up fifty yards of oaken drain pipes just tree trunks with a hole bored through the middle very interesting indeed whether they were laid down by the monks in the fifteenth century or whether dennis listened gloomily extraordinary he said when mr wimbush had finished quite extraordinary he helped himself to another slice of cake he didn't even want to tell his tale about london now he was damped for some time past mary's grave blue eyes had been fixed upon him what have you been writing lately she asked it would be nice to have a little literary conversation oh verse and prose said dennis just verse and prose prose mr scogan pounced alarmingly on the word you've been writing prose yes not a novel yes my poor dennis exclaimed mr scogan what about dennis felt rather uncomfortable oh uh, about the usual things you know of course mr scogan groaned i'll describe the plot for you little percy the hero was never good at games but he was always clever he passes through the usual public school and the usual university and comes to london where he lives among the artists he is bowed down with melancholy thought he carries the whole weight of the universe upon his shoulders he writes a novel of dazzling brilliance he dabbles delicately in amour and disappears at the end of the book into the luminous future dennis blushed scarlet mr scogan had described the plan of his novel with an accuracy that was appalling he made an effort to laugh you're entirely wrong he said my novel is not in the least like that it was a heroic lie luckily he reflected only two chapters were written he would tear them up that very evening when he unpacked mr scogan paid no attention to his denial but went on why will you young men continue to write about things that are so entirely uninteresting as the mentality of adolescents and artists professional anthropologists might find it interesting to turn sometimes from the beliefs of the black fellow to the philosophical preoccupations of the undergraduate but you can't expect an ordinary adult man like myself to be much moved by the story of his spiritual troubles 
and after all even in england even in germany and russia there are more adults than adolescents as for the artist he is preoccupied with problems that are so utterly unlike those of the ordinary adult man problems of pure aesthetics which don't so much as present themselves to people like myself that a description of his mental processes is as boring to the ordinary reader as a piece of pure mathematics a serious book about artists regarded as artists is unreadable and a book about artists regarded as lovers husbands dipsomaniacs heroes and the like is really not worth writing again jean christophe is the stock artist of literature just as professor radium of comic cuts is its stock man of science i am sorry to hear i am as uninteresting as all that said gumbo not at all my dear gumbo mr scogan hastened to explain as a lover or a dipsomaniac i've no doubt of your being a most fascinating specimen but as a combiner of forms you must honestly admit it you're a bore i entirely disagree with you exclaimed mary she was somehow always out of breath when she talked and her speech was punctuated by little gasps i've known a great many artists and i've always found their mentality very interesting especially in paris schuplitsky for example i saw a great deal of schuplitsky in paris this spring ah but then you're an exception mary you're an exception said mr scogan you are a superior woman a flush of pleasure turned mary's face into a harvest moon end of chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four dennis woke up next morning to find the sun shining the sky serene he decided to wear white flannel trousers white flannel trousers and a black jacket with a silk shirt and his new peach-coloured tie and what shoes white was the obvious choice but there was something rather pleasing about the notion of black patent leather he lay in bed for several minutes considering the problem before he went down patent leather was his final choice he looked at himself critically in the glass his hair might have been more golden he reflected as it was its yellowness had the hint of a greenish tinge in it but his forehead was good his forehead made up in height what his chin lacked in prominence his nose might have been longer but it would pass his eyes might have been blue and not green but his coat was very well cut and discreetly padded made him seem robuster than he actually was his legs in their white casing were long and elegant satisfied he descended the stairs most of the party had already finished their breakfast he found himself alone with jenny i hope you slept well he said yes isn't it lovely jenny replied giving two rapid little nods but we had such awful thunderstorms last week parallel straight lines dennis reflected meet only at infinity he might talk forever of care charm or sleep and she of meteorology till the end of time did one ever establish contact with any one we are all parallel straight lines jenny was only a little more parallel than most they are very alarming these thunderstorms he said helping himself to porridge don't you think so or are you above being frightened no i always go to bed in a storm one is so much safer lying down why because said jenny making a descriptive gesture because lightning goes downwards and not flatways when you're lying down you're out of the current well that's very ingenious it's true there was a silence dennis finished his porridge and helped himself to bacon for lack of anything better to say and because mr scogan's absurd phrase was for some reason running in his head he turned to jenny and asked do you consider yourself a femme superieure he had to repeat the question several times before jenny got the hang of it no she said rather indignantly when at last she heard what dennis was saying certainly not has any one been suggesting that i am no said dennis mr scogan told mary she was one did he jenny lowered her voice shall i tell you what i think of that man i think he's slightly sinister having made this pronouncement she entered the ivory tower of her deafness and closed the door dennis could not induce her to say anything more could not induce her even to listen she just smiled at him smiled and occasionally nodded dennis went out on to the terrace to smoke his after-breakfast pipe 
and to read his morning paper an hour later when anne came down she found him still reading by this time he had got to the court circular and the forthcoming weddings he got up to meet her as she approached a hamadryad in white muslin across the grass why dennis she exclaimed you look perfectly sweet in your white trousers dennis was dreadfully taken aback there was no possible retort you speak as though i were a child in a new frock he said with a show of irritation that's how i feel about you dennis dear then you oughtn't to but i can't help it i'm so much older than you i like that he said four years older and if you do look perfectly sweet in your white trousers why shouldn't i say so and why did you put them on if you didn't think you were going to look sweet in them let's go into the garden said dennis he was put out the conversation had taken such a preposterous and unexpected turn he had planned a very different opening in which he was to lead off with you look adorable this morning or something of the kind and she was to answer do i and then there was to be a pregnant silence and now she had got in first with the trousers it was provoking his pride was hurt that part of the garden that sloped down from the foot of the terrace to the pool had a beauty which did not depend on colour so much as on forms it was as beautiful by moonlight as in the sun the silver of water the dark shapes of yew and ilex trees remained at all hours and seasons the dominant features of the scene it was a landscape in black and white for colour there was the flower garden it lay to one side of the pool separated from it by a huge babylonian wall of yews you passed through a tunnel in the hedge you opened a wicket in a wall and you found yourself startlingly and suddenly in the world of colour the july borders blazed and flared under the sun within its high brick walls the garden was like a great tank of warmth and perfume and colour dennis held open the little iron gate for his companion it's like passing from a cloister into an oriental palace he said and took a deep breath of the warm flower-scented air in fragrant volleys they let fly how does it go well shot ye firemen oh how sweet and round your equal fires do meet whose shrill report no ear can tell but echoes to the eye and smell you have a bad habit of quoting said anne as i never know the context or author i find it humiliating dennis apologized it's the fault of one's education things somehow seem more real and vivid when one can apply somebody else's ready-made phrase about them and then there are lots of lovely names and words monophysite iamblichus pomponazzi you bring them out triumphantly and feel you've clinched the argument with a mere magical sound of them that's what comes of the higher education you may regret your education said anne i'm ashamed of my lack of it look at those sunflowers aren't they magnificent dark faces and golden crowns they're kings of ethiopia and i like the way the tits cling to the flowers and pick out the seeds while the other loutish birds grubbing dirtily for their food look up in envy from the ground do they look up in envy that's the literary touch i'm afraid education again it always comes back to that he was silent anne had sat down on a bench that stood in the shade of an old apple tree i'm listening she said he did not sit down but walked backwards and forwards in front of the bench gesticulating a little as he talked books he said books one reads so many and one sees so few people and so little of the world great thick books about the universe and the mind and ethics you've no idea how many there are i must have read twenty or thirty tons of them in the last five years twenty tons of ratiocination weighted with that one's pushed out into the world he went on walking up and down his voice rose fell was silent a moment and then talked on he moved his hands sometimes he waved his arms and looked and listened quietly as though she were at a lecture he was a nice boy and to-day he looked charming charming one entered the world dennis pursued having ready-made ideas about everything one had a philosophy and tried to make life fit into it one should have lived first and then made one's philosophy to fit life life facts things were horribly complicated ideas even the most difficult of them deceptively simple in the world of ideas everything was clear in life all was obscure embroiled was it surprising that one was miserable horribly unhappy dennis came to a halt in front of the bench 
and as he asked this last question he stretched out his arms and stood for an instant in an attitude of crucifixion then let them fall again to his sides my poor dennis anne was touched he was really too pathetic as he stood there in front of her in his white flannel trousers but does one suffer about those things it seems very extraordinary you're like scogan cried dennis bitterly you regard me as a specimen for an anthropologist well i suppose i am no no she protested and drew in her skirt with a gesture that indicated that he was to sit down beside her he sat down why can't you just take things for granted and as they come she asked it's so much simpler of course it is said dennis but it's a lesson to be learnt gradually there are the twenty tons of radiocination to be got rid of first i've always taken things as they come said anne it seems so obvious one enjoys the pleasant things avoids the nasty ones there's nothing more to be said nothing for you but then you were born a pagan i am trying laboriously to make myself one i can take nothing for granted i can enjoy nothing as it comes along beauty pleasure art women i have to invent an excuse a justification for everything that's delightful otherwise i can't enjoy it with an easy conscience i make up a little story about beauty and pretend that it has something to do with truth and goodness i have to say that art is the process by which one reconstructs the divine reality out of chaos pleasure is one of the mystical roads to union with the infinite the ecstasies of drinking dancing love-making as for women i am perpetually assuring myself that they're the broad highway to divinity and to think that i'm only just beginning to see through the silliness of the whole thing it's incredible to me that any one should have escaped these horrors it's still more incredible to me said anne that any one should have been a victim to them i should like to see myself believing that men are the highway to divinity the amused malice of her smile planted two little folds on either side of her mouth and through their half-closed lids her eyes shone with laughter what you need dennis is a nice plump young wife a fixed income and a little congenial but regular work what i need is you that was what he ought to have retorted that was what he wanted passionately to say he could not say it his desire fought against his shyness what i need is you mentally he shouted the words but not a sound issued from his lips he looked at her despairingly couldn't she see what was going on inside him couldn't she understand what i need is you he would say it he would he would i think i shall go and bathe said anne it's so hot the opportunity had passed end of chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five mr wimbush had taken them to see the sights of the home farm and now they were standing all six of them henry wimbush mr scogan dennis gambeau anne and mary by the low wall of the piggery looking into one of the styes this is a good sow said henry wimbush she had a litter of fourteen fourteen mary echoed incredulously she turned astonished blue eyes towards mr wimbush then let them fall on to the seething mass of elan vital that fermented in the sty an immense sow reposed on her side in the middle of the pen her round black belly fringed with a double line of dugs presented itself to the assault of an army of small brownish-black swine with a frantic greed they tugged at their mother's flank the old sow stirred sometimes uneasily or uttered a little grunt of pain one small pig the runt the weakling of the litter had been unable to secure a place at the banquet squealing shrilly he ran backwards and forwards trying to push in among his stronger brothers or even to climb over their tight little black backs towards the maternal reservoir there are fourteen said mary you're quite right i counted it's extraordinary the sow next door mr wimbush went on has done very badly she only had five in her litter i shall give her another chance if she does no better next time i shall fat her up and kill her there's the boar he pointed towards a farther sty fine old beast isn't he but he's getting past his prime he'll have to go too how cruel anne exclaimed 
but how practical how eminently realistic said mr scogan in this farm we have a model of sound paternal government make them breed make them work and when they're past working or breeding or begetting slaughter them farming seems to be mostly indecency and cruelty said anne with the ferule of his walking-stick dennis began to scratch the boar's long bristly back the animal moved a little so as to bring himself within easier range of the instrument that evoked in him such delicious sensations then he stood stock still softly grunting his contentment the mud of years flaked off his sides in a grey powdery scurf what a pleasure it is said dennis to do somebody a kindness i believe i enjoy scratching this pig quite as much as he enjoys being scratched if only one could always be kind with so little expense or trouble a gate slammed there was a sound of heavy footsteps morning rowley said henry winbush morning sir old rowley answered he was the most venerable of the labourers on the farm a tall solid man still unbent with grey side whiskers and a steep dignified profile grave weighty in his manner splendidly respectable rowley had the air of a great english statesman of the mid nineteenth century he halted on the outskirts of the group and for a moment they all looked at the pigs in a silence that was only broken by the sound of grunting or the squelch of a sharp hoof in the mire rowley turned at last slowly and ponderously and nobly as he did everything and addressed himself to henry wimbush look at them sir he said with a motion of his hand towards the wallowing swine rightly as they called pigs rightly indeed mr wimbush agreed i am abashed by that man said mr scogan as old rowley plodded off slowly and with dignity what wisdom what judgment what a sense of values rightly are they called swine yes and i wish i could with as much justice say rightly are we called men they walked on towards the cowsheds and the stables of the cart-horses five white geese taking the air this fine morning even as they were doing met them in the way they hesitated cackled then converting their lifted necks into rigid horizontal snakes they rushed off in disorder hissing horribly as they went red calves paddled in the dung and mud of a spacious yard in another enclosure stood the bull massive as a locomotive he was a very calm bull and his face wore an expression of melancholy stupidity he gazed with reddish-brown eyes at his visitors chewed thoughtfully at the tangible memories of an earlier meal swallowed and regurgitated chewed again his tail lashed savagely from side to side it seemed to have nothing to do with his impassive bulk between his short horns was a triangle of red curls short and dense splendid animal said henry wimbush pedigree stock but he's getting a little old like the boar fat him up and slaughter him mr scogan pronounced with a delicate old maidish precision of utterance couldn't you give the animals a little holiday from producing children asked anne i'm so sorry for the poor things mr wimbush shook his head personally he said i rather like seeing fourteen pigs grow where only one grew before the spectacle of so much crude life is refreshing i'm glad to hear you say so gombo broke in warmly lots of life that's what we want i like pullulation everything ought to increase and multiply as hard as it can gombo grew lyrical everybody ought to have children anne ought to have them mary ought to have them dozens and dozens he emphasized his point by thumping with his walking-stick on the bull's leather flanks mr scogan ought to pass on his intelligence to little scogans and dennis to little dennises the bull turned his head to see what was happening regarded the drumming stick for several seconds then turned back again satisfied it seemed that nothing was happening sterility was odious unnatural a sin against life 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 and still more life the ribs of the placid bull resounded standing with his back against the farmyard pump a little apart dennis examined the group gombo passionate and vivacious was its centre the others stood round listening henry wimbush calm and polite beneath his grey bowler mary with parted lips and eyes that shone with the indignation of a convinced birth controller anne looked on through half-shut eyes smiling and beside her stood mr scogan bolt upright in an attitude of metallic rigidity that contrasted strangely with that fluid grace of hers which even in stillness suggested a soft movement 
gambo ceased talking and mary flushed and outraged opened her mouth to refute him but she was too slow before she could utter a word mr scogan's fluty voice had pronounced the opening phrases of a discourse there was no hope of getting so much as a word in edgeways mary had perforce to resign herself even your eloquence my dear gambo he was saying even your eloquence must prove inadequate to reconvert the world to a belief in the delights of mere multiplication with the gramophone the cinema and the automatic pistol the goddess of applied science has presented the world with another gift more precious even than these the means of dissociating life from propagation eros for those who wish it is now an entirely free god his deplorable associations with lucina may be broken at will in the course of the next few centuries who knows the world may see a more complete severance i look forward to it optimistically where the great erasmus darwin and miss anna seward swan of lichfield experimented and for all their scientific ardour failed our descendants will experiment and succeed an impersonal generation will take the place of nature's hideous system in vast state incubators rows upon rows of gravid bottles will supply the world with the population it requires the family system will disappear society sapped at its very base will have to find new foundations and eros beautifully and irresponsibly free will flit like a gay butterfly from flower to flower through a sunlit world it sounds lovely said anne the distant future always does mary's china blue eyes more serious and more astonished than ever were fixed on mr scogan bottles she said do you really think so bottles End of chapter five Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter six of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter six. Mr. Barbecue Smith arrived in time for tea on Saturday afternoon. He was a short and corpulent man with a very large head and no neck in his earlier middle age he had been distressed by this absence of neck but was comforted by reading in balzac's louis lambert that all the world's great men have been marked by the same peculiarity and for a simple and obvious reason greatness is nothing more nor less than the harmonious functioning of the faculties of the head and heart the shorter the neck the more closely these two organs approach one another Argal it was convincing mr barbecue smith belonged to the old school of journalists he sported a leonine head with a greyish black mane of oddly unappetizing hair brushed back from a broad but low forehead and somehow he always seemed slightly ever so slightly soiled in younger days he had gaily called himself a bohemian he did so no longer he was a teacher now a kind of prophet some of his books of comfort and spiritual teaching were in their hundred and twentieth thousand priscilla received him with every mark of esteem he had never been to crome before she showed him round the house mr barbecue smith was full of admiration so quaint so old world he kept repeating he had a rich rather unctuous voice priscilla praised his latest book splendid i thought it was she said in her large jolly way i'm happy to think you found it a comfort said mr barbecue smith oh tremendously and the bit about the lotus pool i thought that so beautiful i knew you would like that it came to me you know from without he waved his hand to indicate the astral world they went out into the garden for tea mr barbecue smith was duly introduced mr stone is a writer too said priscilla as she introduced dennis indeed mr barbecue smith smiled benignly and looking up at dennis with an expression of olympian condescension and what sort of things do you write dennis was furious and to make matters worse he felt himself blushing hotly had priscilla no sense of proportion she was putting them in the same category barbecue smith and himself they were both writers they both used pen and ink to mr barbecue smith's question he answered oh nothing much nothing and looked away mr stone is one of our younger poets it was anne's voice he scowled at her and she smiled back exasperatingly 
excellent excellent said mr barbecue smith and he squeezed dennis's arm encouragingly the bards is a noble calling as soon as tea was over mr barbecue smith excused himself he had to do some writing before dinner priscilla quite understood the prophet retired to his chamber mr barbecue smith came down to the drawing-room at ten to eight he was in a good humour and as he descended the stairs he smiled to himself and rubbed his large white hands together in the drawing-room some one was playing softly and ramblingly on the piano he wondered who it could be one of the young ladies perhaps but no it was only dennis who got up hurriedly and with some embarrassment as he came into the room do go on do go on said mr barbecue smith i am very fond of music then i couldn't possibly go on dennis replied i only make noises there was a silence mr barbecue smith stood with his back to the hearth warming himself at the memory of last winter's fires he could not control his interior satisfaction but still went on smiling to himself at last he turned to dennis you write he asked don't you well yes a little you know how many words do you find you can write in an hour i don't think i've ever counted oh you ought to you ought to it's most important dennis exercised his memory when i'm in good form he said i fancy i do a twelve hundred word review in about four hours but sometimes it takes me much longer mr barbecue smith nodded yes three hundred words an hour at your best he walked out into the middle of the room turned round on his heels and confronted dennis again guess how many words i wrote this evening between five and half past seven i can't imagine no but you must guess between five and half past seven that's two and a half hours twelve hundred words dennis hazarded no 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 mr barbecue smith's expanded face shone with gaiety try again fifteen hundred no i give it up said dennis he found he couldn't summon up much interest in mr barbecue smith's writing well i'll tell you three thousand eight hundred dennis opened his eyes you must get a lot done in a day he said mr barbecue smith suddenly became extremely confidential he pulled up a stool to the side of dennis's armchair sat down in it and began to talk softly and rapidly listen to me he said laying his hand on dennis's sleeve you want to make your living by writing you're young you're inexperienced let me give you a little sound advice what was the fellow going to do dennis wondered give him an introduction to the editor of john o' london's weekly or tell him where he could sell a light middle for seven guineas mr barbecue smith patted his arm several times and went on the secret of writing he said breathing it into the young man's ear the secret of writing is inspiration dennis looked at him in astonishment inspiration mr barbecue smith repeated you mean the native wood note business mr barbecue smith nodded oh then i entirely agree with you said dennis but what if one hasn't got inspiration that was precisely the question i was waiting for said mr barbecue smith you ask me what one should do if one hasn't got inspiration i answer you have inspiration everyone has inspiration it's simply a question of getting it to function the clock struck eight there was no sign of any of the other guests everybody was always late at crome mr barbecue smith went on that's my secret he said i give it you freely dennis made a suitably grateful murmur and grimace i'll help you to find your inspiration because i don't like to see a nice steady young man like you exhausting his vitality and wasting the best years of his life in a grinding intellectual labour that could be completely obviated by inspiration i did it myself so i know what it's like up till the time i was thirty-eight i was a writer like you a writer without inspiration all i wrote i squeezed out of myself by sheer hard work why in those days i was never able to do more than six fifty words an hour and what's more i often didn't sell what i wrote he sighed we artists he said parenthetically we intellectuals aren't much appreciated here in england dennis wondered if there was any method consistent of course with politeness by which he could dissociate himself from mr barbecue smith's we there was none and besides it was too late now for mr barbecue smith was once more pursuing the tenor of his discourse 
at thirty-eight i was a poor struggling tired overworked unknown journalist now at fifty he paused modestly and made a little gesture moving his fat hands outwards away from one another and expanding his fingers as though in demonstration he was exhibiting himself dennis thought of that advertisement of nestle's milk the two cats on the wall under the moon one black and thin the other white sleek and fat before inspiration and after inspiration has made the difference said mr barbecue smith solemnly it came quite suddenly like a gentle dew from heaven he lifted his hand and let it fall back on to his knee to indicate the descent of the dew it was one evening i was writing my first little book about the conduct of life humble heroisms you may have read it it has been a comfort at least i hope and think so a comfort to many thousands i was in the middle of the second chapter and i was stuck fatigue overwork i had only written a hundred words in the last hour and i could get no further i sat biting the end of my pen and looking at the electric light which hung above my table a little above and in front of me he indicated the position of the lamp with elaborate care have you ever looked at a bright light intently for a long time he asked turning to dennis dennis didn't think he had you can hypnotize yourself that way mr barbecue smith went on the gong sounded in a terrific crescendo from the hall still no sign of the others dennis was horribly hungry that's what happened to me said mr barbecue smith i was hypnotized i lost consciousness like that he snapped his fingers when i came to i found that it was past midnight and i had written four thousand words four thousand he repeated opening his mouth very wide on the ow of thousand inspiration had come to me what a very extraordinary thing said dennis i was afraid of it at first it didn't seem to me natural i didn't feel somehow that it was quite right quite fair i might almost say to produce a literary composition unconsciously besides i was afraid i might have written nonsense and had you written nonsense dennis asked certainly not mr barbecue smith replied with a trace of annoyance certainly not it was admirable just a few spelling mistakes and slips such as there generally are in automatic writing but the style the thought all the essentials were admirable after that inspiration came to me regularly i wrote the whole of humble heroisms like that it was a great success and so has everything been that i have written since he leaned forward and jabbed at dennis with his finger that's my secret he said and that's how you could write too if you tried without effort fluently well but how asked dennis trying not to show how deeply he had been insulted by that final well by cultivating your inspiration by getting into touch with your subconscious have you ever read my little book pipelines to the infinite dennis had to confess that that was precisely one of the few perhaps the only one of mr barbecue smith's work he had not read never mind never mind said mr barbecue smith it's just a little book about the connection of the subconscious with the infinite get into touch with the subconscious and you are in touch with the universe inspiration in fact you follow me perfectly perfectly said dennis but don't you find that the universe sometimes sends you very irrelevant messages i don't allow it to mr barbecue smith replied i canalize it i bring it down through pipes to work the turbines of my conscious mind like niagara dennis suggested some of mr barbecue smith's remarks sounded strangely like quotations quotations from his own works no doubt precisely like niagara and this is how i do it he leaned forward and with a raised forefinger marked his points as he made them beating time as it were to his discourse before i go off into my trance i concentrate on the subject i wish to be inspired about let us say i am writing about the humble heroisms for ten minutes before i go into the trance i think of nothing but orphans supporting their little brothers and sisters a dull work well and patiently done and i focus my mind on such great philosophical truths as the purification and uplifting of the soul by suffering and the alchemical transformation of leaden evil into golden good dennis again hung up his little festoon of quotation marks then i pop off two or three hours later i wake up again and find that inspiration has done its work thousands of words comforting uplifting words lie before me i type them out neatly on my machine and they are ready for the printer 
it all sounds wonderfully simple said dennis it is all the great and splendid and divine things of life are wonderfully simple quotation marks again when i have to do my aphorisms mr barbecue smith continued i prelude my trance by turning over the pages of any dictionary of quotations or shakespeare calendar that comes to hand that sets the key so to speak that ensures that the universe shall come flowing in not in a continuous rush but in aphorismic drops you see the idea dennis nodded mr barbecue smith put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a notebook i did a few in the train to-day he said turning over the pages just dropped off into a trance in the corner of my carriage i find the train very conducive to good work here they are he cleared his throat and read the mountain road may be steep but the air is pure up there and it is from the summit that one gets the view the things that really matter happen in the heart it was curious dennis reflected the way the infinite sometimes repeated itself seeing is believing yes but believing is also seeing if i believe in god i see god even in the things that seem to be evil mr barbecue smith looked up from his notebook that last one he said is particularly subtle and beautiful don't you think without inspiration i could never have hit on that he re-read the apotheme with a slower and more solemn utterance straight from the infinite he commented reflectively then addressed himself to the next aphorism the flame of a candle gives light but it also burns puzzled wrinkles appeared on mr barbecue smith's forehead i don't exactly know what that means he said it's very gnomic one could apply it of course to the higher education illuminating but provoking the lower classes to discontent and revolution yes i suppose that's what it is but it's gnomic it's gnomic he rubbed his chin thoughtfully the gong sounded again clamorously it seemed imploringly dinner was growing cold it roused mr barbecue smith from meditation he turned to dennis you understand me now when i advise you to cultivate your inspiration let your subconscious work for you turn on the niagara of the infinite there was the sound of feet on the stairs mr barbecue smith got up laid his hand for an instant on dennis's shoulder and said no more now another time and remember i rely absolutely on your discretion in this matter there are intimate sacred things that one doesn't wish to be generally known of course said dennis i quite understand End of chapter 6 Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine Chapter 7 of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 7 At Chrome all the beds were ancient hereditary pieces of furniture huge beds like four-masted ships with furled sails of shining colored stuff beds carved and inlaid beds painted and gilded beds of walnut and oak of rare exotic woods beds of every date and fashion from the time of sir ferdinando who built the house to the time of his namesake in the late eighteenth century the last of the family but all of them grandiose magnificent the finest of all was now anne's bed sir julius son to sir ferdinando had had it made in venice against his wife's first lying in early seicento venice had expended all its extravagant art in the making of it the body of the bed was like a great square sarcophagus clustering roses were carved in high relief on its wooden panels and luscious putti wallowed among the roses on the black groundwork of the panels the carved reliefs were gilded and burnished the golden roses twined in spirals up the four pillar-like posts and cherubs seated at the top of each column supported a wooden canopy fretted with the same carved flowers anne was reading in bed two candles stood on the little table beside her in their rich light her face her bare arm and shoulder took on warm hues and a sort of peach-like quality of surface here and there in the canopy above her carved golden petals shone brightly among profound shadows and the soft light falling on the sculptured panel of the bed broke restlessly among the intricate roses lingered in a broad caress on the blown cheeks the dimpled bellies the tight absurd little posteriors 
of the sprawling putti there was a discreet tap at the door she looked up come in come in a face round and childish within its sleek bell of golden hair peered round the opening door more childish looking still a suit of mauve pyjamas made its entrance it was mary i thought i'd just look in for a moment to say good-night she said and sat down on the edge of the bed anne closed her book that was very sweet of you what are you reading she looked at the book rather second-rate isn't it the tone in which mary pronounced the word second-rate implied an almost infinite denigration she was accustomed in london to associate only with first-rate people who liked first-rate things and she knew that there were very very few first-rate things in the world and that those were mostly french well i'm afraid i like it said anne there was nothing more to be said the silence that followed was a rather uncomfortable one mary fiddled uneasily with the bottom button of her pyjama jacket leaning back on her mound of heaped-up pillows and waited and wondered what was coming i'm so awfully afraid of repression said mary at last bursting suddenly and surprisingly into speech she pronounced the words on the tail end of an expiring breath and had to gulp for new air almost before the phrase was finished what's there to be depressed about i said repressions not depressions oh repressions i see said anne but repressions of what mary had to explain the natural instincts of sex she began didactically but anne cut her short oh yes yes perfectly i understand repressions old maids and all the rest but what about them that's just it said mary i'm afraid of them it's always dangerous to repress one's instincts i'm beginning to detect in myself symptoms like the ones you read of in the books i constantly dream that i'm falling down wells and sometimes i even dream that i'm climbing up ladders it's most disquieting the symptoms are only too clear are they one may become a nymphomaniac if one's not careful you've no idea how serious these repressions are if you don't get rid of them in time oh, it sounds too awful said anne but i don't see that i can do anything to help you i thought i'd just like to talk it over with you why of course i'm only too happy mary darling mary coughed and drew a deep breath i presume she began sententiously i presume we may take for granted that an intelligent young woman of twenty-three who has lived in civilized society in the twentieth century has no prejudices well i confess i still have a few but not about repressions no not many about repressions that's true or rather about getting rid of repressions exactly so much for our fundamental postulate said mary solemnity was expressed in every feature of her round young face radiated from her large blue eyes we come next to the desirability of possessing experience i hope we are agreed that knowledge is desirable and that ignorance is undesirable obedient as one of those complacent disciples from whom socrates could get whatever answer he chose and gave her assent to this proposition and we are equally agreed i hope that marriage is what it is it is good said mary and repressions being what they are exactly there would therefore seem to be only one conclusion but i knew that anne exclaimed before you began yes but now it's been proved said mary one must do things logically the question is now but where does the question come in you've reached your only possible conclusion logically which is more than i could have done all that remains is to impart the information to someone you like someone you like really rather a lot someone you're in love with if i may express myself so baldly but that's just where the question comes in mary exclaimed i'm not in love with anybody then if i were you i should wait till you are but i can't go on dreaming night after night that i'm falling down a well it's too dangerous well if it really is too dangerous then of course you must do something about it you must find somebody else but who a thoughtful frown puckered mary's brow it must be somebody intelligent somebody with intellectual interests that i can share and it must be somebody with a proper respect for women somebody who's prepared to talk seriously about his work and his ideas and about my work and my ideas it isn't as you see at all easy to find the right person well said anne there are three unattached and intelligent men in the house at the present time there's mr scogan to begin with but perhaps he's rather too much of a genuine antique and there are gombault and dennis shall we say that the choice is limited to the last two 
mary nodded i think we had better she said and then hesitated with a certain air of embarrassment what is it i was wondering said mary with a gasp whether they really were unattached i thought that perhaps you might you might oh it was very nice of you to think of me mary darling said anne smiling the tight cat smile but as far as i'm concerned they are both entirely unattached oh i'm very glad of that said mary looking relieved we are now confronted with the question which of the two i can give no advice it's a matter for your taste it's not a matter of my taste mary pronounced but of their merits we must weigh them and consider them carefully and dispassionately uh, you must do the weighing yourself said anne there was still the trace of a smile at the corners of her mouth and round the half-closed eyes i won't run the risk of advising you wrongly Dambeau has more talent mary began but he is less civilized than dennis mary's pronunciation of civilized gave the word a special and additional significance she uttered it meticulously in the very front of her mouth hissing it delicately on the opening sibilant so few people were civilized and they like the first-rate works of art were mostly french civilization is most important don't you think anne held up her hand i won't advise she said you must make the decision Dambeau's family mary went on reflectively comes from marseilles rather a dangerous heredity when one thinks of the latin attitude towards women but then i sometimes wonder whether dennis is altogether serious-minded whether he isn't rather a dilettante it's very difficult what do you think i'm not listening said anne i refuse to take any responsibility mary sighed well she said i think i had better go to bed and think about it carefully and dispassionately said anne at the door mary turned round good night she said and wondered as she said the words why anne was smiling in that curious way it was probably nothing she reflected anne often smiled for no apparent reason it was probably just a habit i hope i shan't dream of falling down wells again to-night she added ladders are worse said anne mary nodded yes ladders are much graver end of chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight breakfast on sunday morning was an hour later than on weekdays and priscilla who usually made no public appearance before luncheon honoured it by her presence dressed in black silk with a ruby cross as well as her customary string of pearls round her neck she presided an enormous sunday paper concealed all but the extreme pinnacle of her coiffure from the outer world i see surrey has won she said with her mouth full by four wickets the sun is in leo that would account for it splendid game cricket remarked mr barbecue smith heartily to no one in particular so thoroughly english jenny who was sitting next to him woke up suddenly with a start what she said what so english repeated mr barbecue smith jenny looked at him surprised english of course i am he was beginning to explain when mrs wimbush veiled her sunday paper and appeared a square mauve powdered face in the midst of orange splendours i see there's a new series of articles on the next world just beginning she said to mr barbecue smith this one's called summerland and gehenna summerland echoed mr barbecue smith closing his eyes summerland a beautiful name beautiful beautiful mary had taken the seat next to dennis's after a night of careful consideration she had decided on dennis he might have less talent than gambeau he might be a little lacking in seriousness but somehow he was safer are you writing much poetry here in the country she asked with a bright gravity none said dennis curtly i haven't brought my typewriter but do you mean to say you can't write without a typewriter dennis shook his head he hated talking at breakfast and besides he wanted to hear what mr scogan was saying at the other end of the table my scheme for dealing with the church mr scogan was saying is beautifully simple at the present time the anglican clergy wear their collars the wrong way round i would compel them to wear not only their collars but all their clothes turned back to front coat waistcoat trousers boots 
so that every clergyman should present to the world a smooth facade unbroken by stud button or lace the enforcement of such a livery would act as a wholesome deterrent to those intending to enter the church at the same time it would enormously enhance what archbishop laud so rightly insisted on the beauty of holiness in the few incorrigibles who could not be deterred in hell it seems said priscilla reading in her sunday paper the children amuse themselves by flaying lambs alive ah oh, but dear lady that's only a symbol exclaimed mr barbecue smith a material symbol of a spiritual truth lambs signify then there are military uniforms mr scogan went on when scarlet and pipe-clay were abandoned for khaki there were some who trembled for the future of war but then finding out how elegant the new tunic was how closely it clipped the waist how voluptuously with the lateral bustles of the pockets it exaggerated the hips when they realized the brilliant potentialities of breeches and top-boots they were reassured abolish these military elegances standardize a uniform of sackcloth and mackintosh you will very soon find that is any one coming to church with me this morning asked henry wimbush no one responded he baited his bare invitation i read the lessons you know and there's mr bodiham his sermons are sometimes worth hearing thank you thank you said mr barbecue smith i for one prefer to worship in the infinite church of nature how does our shakespeare put it sermons and books stones and the running brooks he waved his arm in a fine gesture towards the window and even as he did so he became vaguely but none the less insistently none the less uncomfortably aware that something had gone wrong with the quotation something what could it be sermons stones books End of chapter eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Nine of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Nine. Mister Bodiham was sitting in his study at the rectory. The nineteenth-century Gothic windows, narrow and pointed, admitted the light grudgingly. In spite of the brilliant July weather, the room was sombre. Brown varnished bookshelves lined the walls filled with row upon row of those thick heavy theological works which the second-hand booksellers generally sell by weight the mantelpiece the overmantel a towering structure of spindly pillars and little shelves were brown and varnished the writing-desk was brown and varnished so were the chairs so was the door a dark red-brown carpet with patterns covered the floor everything was brown in the room and there was a curious brownish smell in the midst of this brown gloom mr bodiham sat at his desk he was the man in the iron mask a grey metallic face with iron cheekbones and a narrow iron brow iron folds hard and unchanging ran perpendicularly down his cheeks his nose was the iron beak of some thin delicate bird of rapine he had brown eyes set in sockets rimmed with iron round them the skin was dark as though it had been charred dense wiry hair covered his skull it had been black it was turning grey his ears were very small and fine his jaws his chin his upper lip were dark iron dark where he had shaved his voice when he spoke and especially when he raised it in preaching was harsh like the grating of iron hinges when a seldom used door is opened it was nearly half past twelve he had just come back from church hoarse and weary with preaching he preached with fury with passion an iron man beating with a flail upon the soles of his congregation but the soles of the faithful at crome were made of india rubber solid rubber the flail rebounded they were used to mr bodiham at crome the flail thumped on india rubber and as often as not the rubber slept that morning he had preached as he had often preached before on the nature of god he had tried to make them understand about god what a fearful thing it was to fall into his hands god they thought of something soft and merciful they blinded themselves to fact still more they blinded themselves to the bible the passengers on the titanic sang nearer my god to thee as the ship was going down did they realize what they were asking to be brought nearer to a white fire of righteousness an angry fire when savonarola preached men sobbed and groaned aloud 
nothing broke the polite silence with which crome listened to mr bodiham only an occasional cough and sometimes the sound of heavy breathing in the front pew sat henry wimbush calm well-bred beautifully dressed there were times when mr bodiham wanted to jump down from the pulpit and shake him into life times when he would have liked to beat and kill his old congregation he sat at his desk dejectedly outside the gothic windows the earth was warm and marvellously calm everything was as it had always been and yet and yet it was nearly four years now since he had preached that sermon on matthew twenty four seven for nation shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places it was nearly four years he had had the sermon printed it was so terribly so vitally important that all the world should know what he had to say a copy of the little pamphlet lay on his desk eight small grey pages printed by a fount of type that had grown blunt like an old dog's teeth by the endless champing and champing of the press he opened it and began to read it yet once more for nation shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places nineteen centuries have elapsed since our lord gave utterance to those words and not a single one of them has been without wars plagues famines and earthquakes mighty empires have crashed in ruin to the ground diseases have unpeopled half the globe there have been vast natural cataclysms in which thousands have been overwhelmed by flood and fire and whirlwind time and again in the course of these nineteen centuries such things have happened but they have not brought christ back to earth they were signs of the times inasmuch as they were signs of god's wrath against the chronic wickedness of mankind but they were not signs of the times in connection with the second coming if earnest christians have regarded the present war as a true sign of the lord's approaching return it is not merely because it happens to be a great war involving the lives of millions of people not merely because famine is tightening its grip on every country in europe not merely because disease of every kind from syphilis to spotted fever is rife among the warring nations no it is not for these reasons that we regard this war as a true sign of the times but because in its origin and its progress it is marked by certain characteristics which seem to connect it almost beyond a doubt with the predictions in christian prophecy relating to the second coming of the lord let me enumerate the features of the present war which most clearly suggests that it is a sign foretelling the near approach of the second advent our lord said that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come although it would be presumptuous for us to say what degree of evangelization will be regarded by god as sufficient we may at least confidently hope that a century of unflagging missionary work has brought the fulfilment of this condition at any rate near true the larger number of the world's inhabitants have remained deaf to the preaching of the true religion but that does not vitiate the fact that the gospel has been preached for a witness to all unbelievers from the papist to the zulu the responsibility for the continued prevalence of unbelief lies not with the preachers but with those preached too again it has been generally recognized that the drying up of the waters of the great river euphrates mentioned in the sixteenth chapter of revelation refers to the decay and extinction of turkish power and is a sign of the near approaching end of the world as we know it the capture of jerusalem and the successes in mesopotamia are great strides forward in the destruction of the ottoman empire though it must be admitted that the gallipoli episode proved that the turk still possesses a notable horn of strength historically speaking this drying up of ottoman power has been going on for the past century the last two years have witnessed a great acceleration of the process and there can be no doubt that complete desiccation is within sight closely following on the words concerning the drying up of euphrates comes the prophecy of armageddon that world war with which the second coming is to be so closely associated once begun the world war can end only with the return of christ and his coming will be sudden and unexpected like that of a thief in the night let us examine the facts in history exactly as in st john's gospel the world war is immediately preceded by the drying up of euphrates or the decay of turkish power 
this fact alone would be enough to connect the present conflict with the armageddon of revelation and therefore to point to the near approach of the second advent but further evidence of an even more solid and convincing nature can be adduced armageddon is brought about by the activities of three unclean spirits as it were toads which come out of the mouths of the dragon the beast and the false prophet if we can identify these three powers of evil much light will clearly be thrown on the whole question the dragon the beast and the false prophet can all be identified in history satan who can only work through human agency has used these three powers in the long war against christ which has filled the last nineteen centuries with religious strife the dragon it has been sufficiently established is pagan rome and the spirit issuing from its mouth is a spirit of infidelity the beast alternatively symbolized as a woman is undoubtedly the papal power and popery is the spirit which it spews forth there is only one power which answers to the description of the false prophet the wolf in sheep's clothing the agent of the devil working in the guise of the lamb and that power is the so-called society of jesus the spirit that issues from the mouth of the false prophet is the spirit of false morality we may assume then that the three evil spirits are infidelity popery and false morality have these three influences been the real cause of the present conflict the answer is clear the spirit of infidelity is the very spirit of german criticism the higher criticism as it is mockingly called denies the possibility of miracles prediction and real inspiration and attempts to account for the bible as a natural development slowly but surely during the last eighty years the spirit of infidelity has been robbing the germans of their bible and their faith so that germany is to-day a nation of unbelievers higher criticism has thus made the war possible for it would be absolutely impossible for any christian nation to wage war as germany is waging it we come next to the spirit of popery whose influence in causing the war was quite as great as that of infidelity though not perhaps so immediately obvious since the franco-prussian war the papal power has steadily declined in france while in germany it has steadily increased to-day france is an anti-papal state while germany possesses a powerful roman catholic minority two papally controlled states germany and austria are at war with six anti-papal states england france italy russia serbia and portugal belgium is of course a thoroughly papal state and there can be little doubt that the presence on the allies side of an element so essentially hostile has done much to hamper the righteous cause and is responsible for our comparative ill success that the spirit of popery is behind the war is thus seen clearly enough in the grouping of the opposed powers while the rebellion in the roman catholic parts of ireland has merely confirmed the conclusion already obvious to any unbiased mind the spirit of false morality has played as great a part in this war as the two other evil spirits the scrap of paper incident is the nearest and most obvious example of germany's adherence to this essentially unchristian or jesuitical morality the end is german world power and in the attainment of this end any means are justifiable it is the true principle of jesuitry applied to international politics the identification is now complete as was predicted in revelation the three evil spirits have gone forth just as the decay of the ottoman power was nearing completion and have joined together to make the world war the warning behold i come as a thief is therefore meant for the present period for you and me and all the world this war will lead on inevitably to the war of armageddon and will only be brought to an end by the lord's personal return and when he returns what will happen those who are in christ st john tells us will be called to the supper of the lamb those who are found fighting against him will be called to the supper of the great god that grim banquet where they shall not feast but be feasted on for as st john says i saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried in a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great god that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and bond both small and great 
all the enemies of christ will be slain with the sword of him that sits upon the horse and all the fowls will be filled with their flesh that is the supper of the great god it may be soon or it may as men reckon time be long but sooner or later inevitably the lord will come and deliver the world from its present troubles and woe unto them who are called not to the supper of the lamb but to the supper of the great god they will realize then but too late that god is a god of wrath as well as a god of forgiveness the god who sent bears to devour the mockers of elisha the god who smote the egyptians for their stubborn wickedness will assuredly smite them too unless they make haste to repent but perhaps it is already too late who knows but that to-morrow in a moment even christ may be upon us unawares like a thief in a little while who knows the angel standing in the sun may be summoning the ravens and vultures from their crannies in the rocks to feed upon the putrefying flesh of the millions of unrighteous whom god's wrath has destroyed be ready then the coming of the lord is at hand may it be for all of you an object of hope not a moment to look forward to with terror and trembling mr bodiham closed the little pamphlet and leaned back in his chair the argument was sound absolutely compelling and yet it was four years since he had preached that sermon four years and england was at peace the sun shone the people of crome were as wicked and indifferent as ever more so indeed if that were possible if only he could understand if the heavens would but make a sign but his questionings remained unanswered seated there in his brown varnished chair under the ruskinian window he could have screamed aloud he gripped the arms of his chair gripping gripping for control the knuckles of his hands whitened he bit his lip in a few seconds he was able to relax the tension he began to rebuke himself for his rebellious impatience four years he reflected what were four years after all it must inevitably take a long time for armageddon to ripen to yeast itself up the episode of nineteen fourteen had been a preliminary skirmish and as for the war having come to an end why that of course was illusory it was still going on smouldering away in silesia in ireland in anatolia the discontent in egypt and india was preparing the way perhaps for a great extension of the slaughter among the heathen peoples the chinese boycott of japan and the rivalries of that country and america in the pacific might be breeding a great new war in the east the prospect mr bodiham tried to assure himself was hopeful the real the genuine armageddon might soon begin and then like a thief in the night but in spite of all his comfortable reasoning he remained unhappy dissatisfied four years ago he had been so confident god's intentions seemed then so plain and now now he did well to be angry and now he suffered too sudden and silent as a phantom mrs bodiham appeared gliding noiselessly across the room above her black dress her face was pale with an opaque whiteness her eyes were pale as water in a glass and her strawy hair was almost colourless she held a large envelope in her hand this came for you by the post she said softly the envelope was unsealed mechanically mr bodiham tore it open it contained a pamphlet larger than his own and more elegant in appearance the house of sheeny clerical outfitters birmingham he turned over the pages the catalogue was tastefully and ecclesiastically printed in antique characters with illuminated gothic initials red marginal lines crossed at the corners after the manner of an oxford picture frame enclosed each page of type little red crosses took the place of full stops mr bodiham turned the pages soutane in best black merino ready to wear in all sizes clerical frock coats from nine guineas a dressy garment tailored by our own experienced ecclesiastical cutters half-tone illustrations represented young curates some dapper some rugbyan and muscular some with ascetic faces and large ecstatic eyes dressed in jackets and frock coats and surplices and clerical evening dress in black norfolk suitings a large assortment of chasubels rope girdles sheeny special skirt cassocks tied by a string about the waist when worn under a surplice presents an appearance indistinguishable from that of a complete cassock recommended for summer wear in hot climates with a gesture of horror and disgust mr bodiham threw the catalogue into the waste-paper basket mrs bodiham looked at him her pale glaucous eyes 
reflected his action without comment the village she said in her quiet voice the village grows worse and worse every day what has happened now asked mr bodiham feeling suddenly very weary i'll tell you she pulled up a brown varnished chair and sat down in the village of crome it seemed sodom and gomorrah had come to a second birth end of chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter ten of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter ten dennis did not dance but when ragtime came squirting out of the pianola in gushes of treacle and hot perfume in jets of bengal light then things began to dance inside him little black nigger corpuscles jigged and drummed in his arteries he became a cage of movement a walking palais de danse it was very uncomfortable like the preliminary symptoms of a disease he sat in one of the window seats glumly pretending to read at the pianola henry wimbush smoking a long cigar through a tunnelled pillar of amber trod out the shattering dance music with serene patience locked together gambeau and anne moved with a harmoniousness that made them seem a single creature two-headed and four-legged mr scogan solemnly buffoonish shuffled round the room with mary jenny sat in the shadow behind the piano scribbling so it seemed in a big red notebook in armchairs by the fireplace priscilla and mr barbecue smith discussed higher things without apparently being disturbed by the noise on the lower plane optimism said mr barbecue smith with a tone of finality speaking through strains of the wild wild women optimism is the opening out of the soul towards the light it is an expansion towards and into god it is a spiritual half unification with the infinite how true sighed priscilla nodding the baleful splendours of her coiffure pessimism on the other hand is the contraction of the soul towards darkness it is a focusing of the self upon a point in the lower plane it is a spiritual slavery to mere facts to gross physical phenomena they're making a wild man of me the refrain sang itself over in dennis's mind yes they were damn them a wild man but not wild enough that was the trouble wild inside raging writhing yes writhing was the word writhing with desire but outwardly he was hopelessly tame outwardly ba 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 there they were anne and gombo moving together as though they were a single supple creature the beast with two backs and he sat in a corner pretending to read pretending he didn't want to dance pretending he rather despised dancing why it was a ba ba business again why was he born with a different face why was he gombo had a face of brass one of those old brazen rams that thumped against the walls of cities till they fell he was born with a different face a woolly face the music stopped the single harmonious creature broke in two flushed a little breathless and swayed across the room to the pianola laid her hand on mr wimbush's shoulder a waltz this time please uncle henry she said a waltz he repeated and turned to the cabinet where the rolls were kept he trod off the old roll and trod on the new a slave at the mill uncomplaining and beautifully well-bred rum tum rum titi tum titi the melody wallowed oozily along like a ship moving forward over a sleek and oily swell the four-legged creature more graceful more harmonious in its movements than ever slid across the floor oh why was he born with a different face what are you reading he looked up startled it was mary she had broken from the uncomfortable embrace of mr scogan who had now seized on jenny for his victim what are you reading i don't know said dennis truthfully he looked at the title page the book was called the stock breeders vade mecum i think you are so sensible to sit and read quietly said mary fixing him with her china eyes i don't know why one dances it's so boring dennis made no reply she exacerbated him from the armchair by the fireplace he heard priscilla's deep voice tell me mr barbecue smith 
you know all about science i know a deprecating noise came from mr barbecue smith's chair this einstein theory it seems to upset the whole starry universe it makes me so worried about my horoscopes you see mary renewed her attack which of the contemporary poets do you like best she asked dennis was filled with fury why couldn't this pest of a girl leave him alone he wanted to listen to the horrible music to watch them dancing oh with what grace as though they had been made for one another to savour his misery and peace and she came and put him through this absurd catechism she was like mangold's questions what are the three diseases of wheat which of the contemporary poets do you like best blight mildew and smut he replied with the laconism of one who is absolutely certain of his own mind it was several hours before dennis managed to go to sleep that night vague but agonizing miseries possessed his mind it was not only anne who made him miserable he was wretched about himself the future life in general the universe this adolescence business he repeated to himself every now and then is horribly boring but the fact that he knew his disease did not help him to cure it after kicking all the clothes off the bed he got up and sought relief in composition he wanted to imprison his nameless misery in words at the end of an hour nine more or less complete lines emerged from among the blots and scratchings i do not know what i desire when summer nights are dark and still when the wind's many-voiced choir sleeps among the muffled branches i long and know not what i will and not a sound of life or laughter staunches time's black and silent flow i do not know what i desire i do not know he read it through aloud then threw the scribbled sheet into the waste-paper basket and got into bed again in a very few minutes he was asleep end of chapter ten recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eleven of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eleven mr barbecue smith was gone the motor had whirled him away to the station a faint smell of burning oil commemorated his recent departure a considerable detachment had come into the courtyard to speed him on his way and now they were walking back round the side of the house towards the terrace and the garden they walked in silence nobody had yet ventured to comment on the departed guest well said anne at last turning with raised inquiring eyebrows to dennis well it was time for someone to begin dennis declined the invitation he passed it on to mr scogan well he said mr scogan did not respond he only repeated the question well it was left for henry wimbush to make a pronouncement a very agreeable adjunct to the weekend he said his tone was obituary they had descended without paying much attention where they were going the steep yew walk that went down under the flank of the terrace to the pool the house towered above them immensely tall with the whole height of the built-up terrace added to its own seventy feet of brick facade the perpendicular lines of the three towers soared up uninterrupted enhancing the impression of height until it became overwhelming they paused at the edge of the pool to look back the man who built this house knew his business said dennis he was an architect was he said henry wimbush reflectively i doubt it the builder of this house was sir ferdinand de lapeth who flourished during the reign of elizabeth he inherited the estate from his father to whom it had been granted at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries for crome was originally a cloister of monks and this swimming pool their fish pond sir ferdinando was not content merely to adapt the old monastic buildings to his own purposes but using them as a stone quarry for his barns and byres and outhouses he built for himself a grand new house of brick the house you see now he waved his hand in the direction of the house and was silent severe imposing almost menacing crome loomed down on them the great thing about crome said mr scogan seizing the opportunity to speak is the fact that it's so unmistakably and aggressively a work of art it makes no compromise with nature but affronts it and rebels against it 
it has no likeness to shelley's tower in the epipsychidion which if i remember rightly seems not now a work of human art but as it were titanic in the heart of earth having assumed its form and grown out of the mountain from the living stone lifting itself in caverns light and high no no there isn't any nonsense of that sort about chrome that the hovels of the peasantry should look as though they had grown out of the earth to which their inmates are attached is right no doubt and suitable but the house of an intelligent civilized and sophisticated man should never seem to have sprouted from the clods it should rather be an expression of his grand unnatural remoteness from the cloddish life since the days of william morris that's a fact which we in england have been unable to comprehend civilized and sophisticated men have solemnly played at being peasants hence quaintness arts and crafts cottage architecture and all the rest of it in the suburbs of our cities you may see reduplicated in endless rows studiedly quaint imitations and adaptations of the village hovel poverty ignorance and a limited range of materials produce the hovel which possesses undoubtedly in suitable surroundings its own as it were titanic charm we now employ our wealth our technical knowledge our rich variety of materials for the purpose of building millions of imitation hovels in totally unsuitable surroundings could imbecility go further henry wimbush took up the thread of his interrupted discourse all that you say my dear scogan he began is certainly very just very true but whether sir ferdinando shared your views about architecture or if indeed he had any views about architecture at all i very much doubt in building this house sir ferdinando was as a matter of fact preoccupied by only one thought the proper placing of his privies sanitation was the one great interest of his life in fifteen seventy three he even published on this subject a little book now extremely scarce called certain privy councils by one of her majesty's most honourable privy councils f l knight in which the whole matter is treated with great learning and elegance his guiding principle in arranging the sanitation of a house was to secure that the greatest possible distance should separate the privy from the sewage arrangements hence it followed inevitably that the privies were to be placed at the top of the house being connected by vertical shafts with pits or channels in the ground it must not be thought that sir ferdinando was moved only by material and merely sanitary conditions for the placing of his privies in an exalted position he had also certain excellent spiritual reasons for he argues in the third chapter of his privy councils the necessities of nature are so base and brutish that in obeying them we are apt to forget that we are the noblest creatures of the universe to counteract these degrading effects he advised that the privy should be in every house the room nearest to heaven that it should be well provided with windows commanding an extensive and noble prospect and that the walls of the chamber should be lined with bookshelves containing all the ripest products of human wisdom such as the proverbs of solomon boethius's consolations of philosophy the apothames of epictetus and marcus aurelius the enchiridion of erasmus and all other works ancient or modern which testify to the nobility of the human soul in chrome he was able to put his theories into practice at the top of each of the three projecting towers he placed a privy from these a shaft went down the whole height of the house that is to say more than seventy feet through the cellars and into a series of conduits provided with flowing water tunnelled in the ground on a level with the base of the raised terrace these conduits emptied themselves into the stream several hundred yards below the fish-pond the total depth of the shafts from the top of the towers to their subterranean conduits was a hundred and two feet the eighteenth century with its passion for modernization swept away these monuments of sanitary ingenuity were it not for tradition and the explicit account of them left by sir ferdinando we should be unaware that these noble privies had ever existed we should even suppose that sir ferdinando built his house after this strange and splendid model for merely aesthetic reasons the contemplation of the glories of the past always evoked in henry wimbush a certain enthusiasm under the grey bowler his face worked and glowed as he spoke the thought of these vanished privies moved him profoundly he ceased to speak the light gradually died out of his face 
and it became once more the replica of the grave polite hat which shaded it there was a long silence the same gently melancholy thoughts seemed to possess the mind of each of them permanence transience sir ferdinando and his privies were gone chrome still stood how brightly the sun shone and how inevitable was death the ways of god were strange the ways of man were stranger still it does one's heart good exclaimed mr scogan at last to hear of these fantastic english aristocrats to have a theory about privies and to build an immense and splendid house in order to put it into practice it's magnificent beautiful i like to think of them all the eccentric my lords rolling across europe in ponderous carriages bound on extraordinary errands one is going to venice to buy la bianchi's larynx he won't get it till she's dead of course but no matter he's prepared to wait he has a collection pickled in glass bottles of the throats of famous opera singers and the instruments of renowned virtuosi he goes in for them too he will try to bribe paganini to part with his little guarnerio but he has small hope of success paganini won't sell his fiddle but perhaps he might sacrifice one of his guitars others are bound on crusades one to die miserably among the savage greeks another in his white top hat to lead italians against their oppressors others have no business at all they are just giving their oddity a continental airing at home they cultivate themselves at leisure and with greater elaboration beckford builds towers portland digs holes in the ground cavendish the millionaire lives in a stable eats nothing but mutton and amuses himself oh solely for his private delectation by anticipating the electrical discoveries of half a century glorious eccentrics every age is enlivened by their presence some day my dear dennis said mr scogan turning a beady bright regard in his direction some day you must become their biographer the lives of queer men what a subject i should like to undertake it myself mr scogan paused looked up once more at the towering house then murmured the word eccentricity two or three times eccentricity it's the justification of all aristocracies it justifies leisured classes and inherited wealth and privilege and endowments and all the other injustices of that sort if you're to do anything reasonable in this world you must have a class of people who are secure safe from public opinion safe from poverty leisured not compelled to waste their time in the imbecile routines that go by the name of honest work you must have a class of which the members can think and within the obvious limits do what they please you must have a class in which people who have eccentricities can indulge them and in which eccentricity in general will be tolerated and understood that's the important thing about an aristocracy not only is it eccentric itself often grandiosely so it also tolerates and even encourages eccentricity in others the eccentricities of the artist and the new-fangled thinker don't inspire it with that fear loathing and disgust which the burgesses instinctively feel towards them it is a sort of red indian reservation planted in the midst of a vast horde of poor whites colonials at that within its boundaries wild men disport themselves often it must be admitted a little grossly a little too flamboyantly and when kindred spirits are born outside the pale it offers them some sort of refuge from the hatred which the poor whites en bon bourgeois lavish on anything that is wild or out of the ordinary after the social revolution there will be no reservations the redskins will be drowned in the great sea of poor whites what then will they suffer you to go on writing villanelles my good dennis will you unhappy henry be allowed to live in this house of the splendid privies to continue your quiet delving in the mines of feudal knowledge will anne and you said anne interrupting him will you be allowed to go on talking you may rest assured mr scogan replied that i shall not i shall have some honest work to do end of chapter eleven recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Twelve of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. 
chapter twelve blight mildew and smut mary was puzzled and distressed perhaps her ears had played her false perhaps what he had really said was squire binion and shanks or child blunden and erp or even abercrombie drinkwater and rabindranath tagore perhaps but then her ears never did play her false blight mildew and smut the impression was distinct and ineffaceable blight mildew she was forced to the conclusion reluctantly that dennis had indeed pronounced those improbable words he had deliberately repelled her attempts to open a serious discussion that was horrible a man who would not talk seriously to a woman just because she was a woman oh impossible egeria or nothing perhaps gombo would be more satisfactory true his meridional heredity was a little disquieting but at least he was a serious worker and it was with his work that she would associate herself and dennis after all what was dennis a dilettante an amateur gombo had next for his painting-room a little disused granary that stood by itself in a green close beyond the farmyard it was a square brick building with a peaked roof and little windows set high up in each of its walls a ladder of four rungs led up to the door for the granary was perched above the ground and out of reach of the rats on four massive toadstools of grey stone within there lingered a faint smell of dust and cobwebs and the narrow shaft of sunlight that came slanting in at every hour of the day through one of the little windows was always alive with silvery motes here gambo worked with a kind of concentrated ferocity during six or seven hours of each day he was pursuing something new something terrific if only he could catch it during the last eight years nearly half of which had been spent in the process of winning the war he had worked his way industriously through cubism now he had come out on the other side he had begun by painting a formalized nature then little by little he had risen from nature into the world of pure form till in the end he was painting nothing but his own thoughts externalized in the abstract geometrical forms of the mind's devising he found the process arduous and exhilarating and then quite suddenly he grew dissatisfied he felt himself cramped and confined within intolerably narrow limitations he was humiliated to find how few and crude and uninteresting were the forms he could invent the inventions of nature were without number inconceivably subtle and elaborate he had done with cubism he was out on the other side but the cubist discipline prevented him from falling into excesses of nature worship he took from nature its rich subtle elaborate forms but his aim was always to work them into a whole that should have the thrilling simplicity and formality of an idea to combine prodigious realism with prodigious simplification memories of caravaggio's portentous achievements haunted him forms of a breathing living reality emerged from darkness built themselves up into compositions as luminously simple and single as a mathematical idea he thought of the call of matthew of peter crucified of the lute players of magdalen he had the secret that astonishing ruffian he had the secret and now gambeau was after it in hot pursuit yes it would be something terrific if only he could catch it for a long time an idea had been stirring and spreading yeastily in his mind he had made a portfolio full of studies he had drawn a cartoon and now the idea was taking shape on canvas a man fallen from a horse the huge animal a gaunt white cart horse filled the upper half of the picture with its great body its head lowered towards the ground was in shadow the immense bony body was what arrested the eye the body and the legs which came down on either side of the picture like the pillars of an arch on the ground between the legs of the towering beast lay the foreshortened figure of a man the head in the extreme foreground the arms flung wide to right and left a white relentless light poured down from a point in the right foreground the beast the fallen man were sharply illuminated round them beyond and behind them was the night they were alone in the darkness a universe in themselves the horse's body filled the upper part of the picture the legs the great hoofs frozen to stillness in the midst of their trampling limited it on either side 
and beneath lay the man his foreshortened face at the focal point in the centre his arms outstretched towards the sides of the picture under the arch of the horse's belly between his legs the eye looked through into an intense darkness below the space was closed in by the figure of the prostrate man a central gulf of darkness surrounded by luminous forms the picture was more than half finished gambeau had been at work all the morning on the figure of the man and now he was taking a rest the time to smoke a cigarette tilting back his chair till it touched the wall he looked thoughtfully at his canvas he was pleased and at the same time he was desolated in itself the thing was good he knew it but that something he was after that something that would be so terrific if only he could catch it had he caught it would he ever catch it three little taps rat tap tap surprised gambo turned his eyes towards the door nobody ever disturbed him while he was at work it was one of the unwritten laws come in he called the door which was ajar swung open revealing from the waist upwards the form of mary she had only dared to mount halfway up the ladder if he didn't want her retreat would be easier and more dignified than if she climbed to the top may i come in she asked certainly she skipped up the remaining two rungs and was over the threshold in an instant a letter came for you by the second post she said i thought it might be important so i brought it out to you her eyes her childish face were luminously candid as she handed him the letter there had never been a flimsier pretext gambeau looked at the envelope and put it in his pocket unopened luckily he said it isn't at all important thanks very much all the same there was a silence mary felt a little uncomfortable may i have a look at what you've been painting she had the courage to say at last gambeau had only half smoked his cigarette in any case he wouldn't begin work again till he had finished he would give her the five minutes that separated him from the bitter end this is the best place to see it from he said mary looked at the picture for some time without saying anything indeed she didn't know what to say she was taken aback she was at a loss she had expected a cubist masterpiece and here was a picture of a man and a horse not only recognizable as such but even aggressively in drawing trompe louis there was no other word to describe the delineation of that foreshortened figure under the trampling feet of the horse what was she to think what was she to say her orientations were gone one could admire representationalism in the old masters obviously but in a modern at eighteen she might have done so but now after five years of schooling among the best judges her instinctive reaction to a contemporary piece of representation was contempt an outburst of laughing disparagement what could gumbo be up to she had felt so safe in admiring his work before but now she didn't know what to think it was very difficult very difficult there's rather a lot of chiaroscuro isn't there she ventured at last and inwardly congratulated herself on having found a critical formula so gentle and at the same time so penetrating there is gumbo agreed mary was pleased he accepted her criticism it was a serious discussion she put her head on one side and screwed up her eyes i think it's awfully fine she said but of course it's a little too too trompe louis for my taste she looked at gambeau who made no response but continued to smoke gazing meditatively all the time at his picture mary went on gaspingly when i was in paris this spring i saw a lot of Schuplitsky i admire his work so tremendously of course it's frightfully abstract now frightfully abstract and frightfully intellectual he just throws a few oblongs on to his canvas quite flat you know and painted in pure primary colours but his design is wonderful he's getting more and more abstract every day he'd given up the third dimension when i was there and was just thinking of giving up the second soon he says there'll be just a blank canvas that's a logical conclusion complete abstraction painting's finished he's finishing it when he's reached pure abstraction he's going to take up architecture he says it's more intellectual than painting do you agree she asked with a final gasp gambeau dropped his cigarette end and trod on it schuplitsky's finished painting he said i've finished my cigarette but i'm going on painting and advancing towards her he put his arm round her shoulders 
and turned her round away from the picture mary looked up at him her hair swung back a soundless bell of gold her eyes were serene she smiled so the moment had come his arm was round her he moved slowly almost imperceptibly and she moved with him it was a peripatetic embracement do you agree with him she repeated the moment might have come but she would not cease to be intellectual serious i don't know i shall have to think about it gumbo loosened his embrace his hand dropped from her shoulder be careful going down the ladder he added solicitously mary looked round startled they were in front of the open door she remained standing there for a moment in bewilderment the hand that had rested on her shoulder made itself felt lower down her back it administered three or four kindly little smacks replying automatically to its stimulus she moved forward be careful going down the ladder said gambo once more she was careful the door closed behind her and she was alone in the little green clothes she walked slowly back through the farmyard she was pensive end of chapter twelve recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Thirteen of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Thirteen. Henry Wimbush brought down with him to dinner a budget of printed sheets loosely bound together in a cardboard portfolio. Today, he said, exhibiting it with a certain solemnity, today I have finished the printing of my history of Chrome i helped to set up the type of the last page this evening the famous history cried anne the writing and the printing of this magnum opus had been going on as long as she could remember all her childhood long uncle henry's history had been a vague and fabulous thing often heard of and never seen it has taken me nearly thirty years said mr wimbush twenty-five years of writing and nearly four of printing and now it's finished the whole chronicle from sir ferdinando lapith's birth to the death of my father william wimbush more than three centuries and a half a history of chrome written at chrome and printed at chrome by my own press shall we be allowed to read it now it's finished asked dennis mr wimbush nodded certainly he said and i hope you will not find it uninteresting he added modestly our muniment room is particularly rich in ancient records and i have some genuinely new light to throw on the introduction of the three-pronged fork and the people asked gombo sir ferdinando and the rest of them were they amusing were there any crimes or tragedies in the family let me see henry wimbush rubbed his chin thoughtfully i can only think of two suicides one violent death four or perhaps five broken hearts and half a dozen little blots on the scutcheon in the way of misalliances seductions natural children and the like no on the whole it's a placid and uneventful record the Wimbushes and the Lapiths were always an unadventurous, respectable crew, said Priscilla, with a note of scorn in her voice. If I were to write my family history now, why, it would be one long, continuous blot from beginning to end. She laughed jovially and helped herself to another glass of wine. If I were to write mine, Mr. Scogan remarked, it wouldn't exist. After the second generation, we Scogans are lost in the mists of antiquity after dinner said henry wimbush a little piqued by his wife's disparaging comment on the masters of chrome i'll read you an episode from my history that will make you admit that even the lapiths in their own respectable way had their tragedies and strange adventures i'm glad to hear it said priscilla glad to hear what asked jenny emerging suddenly from her private interior world like a cuckoo from a clock she received an explanation smiled nodded cuckooed at last i see and popped back clapping shut the door behind her dinner was eaten the party had adjourned to the drawing-room now said henry wimbush pulling up a chair to the lamp he put on his round pince-nez rimmed with tortoise-shell and began cautiously to turn over the pages of his loose and still fragmentary book he found his place at last shall i begin he asked looking up do said priscilla yawning in the midst of an attentive silence mr wimbush gave a little preliminary cough and started to read 
the infant who was destined to become the fourth baronet of the name of lapith was born in the year seventeen forty he was a very small baby weighing not more than three pounds at birth but from the first he was sturdy and healthy in honour of his maternal grandfather sir hercules ockham of bishops ockham he was christened hercules his mother like many other mothers kept a notebook in which his progress from month to month was recorded he walked at ten months and before his second year was out he had learnt to speak a number of words at three years he weighed but twenty-four pounds and at six though he could read and write perfectly and showed a remarkable aptitude for music he was no larger and heavier than a well-grown child of two meanwhile his mother had borne two other children a boy and a girl one of whom died of croup during infancy while the other was carried off by smallpox before it reached the age of five hercules remained the only surviving child on his twelfth birthday hercules was still only three feet and two inches in height his head which was very handsome and nobly shaped was too big for his body but otherwise he was exquisitely proportioned and for his size of great strength and agility his parents in the hope of making him grow consulted all the most eminent physicians of the time their various prescriptions were followed to the letter but in vain one ordered a very plentiful meat diet another exercise a third constructed a little rack modelled on those employed by the holy inquisition on which young hercules was stretched with excruciating torments for half an hour every morning and evening in the course of the next three years hercules gained perhaps two inches after that his growth stopped completely and he remained for the rest of his life a pygmy of three feet and four inches his father who had built the most extravagant hopes upon his son planning for him in his imagination a military career equal to that of marlborough found himself a disappointed man i have brought an abortion into the world he would say and he took so violent a dislike to his son that the boy dared scarcely come into his presence his temper which had been serene was turned by disappointment to moroseness and savagery he avoided all company being as he said ashamed to show himself the father of a lusus naturae among normal healthy human beings and took to solitary drinking which carried him very rapidly to his grave for the year before hercules came of age his father was taken off by an apoplexy his mother whose love for him had increased with the growth of his father's unkindness did not long survive but little more than a year after her husband's death succumbed after eating two dozen of oysters to an attack of typhoid fever hercules thus found himself at the age of twenty-one alone in the world and master of a considerable fortune including the estate and mansion of crome the beauty and intelligence of his childhood had survived into his manly age and but for his dwarfish stature he would have taken his place among the handsomest and most accomplished young men of his time he was well read in the greek and latin authors as well as in all the moderns of any merit who had written in english french or italian he had a good ear for music and was no indifferent performer on the violin which he used to play like a bass viol seated on a chair with the instrument between his legs to the music of the harpsichord and clavichord he was extremely partial but the smallness of his hands made it impossible for him ever to perform upon these instruments he had a small ivory flute made for him on which whenever he was melancholy he used to play a simple country air or jig affirming that this rustic music had more power to clear and raise the spirits than the most artificial productions of the masters from an early age he practised the composition of poetry but though conscious of his great powers in this art he would never publish any specimen of his writing my stature he would say is reflected in my verses if the public were to read them it would not be because i am a poet but because i am a dwarf several manuscript books of sir hercules poems survive a single specimen will suffice to illustrate his qualities as a poet in ancient days while yet the world was young ere abram fed his flocks or homer sung when blacksmith tubal tamed creative fire and jabal dwelt in tents and jubal struck the lyre 
flesh grown corrupt brought forth a monstrous birth and obscene giants trod the shrinking earth till god impatient of their sinful brood gave rein to wrath and drowned them in the flood teeming again repeopled tellus bore the lubber hero and the man of war huge towers of brawn topped with an empty skull witlessly bold heroically dull long ages passed and man grown more refined slighter in muscle but of vaster mind smiled at his grandsire's broadsword bow and bill and learned to wield the pencil and the quill the glowing canvas and the written page immortalized his name from age to age his name emblazoned on fame's temple wall for art grew great as humankind grew small thus man's long progress step by step we trace the giant dies the hero takes his place the giant vile the dull heroic block at one we shudder and at one we mock man last appears in him the soul's pure flame burns brightlier in a not inordinate frame of old when heroes fought and giants swarmed men were huge mounds of matter scarce informed wearied by leavening so vast a mass the spirit slept and all the mind was crass the smaller carcass of these later days is soon informed the soul unwearied plays and like a pharos darts abroad her mental rays but can we think that providence will stay man's footsteps here upon the upward way mankind in understanding and in grace advance so far beyond the giant's race hence impious thought still led by god's own hand mankind proceeds towards the promised land a time will come prophetic i descry remoter dawns along the gloomy sky when happy mortals of a golden age will backward turn the dark historic page and in our vaunted race of men behold a form as gross a mind as dead and cold as we in giants see in warriors of old a time will come wherein the soul shall be from all superfluous matter wholly free when the light body agile as a fawn's shall sport with grace along the velvet lawns nature's most delicate and final birth mankind perfected shall possess the earth but ah not yet for still the giant's race huge though diminished tramps the earth's fair face gross and repulsive yet perversely proud men of their imperfections boast aloud vain of their bulk of all they still retain of giant ugliness absurdly vain at all that's small they point their stupid scorn and monsters think themselves divinely born sad is the fate of those ah sad indeed the rare precursors of the nobler breed who come man's golden glory to foretell but pointing heavenwards live themselves in hell as soon as he came into the estate sir hercules set about remodelling his household for though by no means ashamed of his deformity indeed if we may judge from the poem quoted above he regarded himself as being in many ways superior to the ordinary race of man he found the presence of full-grown men and women embarrassing realizing too that he must abandon all ambitions in the great world he determined to retire absolutely from it and to create as it were at crome a private world of his own in which all should be proportionable to himself accordingly he discharged all the old servants of the house and replaced them gradually as he was able to find suitable successors by others of dwarfish stature in the course of a few years he had assembled about himself a numerous household no member of which was above four feet high and the smallest among them scarcely two feet and six inches his father's dogs such as setters mastiffs greyhounds and a pack of beagles he sold or gave away as too large and too boisterous for his house replacing them by pugs and king charles spaniels and whatever other breeds of dog were the smallest his father's stable was also sold for his own use whether riding or driving he had six black shetland ponies with four very choice piebald animals of new forest breed having thus settled his household entirely to his own satisfaction it only remained for him to find some suitable companion with whom to share his paradise sir hercules had a susceptible heart and had more than once between the ages of sixteen and twenty felt what it was to love but here his deformity had been a source of the most bitter humiliation 
for having once dared to declare himself to a young lady of his choice he had been received with laughter on his persisting she had picked him up and shaken him like an importunate child telling him to run away and plague her no more the story soon got about indeed the young lady herself used to tell it as a particularly pleasant anecdote and the taunts and mockery it occasioned were a source of the most acute distress to hercules from the poems written at this period we gather that he meditated taking his own life in course of time however he lived down this humiliation but never again though he often fell in love and that very passionately did he dare to make any advances to those in whom he was interested after coming to the estate and finding that he was in a position to create his own world as he desired it he saw that if he was to have a wife which he very much desired being of an affectionate and indeed amorous temper he must choose her as he had chosen his servants from among the race of dwarfs but to find a suitable wife was he found a matter of some difficulty for he would marry none who was not distinguished by beauty and gentle birth the dwarfish daughter of lord bemboro he refused on the ground that besides being a pygmy she was hunchbacked while another young lady an orphan belonging to a very good family in hampshire was rejected by him because her face like that of so many dwarfs was wizened and repulsive finally when he was almost despairing of success he heard from a reliable source that count titimalo a venetian nobleman possessed a daughter of exquisite beauty and great accomplishments who was three feet in height setting out at once for venice he went immediately on his arrival to pay his respects to the count whom he found living with his wife and five children in a very mean apartment in one of the poorer quarters of the town indeed the count was so far reduced in his circumstances that he was even then negotiating so it was rumoured with a travelling company of clowns and acrobats who had had the misfortune to lose their performing dwarf for the sale of his diminutive daughter philomena sir hercules arrived in time to save her from this untoward fate for he was so much charmed by philomena's grace and beauty that at the end of three days courtship he made her a formal offer of marriage which was accepted by her no less joyfully than by her father who perceived in an english son-in-law a rich and unfailing source of revenue after an unostentatious marriage at which the english ambassador acted as one of the witnesses sir hercules and his bride returned by sea to england where they settled down as it proved to a life of uneventful happiness crome and its household of dwarfs delighted philomena who felt herself now for the first time to be a free woman living among her equals in a friendly world she had many tastes in common with her husband especially that of music she had a beautiful voice of a power surprising in one so small and could touch a in alt without effort accompanied by her husband on his fine cremona fiddle which he played as we have noted before as one plays a bass viol she would sing all the liveliest and tenderest airs from the operas and cantatas of her native country seated together at the harpsichord they found that they could with their four hands play all the music written for two hands of ordinary size a circumstance which gave sir hercules unfailing pleasure when they were not making music or reading together which they often did both in english and italian they spent their time in healthful outdoor exercises sometimes rowing in a little boat on the lake but more often riding or driving occupations in which because they were entirely new to her philomena especially delighted when she had become a perfectly proficient rider philomena and her husband used often to go hunting in the park at that time very much more extensive than it is now they hunted not foxes nor hares but rabbits using a pack of about thirty black and fawn-coloured pugs a kind of dog which when not overfed can course a rabbit as well as any of the smaller breeds four dwarf grooms dressed in scarlet liveries and mounted on white exmoor ponies hunted the pack while their master and mistress in green habits followed either on the black shetlands or on the piebald new forest ponies a picture of the whole hunt dogs horses grooms and masters was painted by william stubbs whose work sir hercules admired so much that he invited him though a man of ordinary stature to come and stay at the mansion for the purpose of executing this picture 
stubbs likewise painted a portrait of sir hercules and his lady driving in their great enamelled calash drawn by four black shetlands sir hercules wears a plum-coloured velvet coat and white breeches philomena is dressed in flowered muslin and a very large hat with pink feathers the two figures in their gay carriage stand out sharply against the dark background of trees but to the left of the picture the trees fall away and disappear so that the four black ponies are seen against a pale and strangely lurid sky that has the golden-brown colour of thunder-clouds lighted up by the sun in this way four years passed happily by at the end of that time philomena found herself great with child sir hercules was overjoyed if god is good he wrote in his day-book the name of lapith will be preserved and our rarer and more delicate race transmitted through the generations until in the fullness of time the world shall recognize the superiority of those beings whom now it uses to make fun of on his wife's being brought to bed of a son he wrote a poem to the same effect the child was christened ferdinando in memory of the builder of the house with the passage of the months a certain sense of disquiet began to invade the minds of sir hercules and his lady for the child was growing with an extraordinary rapidity at a year he weighed as much as hercules had weighed when he was three ferdinando goes crescendo wrote philomena in her diary it seems not natural at eighteen months the baby was almost as tall as their smallest jockey who was a man of thirty-six could it be that ferdinando was destined to become a man of the normal gigantic dimensions it was a thought to which neither of his parents dared yet give open utterance but in the secrecy of their respective diaries they brooded over it in terror and dismay on his third birthday ferdinando was taller than his mother and not more than a couple of inches short of his father's height Today, for the first time wrote sir hercules we discuss the situation the hideous truth can be concealed no longer ferdinando is not one of us on this his third birthday a day when we should have been rejoicing at the health the strength and beauty of our child we wept together over the ruin of our happiness god give us strength to bear this cross at the age of eight ferdinando was so large and so exuberantly healthy that his parents decided though reluctantly to send him to school he was packed off to eton at the beginning of the next half a profound peace settled upon the house ferdinando returned for the summer holidays larger and stronger than ever one day he knocked down the butler and broke his arm he is rough inconsiderate unamenable unamenable to persuasion wrote his father the only thing that will teach him manners is corporal chastisement ferdinando who at this age was already seventeen inches taller than his father received no corporal chastisement one summer holidays about three years later ferdinando returned to crome accompanied by a very large mastiff dog he had bought it from an old man at windsor who had found the beast too expensive to feed it was a savage unreliable animal hardly had it entered the house when it attacked one of sir hercules favourite pugs seizing the creature in its jaws and shaking it till it was nearly dead extremely put out by this occurrence sir hercules ordered that the beast should be chained up in the stable-yard ferdinando sullenly answered that the dog was his and he would keep it where he pleased his father growing angry bade him take the animal out of the house at once on pain of his utmost displeasure ferdinando refused to move his mother at this moment coming into the room the dog flew at her knocked her down and in a twinkling had very severely mauled her arm and shoulder in another instant it must infallibly have had her by the throat had not sir hercules drawn his sword and stabbed the animal to the heart turning on his son he ordered him to leave the room immediately as being unfit to remain in the same place with the mother whom he had nearly murdered so awe-inspiring was the spectacle of sir hercules standing with one foot on the carcass of the gigantic dog his sword drawn and still bloody so commanding were his voice his gestures and the expression of his face that ferdinando slunk out of the room in terror and behaved himself for all the rest of the vacation in an entirely exemplary fashion 
his mother soon recovered from the bites of the mastiff but the effect on her mind of this adventure was ineradicable from that time forth she lived always among imaginary terrors the two years which ferdinando spent on the continent making the grand tour were a period of happy repose for his parents but even now the thought of the future haunted them nor were they able to solace themselves with all the diversions of their younger days the lady philomena had lost her voice and sir hercules was grown too rheumatical to play the violin he it is true still rode after his pugs but his wife felt herself too old and since the episode of the mastiff too nervous for such sports at most to please her husband she would follow the hunt at a distance in a little gig drawn by the safest and oldest of the shetlands the day fixed for ferdinando's return came round philomena sick with vague dreads and presentiments retired to her chamber in her bed sir hercules received his son alone a giant in a brown travelling suit entered the room welcome home my son said sir hercules in a voice that trembled a little i hope i see you well sir ferdinando bent down to shake hands then straightened himself up again the top of his father's head reached to the level of his hip ferdinando had not come alone two friends of his own age accompanied him and each of the young men had brought a servant not for thirty years had chrome been desecrated by the presence of so many members of the common race of men sir hercules was appalled and indignant but the laws of hospitality had to be obeyed he received the young gentlemen with grave politeness and sent the servants to the kitchen with orders that they should be well cared for the old family dining-room was dragged out into the light and dusted sir hercules and his lady were accustomed to dine at a small table twenty inches high simon the aged butler who could only just look over the edge of the big table was helped at supper by the three servants brought by ferdinando and his guests sir hercules presided and with his usual grace supported a conversation on the pleasures of foreign travel the beauties of art and nature to be met with abroad the opera at venice the singing of the orphans in the churches of the same city and on other topics of a similar nature the young men were not particularly attentive to his discourses they were occupied in watching the efforts of the butler to change the plates and replenish the glasses they covered their laughter by violent and repeated fits of coughing or choking sir hercules affected not to notice but changed the subject of the conversation to sport upon this one of the young men asked whether it was true as he had heard that he used to hunt the rabbit with a pack of pug dogs sir hercules replied that it was and proceeded to describe the chase in some detail the young men roared with laughter when supper was over sir hercules climbed down from his chair and giving as his excuse that he must see how his lady did bade them good night the sound of laughter followed him up the stairs philomena was not asleep she had been lying on her bed listening to the sound of enormous laughter and the tread of strangely heavy feet on the stairs and along the corridors sir hercules drew a chair to her bedside and sat there for a long time in silence holding his wife's hand and sometimes gently squeezing it at about ten o'clock they were startled by a violent noise there was a breaking of glass a stamping of feet with an outburst of shouts and laughter the uproar continuing for several minutes sir hercules rose to his feet and in spite of his wife's entreaties prepared to go and see what was happening there was no light on the staircase and sir hercules groped his way down cautiously lowering himself from stair to stair and standing for a moment on each tread before adventuring on a new step the noise was louder here the shouting articulated itself into recognizable words and phrases a line of light was visible under the dining-room door sir hercules tiptoed across the hall towards it just as he approached the door there was another terrific crash of breaking glass and jangled metal what could they be doing standing on tiptoe he managed to look through the keyhole in the middle of the ravaged table old simon the butler so primed with drink that he could scarcely keep his balance was dancing a jig his feet crunched and tinkled among the broken glass and his shoes were wet with spilt wine the three young men sat round thumping the table with their hands or with the empty wine bottles shouting and laughing encouragement 
the three servants leaning against the wall laughed too ferdinando suddenly threw a handful of walnuts at the dancer's head which so dazed and surprised the little man that he staggered and fell down on his back upsetting a decanter and several glasses they raised him up gave him some brandy to drink thumped him on the back the old man smiled and hiccuped to-morrow said ferdinando we'll have a concerted ballet of the whole household with father hercules wearing his club and lion skin added one of his companions and all three roared with laughter sir hercules would look and listen no further he crossed the hall once more and began to climb the stairs lifting his knees painfully high at each degree this was the end there was no place for him now in the world no place for him and ferdinando together his wife was still awake to her questioning glance he answered they are making mock of old simon to-morrow it will be our turn they were silent for a time at last philomena said i do not want to see to-morrow it is better not said sir hercules going into his closet he wrote in his day-book a full and particular account of all the events of the evening while he was still engaged in this task he rang for a servant and ordered hot water and a bath to be made ready for him at eleven o'clock when he had finished writing he went into his wife's room and preparing a dose of opium twenty times as strong as that which she was accustomed to take when she could not sleep he brought it to her saying here is your sleeping draught philomena took the glass and lay there for a little time but did not drink immediately the tears came into her eyes do you remember the songs we used to sing sitting out there sulla terrazza in the summer time she began singing softly in her ghost of a cracked voice a few bars from stradella's amor amor non dormir pew and you playing on the violin it seems such a short time ago and yet so long 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 adio amore arrivederci she drank off the draught and lying back on the pillow closed her eyes sir hercules kissed her hand and tiptoed away as though he were afraid of waking her he returned to his closet and having recorded his wife's last words to him he poured into his bath the water that had been brought up in accordance with his orders the water being too hot for him to get into the bath at once he took down from the shelf his copy of suetonius he wished to read how seneca had died he opened the book at random but dwarfs he read he held in abhorrence as being lucis natura and of evil omen he winced as though he had been struck this same augustus he remembered had exhibited in the amphitheatre a young man called lucius of good family who was not quite two feet in height and weighed seventeen pounds but had a stentorian voice he turned over the pages tiberius caligula claudius nero it was a tale of growing horror seneca his preceptor he forced to kill himself and there was petronius who had called his friends about him at the last bidding them talk to him not of the consolations of philosophy but of love and gallantry while the life was ebbing away through his open veins dipping his pen once more in the ink he wrote on the last page of his diary he died a roman death then putting the toes of one foot into the water and finding that it was not too hot he threw off his dressing-gown and taking a razor in his hand sat down in the bath with one deep cut he severed the artery in his left wrist then lay back and composed his mind to meditation the blood oozed out floating through the water in dissolving wreaths and spirals in a little while the whole bath was tinged with pink the colour deepened sir hercules felt himself mastered by an invincible drowsiness he was sinking from vague dream to dream soon he was sound asleep there was not much blood in his small body End of chapter thirteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Fourteen of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Fourteen. For their after luncheon coffee, the party generally adjourned to the library. Its windows looked east, and at this hour of the day, 
it was the coolest place in the whole house it was a large room fitted during the eighteenth century with white painted shelves of an elegant design in the middle of one wall a door ingeniously upholstered with rows of dummy books gave access to a deep cupboard where among a pile of letter files and old newspapers the mummy case of an egyptian lady brought back by the second sir ferdinando on his return from the grand tour mouldered in the darkness from ten yards away and at a first glance one might almost have mistaken this secret door for a section of shelving filled with genuine books coffee cup in hand mr scogan was standing in front of the dummy bookshelf between the sips he discoursed the bottom shelf he was saying is taken up by an encyclopedia in fourteen volumes useful but a little dull as is also capramulge's dictionary of the finnish language the biographical dictionary looks more promising biography of men who were born great biography of men who achieved greatness biography of men who had greatness thrust upon them and biography of men who were never great at all then there were ten volumes of tom's works and wanderings while the wild goose chase a novel by an anonymous author fills no less than six but what's this what's this mr scogan stood on tiptoe and peered up seven volumes of the tales of noxpotch the tales of noxpotch he repeated oh my dear henry he said turning round these are your best books i would willingly give all the rest of your library for them the happy possessor of a multitude of first editions mr wimbush could afford to smile indulgently is it possible mr scogan went on that they possess nothing more than a back and a title he opened the cupboard door and peeped inside as though he hoped to find the rest of the books behind it pooh he said and shut the door again it smells of dust and mildew how symbolical one comes to the great masterpieces of the past expecting some miraculous illumination and one finds on opening them only darkness and dust and a faint smell of decay after all what is reading but a vice like drink or venery or any other form of excessive self-indulgence one reads to tickle and amuse one's mind one reads above all to prevent oneself thinking still the tales of noxpotch he paused and thoughtfully drummed with his fingers on the backs of the non-existent unattainable books but i disagree with you about reading said mary about serious reading i mean quite right mary quite right mr scogan answered i had forgotten there were any serious people in the room i like the idea of the biography said dennis there's room for us all within the scheme it's comprehensive yes the biographies are good the biographies are excellent mr scogan agreed i imagine them written in a very elegant regency style brighton pavilion in words perhaps by the great dr lempriere himself you know his classical dictionary ah mr scogan raised his hand and let it limply fall again in a gesture which implied that words failed him read his biography of helen read how jupiter disguised as a swan was enabled to avail himself of his situation vis-a-vis -vis toledo and to think that he may have must have written these biographies of the great what a work henry and owing to the idiotic arrangement of your library it can't be read i prefer the wild goose chase said anne a novel in six volumes it must be restful restful mr scogan repeated you've hit on the right word a wild goose chase is sound but a bit old-fashioned pictures of clerical life in the fifties you know specimens of the landed gentry peasants for pathos and comedy and in the background always the picturesque beauties of nature soberly described all very good and solid but like certain puddings just a little dull personally i like much better the notion of tom's works and wanderings the eccentric mr tom of tom's hill old tom tom as his intimates used to call him he spent ten years in tibet organizing the clarified butter industry on modern european lines and was able to retire at thirty-six with a handsome fortune the rest of his life he devoted to travel and ratiocination here is the result mr scogan tapped the dummy books and now we come to the tales of noxpotch what a masterpiece and what a great man noxpotch knew how to write fiction 
ah dennis if you could only read knockspotch you wouldn't be writing a novel about the wearisome development of a young man's character you wouldn't be describing in endless fastidious detail cultured life in chelsea and bloomsbury and hampstead you would be trying to write a readable book but then alas owing to the peculiar arrangement of our host's library you never will read knockspotch nobody could regret the fact more than i do said dennis it was knockspotch mr scogan continued the great knockspotch who delivered us from the dreary tyranny of the realistic novel my life knockspotch said is not so long that i can afford to spend precious hours writing or reading descriptions of middle-class interiors he said again i am tired of seeing the human mind bogged in a social plenum i prefer to paint it in a vacuum freely and sportively bombinating i say said gombo knockspotch was a little obscure sometimes wasn't he he was mr scogan replied and with intention it made him seem even profounder than he actually was but it was only in his aphorisms that he was so dark and oracular in his tales he was always luminous oh those tales those tales how shall i describe them fabulous characters shoot across his pages like gaily dressed performers on the trapeze there are extraordinary adventures and still more extraordinary speculations intelligences and emotions relieved of all the imbecile preoccupations of civilized life move in intricate and subtle dances crossing and recrossing advancing retreating impinging an immense erudition and an immense fancy go hand in hand all the ideas of the present and of the past on every possible subject bob up among the tales smile gravely or grimace a caricature of themselves then disappear to make place for something new the verbal surface of his writing is rich and fantastically diversified the wit is incessant the but couldn't you give us a specimen dennis broke in a concrete example alas mr scogan replied knockspotch great book is like the sword excalibur it remains stuck fast in this door awaiting the coming of a writer with genius enough to draw it forth i am not even a writer i am not so much as qualified to attempt the task the extraction of knockspotch from his wooden prison i leave my dear dennis to you thank you said dennis End of chapter 14, recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 15 of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 15 in the time of the amiable brantome mr scogan was saying every debutante at the french court was invited to dine at the king's table where she was served with wine in a handsome silver cup of italian workmanship it was no ordinary cup this goblet of the debutantes for inside it had been most curiously and ingeniously engraved with a series of very lively amorous scenes with each draught that the young lady swallowed these engravings became increasingly visible and the court looked on with interest every time she put her nose in the cup to see whether she blushed at what the ebbing wine revealed if the debutante blushed they laughed at her for her innocence if she did not she was laughed at for being too knowing do you propose asked anne that the custom should be revived at buckingham palace i do not said mr scogan i merely quoted the anecdote as an illustration of the customs so genially frank of the sixteenth century i might have quoted other anecdotes to show that the customs of the seventeenth and eighteenth of the fifteenth and fourteenth centuries and indeed of every other century from the time of hammurabi onward were equally genial and equally frank the only century in which customs were not characterized by the same cheerful openness was the nineteenth of blessed memory it was the astonishing exception and yet with what one must suppose was a deliberate disregard of history it looked upon its horribly pregnant silences as normal and natural and right the frankness of the previous fifteen or twenty thousand years was considered abnormal and perverse it was a curious phenomenon i entirely agree mary panted with excitement in her effort to bring out what she had to say havelock ellis says mr scogan like a policeman arresting the flow of traffic held up his hand he does i know 
and that brings me to my next point the nature of the reaction havelock ellis the reaction when it came and we may say roughly that it set in a little before the beginning of this century the reaction was to openness but not to the same openness as had reigned in the earlier ages it was to a scientific openness not to the jovial frankness of the past that we returned the whole question of amour became a terribly serious one earnest young men wrote in the public prints that from this time forth it would be impossible ever again to make a joke of any sexual matter professors wrote thick books in which sex was sterilized and dissected it has become customary for serious young women like mary to discuss with philosophic calm matters of which the merest hint would have sufficed to throw the youth of the sixties into a delirium of amorous excitement it is all very estimable no doubt but still mr scogan sighed i for one would like to see mingled with this scientific ardour a little more of the jovial spirit of rabelais and chaucer i entirely disagree with you said mary sex isn't a laughing matter it's serious perhaps answered mr scogan perhaps i'm an obscene old man for i must confess that i cannot always regard it as wholly serious but i tell you began mary furiously her face had flushed with excitement her cheeks were the cheeks of a great ripe peach indeed mr scogan continued it seems to me one of the few permanently and everlastingly amusing subjects that exist amour is the one human activity of any importance in which laughter and pleasure predominate, if ever so slightly over misery and pain i entirely disagree said mary there was a silence anne looked at her watch nearly a quarter to eight she said i wonder when ivor will turn up she got up from her deck-chair and leaning her elbows on the balustrade of the terrace looked out over the valley and towards the farther hills under the level evening light the architecture of the land revealed itself the deep shadows the bright contrasting lights gave the hills a new solidity irregularities of the surface unsuspected before were picked out with light and shade the grass the corn the foliage of trees were stippled with intricate shadows the surface of things had taken on a marvellous enrichment look said anne suddenly and pointed on the opposite side of the valley at the crest of the ridge a cloud of dust flushed by the sunlight to rosy gold was moving rapidly along the skyline it's ivor one can tell by the speed the dust cloud descended into the valley and was lost a horn with the voice of a sea lion made itself heard approaching a minute later ivor came leaping round the corner of the house his hair waved in the wind of his own speed he laughed as he saw them anne darling he cried and embraced her embraced mary very nearly embraced mr scogan well here i am i've come with incredulous speed ivor's vocabulary was rich but a little erratic i'm not late for dinner am i he hoisted himself up on to the balustrade and sat there kicking his heels with one arm he embraced a large stone flower-pot leaning his head sideways against its hard and lichenous flanks in an attitude of trustful affection he had brown wavy hair and his eyes were of a very brilliant pale improbable blue his head was narrow his face thin and rather long his nose aquiline in old age though it was difficult to imagine ivor old he might grow to have an iron ducal grimness but now at twenty-six it was not the structure of his face that impressed one it was its expression that was charming and vivacious and his smile was an irradiation he was forever moving restlessly and rapidly but with an engaging gracefulness his frail and slender body seemed to be fed by a spring of inexhaustible energy no you're not late you're in time to answer a question said mr scogan we were arguing whether amour were a serious matter or no what do you think is it serious serious echoed ivor most certainly i told you so cried mary triumphantly but in what sense serious mr scogan asked i mean as an occupation one can go on with it without ever getting bored i see said mr scogan perfectly one can occupy oneself with it ivor continued always and everywhere women are always wonderfully the same shapes vary a little that's all in spain with his free hand he described a series of ample curves one can't pass them on the stairs in england he put the tip of his forefinger against the tip of his thumb and lowering his hand drew out this circle into an imaginary cylinder 
in england they're tubular but their sentiments are always the same at least i've always found it so i'm delighted to hear it said mr scogan end of chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter sixteen of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter sixteen the ladies had left the room and the port was circulating mr scogan filled his glass passed on the decanter and leaning back in his chair looked about him for a moment in silence the conversation rippled idly round him but he disregarded it he was smiling at some private joke gambeau noticed his smile what's amusing you he asked i was just looking at you all sitting round this table said mr scogan are we as comic as all that not at all mr scogan answered politely i was merely amused by my own speculations and what were they the idlest the most academic of speculations i was looking at you one by one and trying to imagine which of the first six caesars you would each resemble if you were given the opportunity of behaving like a caesar the caesars are one of my touchstones mr scogan explained they are characters functioning so to speak in the void they are human beings developed to their logical conclusions hence their unequalled value as a touchstone a standard when i meet someone for the first time i ask myself this question given the caesarian environment which of the caesars would this person resemble julius augustus tiberius caligula claudius nero i take each trait of character each mental and emotional bias each little oddity and magnify them a thousand times the resulting image gives me his caesarian formula in which of the caesars do you resemble asked gambeau i am potentially all of them mr scogan replied all with the possible exception of claudius who was much too stupid to be the development of anything in my character the seeds of julius's courage and compelling energy of augustus's prudence of the libidinousness and cruelty of tiberius of caligula's folly of nero's artistic genius and enormous vanity are all within me given the opportunities i might have been something fabulous but circumstances were against me i was born and brought up in a country rectory i passed my youth doing a great deal of utterly senseless hard work for a very little money the result is that now in middle age i am the poor thing that i am but perhaps it is as well perhaps too it's as well that dennis hasn't been permitted to flower into a little nero and that ivor remains only potentially a caligula yes it's better so no doubt but it would have been more amusing as a spectacle if they had had the chance to develop untrammeled the full horror of their potentialities it would have been pleasant and interesting to watch their tics and foibles and little vices swelling and burgeoning and blossoming into enormous and fantastic flowers of cruelty and pride and lewdness and avarice the caesarian environment makes the caesar as the special food and the queenly cell make the queen bee we differ from the bees in so far that given the proper food they can be sure of making a queen every time with us there is no such certainty out of every ten men placed in the caesarian environment one will be temperamentally good or intelligent or great the rest will blossom into caesars he will not seventy and eighty years ago simple-minded people reading of the exploits of the bourbons in south italy cried out in amazement to think that such things should be happening in the nineteenth century and a few years since we too were astonished to find that in our still more astonishing twentieth century unhappy blackamoors on the congo and the amazon were being treated as english serfs were treated in the time of stephen to-day we are no longer surprised at these things the black and tans harry ireland the poles maltreat the silesians the bold fascisti slaughter their poorer countrymen we take it all for granted since the war we wonder at nothing we have created a caesarian environment and a host of little caesars has sprung up what could be more natural mr scogan drank off what was left of his port and refilled the glass at this very moment he went on the most frightful horrors are taking place in every corner of the world people are being crushed slashed disemboweled mangled their dead bodies rot and their eyes decay with the rest screams of pain and fear go pulsing through the air at the rate of eleven hundred feet per second 
after travelling for three seconds they are perfectly inaudible these are distressing facts but do we enjoy life any the less because of them most certainly we do not we feel sympathy no doubt we represent to ourselves imaginatively the sufferings of nations and individuals and we deplore them but after all what are sympathy and imagination precious little unless the person for whom we feel sympathy happens to be closely involved in our affections and even then they don't go very far and a good thing too for if one had an imagination vivid enough and a sympathy sufficiently sensitive really to comprehend and to feel the sufferings of other people one would never have a moment's peace of mind a really sympathetic race would not so much as know the meaning of happiness but luckily as i've already said we aren't a sympathetic race at the beginning of the war i used to think i really suffered through imagination and sympathy with those who physically suffered but after a month or two i had to admit that honestly i didn't and yet i think i have a more vivid imagination than most one is always alone in suffering the fact is depressing when one happens to be the sufferer but it makes pleasure possible for the rest of the world there was a pause henry wimbush pushed back his chair i think perhaps we ought to go and join the ladies he said so do i said ivor jumping up with alacrity he turned to mr scogan fortunately he said we can share our pleasures we are not always condemned to be happy alone End of chapter 16 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 17 of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 17 ivor brought his hands down with a bang on to the final chord of his rhapsody there was just a hint in that triumphant harmony that the seventh had been struck along with the octave by the thumb of the left hand but the general effect of splendid noise emerged clearly enough small details matter little so long as the general effect is good and besides that hint of the seventh was decidedly modern he turned round in his seat and tossed the hair back out of his eyes there he said that's the best i can do for you i'm afraid murmurs of applause and gratitude were heard and mary her large china eyes fixed on the performer cried out aloud wonderful and gasped for new breath as though she were suffocating nature and fortune had vied with one another in heaping on ivor lombard all their choicest gifts he had wealth and he was perfectly independent he was good-looking possessed an irresistible charm of manner and was the hero of more amorous successes than he could well remember his accomplishments were extraordinary for their number and variety he had a beautiful untrained tenor voice he could improvise with a startling brilliance rapidly and loudly on the piano he was a good amateur medium and telepathist and had a considerable first-hand knowledge of the next world he could write rhymed verses with an extraordinary rapidity for painting symbolical pictures he had a dashing style and if the drawing was sometimes a little weak the colour was always pyrotechnical he excelled in amateur theatricals and when occasion offered he could cook with genius he resembled shakespeare in knowing little latin and less greek for a mind like his education seemed supererogatory training would only have destroyed his natural aptitudes let's go out into the garden ivor suggested it's a wonderful night thank you said mr scogan but i for one prefer these still more wonderful armchairs his pipe had begun to wobble oozily every time he pulled at it he was perfectly happy henry wimbush was also happy he looked for a moment over his pince-nez in ivor's direction and then without saying anything returned to the grimy little sixteenth-century account books which were now his favourite reading he knew more about sir ferdinando's household expenses than about his own the outdoor party enrolled under ivor's banner consisted of anne mary dennis and rather unexpectedly jenny outside it was warm and dark there was no moon they walked up and down the terrace and ivor sang a neapolitan song stretty stretty close close with something about the little spanish girl to follow the atmosphere began to palpitate ivor put his arm round anne's waist dropped his head sideways on to her shoulder and in that position walked on singing as he walked 
it seemed the easiest the most natural thing in the world dennis wondered why he had never done it he hated ivor let's go down to the pool said ivor he disengaged his embrace and turned round to shepherd his little flock they made their way along the side of the house to the entrance of the yew tree walk that led down to the lower garden between the blank precipitous wall of the house and the tall yew trees the path was a chasm of impenetrable gloom somewhere there were steps down to the right a gap in the yew hedge dennis who headed the party groped his way cautiously in this darkness one had an irrational fear of yawning precipices of horrible spiked obstructions suddenly from behind him he heard a shrill started oh and then a sharp dry concussion that might have been the sound of a slap after that jenny's voice was heard pronouncing i am going back to the house her tone was decided and even as she pronounced the words she was melting away into the darkness the incident whatever it had been was closed dennis resumed his forward groping from somewhere behind ivor began to sing again softly note ivor's songs in this chapter are translated from french into english by the reader phyllis is more stingy than tender and will refuse nothing for a profit one day she demanded of sylvander thirty sheep for a kiss the melody drooped and climbed again with a kind of easy languor the warm darkness seemed to pulse like blood about them the next day a new affair sang ivor for the shepherd it was a good bargain here are the steps cried dennis he guided his companions over the danger and in a moment they had the turf of the yew tree walk under their feet it was lighter here or at least it was just perceptibly less dark for the yew walk was wider than the path that had led them under the lee of the house looking up they could see between the high black hedges a strip of sky and a few stars because he got the shepherdess went on ivor and then interrupted himself to shout i'm going to run down and he was off full speed down the invisible slope singing unevenly as he went thirty kisses for a she the others followed dennis shambled in the rear vainly exhorting everyone to caution the slope was steep one might break one's neck what was wrong with these people he wondered they had become like young kittens after a dose of catnip he himself felt a certain kittenishness sporting within him but it was like all his emotions rather a theoretical feeling it did not overmasteringly seek to express itself in a practical demonstration of kittenishness be careful he shouted once more and hardly were the words out of his mouth when thump there was the sound of a heavy fall in front of him followed by the long of a breath indrawn with pain and afterwards by a very sincere oh dennis was almost pleased he had told them so the idiots and they wouldn't listen he trotted down the slope towards the unseen sufferer mary came down the hill like a runaway steam engine it was tremendously exciting this blind rush through the dark she felt she would never stop but the ground grew level beneath her her speed insensibly slackened and suddenly she was caught by an extended arm and brought to an abrupt halt well said ivor as he tightened his embrace you're caught now anne she made an effort to release herself it's not anne it's mary ivor burst into a peal of amused laughter so it is he exclaimed i seem to be making nothing but floaters this evening i've already made one with jenny he laughed again and there was something so jolly about his laughter that mary could not help laughing too he did not remove his encircling arm and somehow it was all so amusing and natural that mary made no further attempt to escape from it they walked along by the side of the pool interlaced mary was too short for him to be able with any comfort to lay his head on her shoulder he rubbed his cheek caressed and caressing against the thick sleek mass of her hair in a little while he began to sing again the night trembled amorously to the sound of her voice when he had finished he kissed her anne or mary mary or anne it didn't seem to make much difference which it was there were differences in detail of course but the general effect was the same and after all the general effect was the important thing dennis made his way down the hill any damage done he called out is that you dennis i've hurt my ankle so and my knee and my hand i'm all in pieces my poor anne he said but then he couldn't help adding it was silly to start running downhill in the dark 
ass she retorted in a tone of tearful irritation of course it was he sat down beside her on the grass and found himself breathing the faint delicious atmosphere of perfume that she carried always with her light a match she commanded i want to look at my wounds he felt in his pockets for the matchbox the light spurted and then grew steady magically a little universe had been created a world of colours and forms anne's face the shimmering orange of her dress her white bare arms a patch of green turf and round about a darkness that had become solid and utterly blind anne held out her hands both were green and earthy with her fall and the left exhibited two or three red abrasions not so bad she said but dennis was terribly distressed and his emotion was intensified when looking up at her face he saw that the trace of tears involuntary tears of pain lingered on her eyelashes he pulled out his handkerchief and began to wipe away the dirt from the wounded hand the match went out it was not worth while to light another anne allowed herself to be attended to meekly and gratefully thank you she said when he had finished cleaning and bandaging her hand and there was something in her tone that made him feel that she had just lost her superiority over him that she was younger than he had become suddenly almost a child he felt tremendously large and protective the feeling was so strong that instinctively he put his arm about her she drew closer leaned against him and so they sat in silence then from below soft but wonderfully clear through the still darkness they heard the sound of ivor's singing he was going on with his half-finished song the next day phyllis was more tender not wanting to displease the shepherd she was too happy to require thirty sheep for a kiss there was a rather prolonged pause it was as though time were being allowed for the giving and receiving of a few of those thirty kisses then the voice sang on the next day phyllis unwisely would give her sheep and a dog for a kiss as fickle as lisette gave for nothing the last note died away into an uninterrupted silence are you better dennis whispered are you comfortable like this she nodded a yes to both questions thirty sheep for a kiss the sheep the woolly mutton ba 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 or the shepherd yes decidedly he felt himself to be the shepherd now he was the master the protector a wave of courage swelled through him warm as wine he turned his head and began to kiss her face at first rather randomly then with more precision on the mouth anne averted her head he kissed the ear the smooth nape that this movement presented him no she protested no dennis why not it spoils our friendship and that was so jolly bosh said dennis she tried to explain can't you see she said it isn't it isn't our stunt at all it was true somehow she had never thought of dennis in the light of a man who might make love she had never so much as conceived the possibilities of an amorous relationship with him he was so absurdly young so so she couldn't find the adjective but she knew what she meant why isn't it our stunt asked dennis and by the way that's a horrible and inappropriate expression because it isn't but if i say it is it makes no difference i say it isn't i shall make you say it is all right dennis but you must do it another time i must go in and get my ankle into hot water it's beginning to swell reasons of health could not be gainsaid dennis got up reluctantly and helped his companion to her feet she took a cautious step oh she halted and leaned heavily on his arm i'll carry you dennis offered he had never tried to carry a woman but on the cinema it always looked an easy piece of heroism you couldn't said anne of course i can he felt larger and more protective than ever put your arms round my neck he ordered she did so and stooping he picked her up under the knees and lifted her from the ground good heavens what a weight he took five staggering steps up the slope then almost lost his equilibrium and had to deposit his burden suddenly with something of a bump and was shaking with laughter i said you couldn't my poor dennis i can said dennis without conviction i'll try again it's perfectly sweet of you to offer but i'd rather walk thanks she laid her hand on his shoulder and thus supported began to limp slowly up the hill my poor dennis she repeated and laughed again humiliated he was silent it seemed incredible that only two minutes ago he should have been holding her in his embrace kissing her incredible 
she was helpless then a child now she had regained all her superiority she was once more the far-off being desired and unassailable why had he been such a fool as to suggest that carrying stunt he reached the house in a state of the profoundest depression he helped anne upstairs left her in the hands of a maid and came down again to the drawing-room he was surprised to find them all sitting just where he had left them he had expected that somehow everything would be quite different it seemed such a prodigious time since he went away all silent and all damned he reflected as he looked at them mr scogan's pipe still wheezed that was the only sound henry wimbush was still deep in his account books he had just made the discovery that sir ferdinando was in the habit of eating oysters a whole summer through regardless of the absence of the justifying r gombo in horn-rimmed spectacles was reading jenny was mysteriously scribbling in her red notebook and seated in her favourite armchair at the corner of the hearth priscilla was looking through a pile of drawings one by one she held them out at arm's length and throwing back her mountainous orange head looked long and attentively through half-closed eyelids she wore a pale sea-green dress on the slope of her mauve powder decolletage diamonds twinkled an immensely long cigarette holder projected at an angle from her face diamonds were embedded in her high piled coiffure they glittered every time she moved it was a batch of ivor's drawings sketches of spirit life made in the course of trance tours through the other world on the back of each sheet descriptive titles were written portrait of an angel fifteenth march twenty astral beings at play third december nineteen a party of souls on their way to a higher sphere twenty first may twenty one before examining the drawing on the obverse of each sheet she turned it over to read the title try as she could and she tried hard priscilla had never seen a vision or succeeded in establishing any communication with the spirit world she had to be content with the reported experiences of others what have you done with the rest of your party she asked looking up as dennis entered the room he explained anne had gone to bed ivor and mary were still in the garden he selected a book in a comfortable chair and tried as far as the disturbed state of his mind would permit him to compose himself for an evening's reading the lamplight was utterly serene there was no movement save the stir of priscilla among her papers all silent and all damned dennis repeated to himself all silent and all damned it was nearly an hour later when ivor and mary made their appearance we waited to see the moon rise said ivor it was gibbous you know mary explained very technical and scientific it was so beautiful down in the garden the trees the scent of the flowers the stars ivor waved his arms and when the moon came up it was really too much it made me burst into tears he sat down at the piano and opened the lid there were a great many meteorites said mary to any one who would listen the earth must just be coming into the summer shower of them in july and august but ivor had already begun to strike the keys he played the garden the stars the scent of flowers the rising moon he even put in a nightingale that was not there mary looked on and listened with parted lips the others pursued their occupation without appearing to be seriously disturbed on this very july day exactly three hundred and fifty years ago sir ferdinando had eaten seven dozen oysters the discovery of this fact gave henry wimbush a peculiar pleasure he had a natural piety which made him delight in the celebration of memorial feasts the three hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the seven dozen oysters he wished he had known before dinner he would have ordered champagne on her way to bed mary paid a call the light was out in anne's room but she was not yet asleep why didn't you come down to the garden with us mary asked i fell down and twisted my ankle dennis helped me home mary was full of sympathy inwardly too she was relieved to find anne's non-appearance so simply accounted for she had been vaguely suspicious down there in the garden suspicious of what she hardly knew but there had seemed to be something a little louche in the way she had suddenly found herself alone with ivor not that she minded of course far from it but she didn't like the idea that perhaps she was the victim of a put-up job i do hope you'll be better to-morrow she said and she commiserated with anne on all she had missed the garden the stars the scent of flowers the meteorites through whose summer shower the earth was now passing the rising moon in its gibbosity 
and then they had had such interesting conversation what about about almost everything nature art science poetry the stars spiritualism the relations of the sexes music religion ivor she thought had an interesting mind the two young ladies parted affectionately end of chapter seventeen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eighteen of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eighteen the nearest roman catholic church was upwards of twenty miles away ivor who was punctilious in his devotions came down early to breakfast and had his car at the door ready to start by a quarter to ten it was a smart expensive-looking machine enamelled a pure lemon yellow and upholstered in emerald green leather there were two seats three if you squeezed tightly enough and their occupants were protected from wind dust and weather by a glazed sedan that rose an elegant eighteenth-century hump from the midst of the body of the car mary had never been to a roman catholic service thought it would be an interesting experience and when the car moved off through the great gates of the courtyard she was occupying the spare seat in the sedan the sea-lion horn roared faintlier faintlier and they were gone in the parish church of crome mr bodiham preached on first kings six eighteen and the cedar of the house within was carved with knops a sermon of immediate local interest for the past two years the problem of the war memorial had exercised the minds of all those in crome who had enough leisure or mental energy or party spirit to think of such things henry wimbush was all for a library a library of local literature stocked with county histories old maps of the district monographs on the local antiquities dialect dictionaries handbooks of the local geology and natural history he liked to think of the villagers inspired by such reading making up parties of a sunday afternoon to look for fossils and flint arrowheads the villagers themselves favoured the idea of a memorial reservoir and water supply but the busiest and most articulate party followed mr bodiham in demanding something religious in character a second lichgate for example a stained-glass window a monument of marble or if possible all three so far however nothing had been done partly because the memorial committee had never been able to agree partly for the more cogent reason that too little money had been subscribed to carry out any of the proposed schemes every three or four months mr bodiham preached a sermon on the subject his last had been delivered in march it was high time that his congregation had a fresh reminder and the cedar of the house within was carved with knops mr bodiham touched lightly on solomon's temple from thence he passed to temples and churches in general what were the characteristics of these buildings dedicated to god obviously the fact of their from a human point of view complete uselessness they were unpractical buildings carved with knops solomon might have built a library indeed what could be more to the taste of the world's wisest man he might have dug a reservoir what more useful in a part city like jerusalem he did neither he built a house all carved with knops useless and unpractical why because he was dedicating the work to god there had been much talk in crome about the proposed war memorial a war memorial was in its very nature a work dedicated to god it was a token of thankfulness that the first stage in the culminating world war had been crowned by the triumph of righteousness it was at the same time a visibly embodied supplication that god might not long delay the advent which alone could bring the final peace a library a reservoir mr bodiham scornfully and indignantly condemned the idea these were works dedicated to man not to god as a war memorial they were totally unsuitable a lichgate had been suggested this was an object which answered perfectly to the definition of a war memorial a useless work dedicated to god and carved with knops one lichgate it was true already existed but nothing would be easier than to make a second entrance into the churchyard and a second entrance would need a second gate 
other suggestions had been made stained glass windows a monument of marble both these were admirable especially the latter it was high time that the war memorial was erected it might soon be too late at any moment like a thief in the night god might come meanwhile a difficulty stood in the way funds were inadequate all should subscribe according to their means those who had lost relations in the war might reasonably be expected to subscribe a sum equal to that which they would have had to pay in funeral expenses if the relative had died while at home further delay was disastrous the war memorial must be built at once he appealed to the patriotism and the christian sentiments of all his hearers henry wimbush walked home thinking of the books that he would present to the war memorial library if ever it came into existence he took the path through the fields it was pleasanter than the road at the first stile a group of village boys loutish young fellows all dressed in the hideous ill-fitting black which makes a funeral of every english sunday and holiday were assembled drearily guffawing as they smoked their cigarettes they made way for henry wimbush touching their caps as he passed he returned their salute his bowler and face were one in their unruffled gravity in sir ferdinando's time he reflected in the time of his son sir julius these young men would have had their sunday diversions even at crome remote and rustic crome there would have been archery skittles dancing social amusements in which they would have partaken as members of a conscious community now they had nothing nothing except mr bodiham's forbidding boys club and the rare dances and concerts organized by himself boredom or the urban pleasures of the county metropolis were the alternatives that presented themselves to these poor youths country pleasures were no more they had been stamped out by the puritans in manningham's diary for sixteen hundred there was a queer passage he remembered a very queer passage certain magistrates in berkshire puritan magistrates had had wind of a scandal one moonlit summer night they had ridden out with their posse and there among the hills they had come upon a company of men and women dancing stark naked among the sheep coats the magistrates and their men had ridden their horses into the crowd how self-conscious the poor people must suddenly have felt how helpless without their clothes against armed and booted horsemen the dancers were arrested whipped jailed set in the stocks the moonlight dances never danced again what old earthy panic right came to extinction here he wondered who knows perhaps their ancestors had danced like this in the moonlight ages before adam and eve were so much as thought of he liked to think so and now it was no more these weary young men if they wanted to dance would have to bicycle six miles to the town the country was desolate without life of its own without indigenous pleasures the pious magistrates had snuffed out forever a little happy flame that had burned from the beginning of time and as on Tullia's tomb one lamp burned clear unchanged for fifteen hundred year he repeated the lines to himself and was desolated to think of all the murdered past end of chapter eighteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter nineteen of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter nineteen henry wimbush's long cigar burned aromatically the history of chrome lay on his knee slowly he turned over the pages i can't decide what episode to read you tonight he said thoughtfully sir ferdinando's voyages are not without interest then of course there's his son sir julius it was he who suffered from the delusion that his perspiration engendered flies it drove him finally to suicide or there's sir cyprian he turned the pages more rapidly or sir henry or sir george no i'm inclined to think i won't read about any of these but you must read something insisted mr scogan taking his pipe out of his mouth i think i shall read about my grandfather said henry wimbush and the events that led up to his marriage with the eldest daughter of the last sir ferdinando good said mr scogan we are listening before i begin reading said henry wimbush looking up from the book and taking off the pince-nez which he had just fitted to his nose 
before i begin i must say a few preliminary words about sir ferdinando the last of the lapiths at the death of the virtuous and unfortunate sir hercules ferdinando found himself in possession of the family fortune not a little increased by his father's temperance and thrift he applied himself forthwith to the task of spending it which he did in an ample and jovial fashion by the time he was forty he had eaten and above all drunk and loved away about half his capital and would infallibly have soon got rid of the rest in the same manner if he had not had the good fortune to become so madly enamoured of the rector's daughter as to make a proposal of marriage the young lady accepted him and in less than a year had become the absolute mistress of crome and her husband an extraordinary reformation made itself apparent in sir ferdinando's character he grew regular and economical in his habits he even became temperate rarely drinking more than a bottle and a half of port at a sitting the waning fortune of the lapiths began once more to wax and that in spite of the hard times for sir ferdinando married in eighteen o nine in the height of the napoleonic wars a prosperous and dignified old age cheered by the spectacle of his children's growth and happiness for lady lapith had already borne him three daughters and there seemed no good reason why he should not bear many more of them and sons as well a patriarchal decline into the family vault seemed now to be sir ferdinando's enviable destiny but providence willed otherwise to napoleon cause already of such infinite mischief was due though perhaps indirectly the untimely and violent death which put a period to this reformed existence sir ferdinando who was above all things a patriot had adopted from the earliest days of the conflict with the french his own peculiar method of celebrating our victories when the happy news reached london it was his custom to purchase immediately a large store of liquor and taking a place on whichever of the outgoing coaches he happened to light on first to drive through the country proclaiming the good news to all he met on the road and dispensing it along with the liquor at every stopping place to all who cared to listen or drink thus after the nile he had driven as far as edinburgh and later when the coaches wreathed with laurel for triumph with cyprus for mourning were setting out with the news of nelson's victory and death he sat through all a chilly october night on the box of the norwich meteor with a nautical keg of rum on his knees and two cases of old brandy under the seat this genial custom was one of the many habits which he abandoned on his marriage the victories in the peninsula the retreat from moscow leipzig and the abdication of the tyrant all went uncelebrated it so happened however that in the summer of eighteen fifteen sir ferdinando was staying for a few weeks in the capital there had been a succession of anxious doubtful days then came the glorious news of waterloo it was too much for sir ferdinando his joyous youth awoke again within him he hurried to his wine merchant and bought a dozen bottles of seventeen sixty brandy the bath coach was on the point of starting he bribed his way on to the box and seated in glory beside the driver proclaimed aloud the downfall of the corsican bandit and passed about the warm liquid joy they clattered through uxbridge slough maidenhead sleeping reading was awakened by the great news at didcot one of the ostlers was so much overcome by patriotic emotions and the seventeen sixty brandy that he found it impossible to do up the buckles of the harness the night began to grow chilly and sir ferdinando found that it was not enough to take a nip at every stage to keep up his vital warmth he was compelled to drink between the stages as well they were approaching swindon the coach was travelling at a dizzy speed six miles in the last half hour when without having manifested the slightest premonitory symptom of unsteadiness sir ferdinando suddenly toppled sideways off his seat and fell head foremost into the road an unpleasant jolt awakened the slumbering passengers the coach was brought to a standstill the guard ran back with a light he found sir ferdinando still alive but unconscious blood was oozing from his mouth the back wheels of the coach had passed over his body breaking most of his ribs and both arms his skull was fractured in two places 
they picked him up but he was dead before they reached the next stage so perished sir ferdinando a victim to his own patriotism lady lapith did not marry again but determined to devote the rest of her life to the well-being of her three children georgiana now five years old and emmeline and caroline twins of two henry wimbush paused and once more put on his pince-nez so much by way of introduction he said now i can begin to read about my grandfather one moment said mr scogan till i've refilled my pipe mr wimbush waited seated apart in a corner of the room ivor was showing mary his sketches of spirit life they spoke together in whispers mr scogan had lighted his pipe again fire away he said henry wimbush fired away it was in the spring of eighteen thirty three that my grandfather george wimbush first made the acquaintance of the three lovely lapiths as they were always called he was then a young man of twenty-two with curly yellow hair and a smooth pink face that was the mirror of his youthful and ingenuous mind he had been educated at harrow and christ church he enjoyed hunting and all other field sports and though his circumstances were comfortable to the verge of affluence his pleasures were temperate and innocent his father an east indian merchant had destined him for a political career and had gone to considerable expense in acquiring a pleasant little cornish borough as a twenty-first birthday gift for his son he was justly indignant when on the very eve of george's majority the reform bill of eighteen thirty two swept the borough out of existence the inauguration of george's political career had to be postponed at the time he got to know the lovely lapiths he was waiting he was not at all impatient the lovely lapiths did not fail to impress him georgiana the eldest with her black ringlets her flashing eyes her noble aquiline profile her swan-like neck and sloping shoulders was orientally dazzling and the twins with their delicately turned-up noses their blue eyes and chestnut hair were an identical pair of ravishingly english charmers their conversation at this first meeting proved however to be so forbidding that but for the invincible attraction exercised by their beauty george would never have had the courage to follow up the acquaintance the twins looking up their noses at him with an air of languid superiority asked him what he thought of the latest french poetry and whether he liked the indiana of georges Sand. what was almost worse was the question with which georgiana opened her conversation with him in music she asked leaning forward and fixing him with her large dark eyes are you a classicist or a transcendentalist george did not lose his presence of mind he had enough appreciation of music to know that he hated anything classical and so with a promptitude which did him credit he replied i am a transcendentalist georgiana smiled bewitchingly i am glad she said so am i you went to hear paganini last week of course the prayer of moses ah she closed her eyes do you know anything more transcendental than that no said george i don't he hesitated was about to go on speaking and then decided that after all it would be wiser not to say what was in fact true that he enjoyed above all paganini's farmyard imitations the man had made his fiddle bray like an ass cluck like a hen grunt squeal bark neigh quack bellow and growl that last item in george's estimation had almost compensated for the tediousness of the rest of the concert he smiled with pleasure at the thought of it yes decidedly he was no classicist in music he was a thorough-going transcendentalist george followed up this first introduction by paying a call on the young ladies and their mother who occupied during the season a small but elegant house in the neighbourhood of berkeley square lady lapith made a few discreet inquiries and having found that george's financial position character and family were all passably good she asked him to dine she hoped and expected that her daughters would all marry into the peerage but being a prudent woman she knew it was advisable to prepare for all contingencies george wimbush she thought would make an excellent second string for one of the twins at this first dinner george's partner was emmeline they talked of nature emmeline protested that to her high mountains were a feeling and the hum of human cities torture george agreed that the country was very agreeable but held that london during the season also had its charms 
he noticed with surprise and a certain solicitous distress that miss emmeline's appetite was poor that it didn't in fact exist two spoonfuls of soup a morsel of fish no bird no meat and three grapes that was her whole dinner he looked from time to time at her two sisters georgiana and caroline seemed to be quite as abstemious they waved away whatever was offered them with an expression of delicate disgust shutting their eyes and averting their faces from the proffered dish as though the lemon sole the duck the loin of veal the trifle were objects revolting to the sight and smell george who thought the dinner capital ventured to comment on the sister's lack of appetite pray don't talk to me of eating said emmeline drooping like a sensitive plant we find it so coarse so unspiritual my sisters and i one can't think of one's soul while one is eating george agreed one couldn't but one must live he said alas emmeline sighed one must death is very beautiful don't you think she broke a corner off a piece of toast and began to nibble at it languidly but since as you say one must live she made a little gesture of resignation luckily a very little suffices to keep one alive she put down her corner of toast half eaten george regarded her with some surprise she was pale but she looked extraordinarily healthy he thought so did her sisters perhaps if you were really spiritual you needed less food he clearly was not spiritual after this he saw them frequently they all liked him from lady lapeth downwards true he was not very romantic or poetical but he was such a pleasant unpretentious kind-hearted young man that one couldn't help liking him for his part he thought them wonderful wonderful especially georgiana he enveloped them all in a warm protective affection for they needed protection they were altogether too frail too spiritual for this world they never ate they were always pale they often complained of fever they talked much and lovingly of death they frequently swooned georgiana was the most ethereal of all of the three she ate least swooned most often talked most of death and was the palest with a pallor that was so startling as to appear positively artificial at any moment it seemed she might loose her precarious hold on this material world and become all spirit to george the thought was a continual agony if she were to die she contrived however to live through the season and that in spite of the numerous balls routs and other parties of pleasure which in company with the rest of the lovely trio she never failed to attend in the middle of july the whole household moved down to the country george was invited to spend the month of august at crome the house party was distinguished in the list of visitors figured the names of two marriageable young men of title george had hoped that country air repose and natural surroundings might have restored to the three sisters their appetites and the roses of their cheeks he was mistaken for dinner the first evening georgiana only ate an olive two or three salted almonds and half a peach she was as pale as ever during the meal she spoke of love true love she said being infinite and eternal can only be consummated in eternity indiana and sir rodolphe celebrated the mystic wedding of their souls by jumping into niagara love is incompatible with life the wish of two people who truly love one another is not to live together but to die together come come my dear said lady lapeth stout and practical what would become of the next generation pray if all the world acted on your principles mamma georgiana protested and dropped her eyes in my young days lady lapeth went on i should have been laughed out of countenance if i'd said a thing like that but then in my young days souls weren't as fashionable as they are now and we didn't think death was at all poetical it was just unpleasant mamma emmeline and caroline implored in unison in my young days lady lapeth was launched into her subject nothing it seemed could stop her now in my young days if you didn't eat people told you you needed a dose of rhubarb nowadays there was a cry georgiana had swooned sideways on to lord timpany's shoulder it was a desperate expedient but it was successful lady lapeth was stopped the days passed in an uneventful round of pleasures of all the gay party george alone was unhappy lord timpany was paying his court to georgiana and it was clear that he was not unfavourably received george looked on and his soul was a hell of jealousy and despair 
the boisterous company of the young men became intolerable to him he shrank from them seeking gloom and solitude one morning having broken away from them on some vague pretext he returned to the house alone the young men were bathing in the pool below their cries and laughter floated up to him making the quiet house seem lonelier and more silent the lovely sisters and their mamma still kept their chambers they did not customarily make their appearance till luncheon so that the male guests had the morning to themselves george sat down in the hall and abandoned himself to thought at any moment she might die at any moment she might become lady timpany it was terrible terrible if she died then he would die too he would go to seek her beyond the grave if she became lady timpany ah then the solution of the problem would not be so simple if she became lady timpany it was a horrible thought but then suppose she were in love with timpany though it seemed incredible that any one could be in love with timpany suppose her life depended on timpany suppose she couldn't live without him he was fumbling his way along this clueless labyrinth of suppositions when the clock struck twelve on the last stroke like an automaton released by the turning clockwork a little maid holding a large covered tray popped out of the door that led from the kitchen regions into the hall from his deep armchair george watched her himself it was evident unobserved with an idle curiosity she pattered across the room and came to a halt in front of what seemed a blank expanse of panelling she reached out her hand and to george's extreme astonishment a little door swung open revealing the foot of a winding staircase turning sideways in order to get her tray through the narrow opening the little maid darted in with a rapid crab-like motion the door closed behind her with a click a minute later it opened again and the maid without her tray hurried back across the hall and disappeared in the direction of the kitchen george tried to recompose his thoughts but an invincible curiosity drew his mind towards the hidden door the staircase the little maid it was in vain he told himself that the matter was none of his business that to explore the secrets of that surprising door that mysterious staircase within would be a piece of unforgivable rudeness and indiscretion it was in vain for five minutes he struggled heroically with his curiosity but at the end of that time he found himself standing in front of the innocent sheet of panelling through which the little maid had disappeared a glance sufficed to show him the position of the secret door secret he perceived only to those who looked with a careless eye it was just an ordinary door let in flush with the panelling no latch nor handle betrayed its position but an unobtrusive catch sunk in the wood invited the thumb george was astonished that he had not noticed it before now he had seen it it was so obvious almost as obvious as the cupboard door in the library with its lines of imitation shelves and its dummy books he pulled back the catch and peeped inside the staircase of which the degrees were made not of stone but of blocks of ancient oak wound up and out of sight a slit-like window admitted the daylight he was at the foot of the central tower and the little window looked out over the terrace they were still shouting and splashing in the pool below george closed the door and went back to his seat but his curiosity was not satisfied indeed this partial satisfaction had but whetted its appetite where did the staircase lead what was the errand of the little maid it was no business of his he kept repeating no business of his he tried to read but his attention wandered a quarter past twelve sounded on the harmonious clock suddenly determined george rose crossed the room opened the hidden door and began to ascend the stairs he passed the first window corkscrewed round and came to another he paused for a moment to look out his heart beat uncomfortably as though he were affronting some unknown danger what he was doing he told himself was extremely ungentlemanly horribly underbred he tiptoed onward and upward one turn more than half a turn and a door confronted him he halted before it listened he could hear no sound putting his eye to the keyhole he saw nothing but a stretch of white sunlit wall emboldened he turned the handle and stepped across the threshold there he halted petrified by what he saw mutely gaping in the middle of a pleasantly sunny little room it is now priscilla's boudoir mr wimbush remarked parenthetically stood a small circular table of mahogany 
crystal porcelain and silver all the shining apparatus of an elegant meal were mirrored in its polished depths the carcass of a cold chicken a bowl of fruit a great ham deeply gashed to its heart of tenderest white and pink the brown cannon-ball of a cold plum pudding a slender hock bottle and a decanter of claret jostled one another for a place on this festive board and round the table sat the three sisters the three lovely lapiths eating at george's sudden entrance they had all looked towards the door and now they sat petrified by the same astonishment which kept george fixed and staring georgiana who sat immediately facing the door gazed at him with dark enormous eyes behind the thumb and forefinger of her right hand she was holding a drumstick of the dismembered chicken her little finger elegantly crooked stood apart from the rest of her hand her mouth was open but the drumstick had never reached its destination it remained suspended frozen in mid-air the other two sisters had turned round to look at the intruder caroline still grasped her knife and fork emmeline's fingers were round the stem of her claret glass for what seemed a very long time george and the three sisters stared at one another in silence they were a group of statues then suddenly there was movement georgiana dropped her chicken bone caroline's knife and fork clattered on her plate the movement propagated itself grew more decisive emmeline sprang to her feet uttering a cry the wave of panic reached george he turned and mumbling something unintelligible as he went rushed out of the room and down the winding stairs he came to a standstill in the hall and there all by himself in the quiet house he began to laugh at luncheon it was noticed that these sisters ate a little more than usual georgiana toyed with some french beans and a spoonful of calf's foot jelly i feel a little stronger to-day she said to lord timpany when he congratulated her on this increase of appetite a little more material she added with a nervous laugh looking up she caught george's eye a blush suffused her cheeks and she looked hastily away in the garden that afternoon they found themselves for a moment alone you won't tell anyone george promise you won't tell anyone she implored it would make us look so ridiculous and besides eating is unspiritual isn't it say you won't tell anyone i will said george brutally i'll tell everyone unless it's blackmail i don't care said george i'll give you twenty-four hours to decide lady lapith was disappointed of course she had hoped for better things for timpany and a coronet but george after all wasn't so bad they were married at the new year my poor grandfather mr wimbush added as he closed his book and put away his pince-nez whenever i read in the papers about oppressed nationalities i think of him he relighted his cigar it was a maternal government highly centralized and there were no representative institutions henry wimbush ceased speaking in the silence that ensued ivor's whispered commentary on the spirit sketches once more became audible priscilla who had been dozing suddenly woke up what she said in the startled tones of one newly returned to consciousness what jenny caught the words she looked up smiled nodded reassuringly it's about a ham she said what's about a ham what henry has been reading she closed the red notebook lying on her knees and slipped a rubber band round it i'm going to bed she announced and got up so am i said anne yawning but she lacked the energy to rise from her armchair the night was hot and oppressive round the open windows the curtains hung unmoving ivor fanning himself with the portrait of an astral being looked out into the darkness and drew a breath the air's like wool he declared it will get cooler after midnight said henry wimbush and cautiously added perhaps i shan't sleep i know priscilla turned her head in his direction the monumental coiffure nodded exorbitantly at her slightest movement you must make an effort she said when i can't sleep i concentrate my will i say i will sleep i am asleep and pop off i go that's the power of thought but does it work on stuffy nights ivor inquired i simply cannot sleep on a stuffy night nor can i said mary except out of doors out of doors what a wonderful idea in the end they decided to sleep on the towers mary on the western tower ivor on the eastern there was a flat expanse of leads on each of the towers and you could get a mattress through the trap doors that opened on to them under the stars under the gibbous moon assuredly they would sleep 
the mattresses were hauled up sheets and blankets were spread and an hour later the two insomniasts each on his separate tower were crying their good-nights across the dividing gulf on mary the sleep-compelling charm of the open air did not work with its expected magic even through the mattress one could not fail to be aware that the leads were extremely hard then there were noises the owls screeched tirelessly and once roused by some unknown terror all the geese of the farmyard burst into a sudden frenzy of cackling the stars in the gibbous moon demanded to be looked at and when one meteorite had streaked across the sky you could not help waiting open-eyed and alert for the next time passed the moon climbed higher and higher in the sky mary felt less sleepy than she had when she first came out she sat up and looked over the parapet had ivor been able to sleep she wondered and as though in answer to her mental question from behind the chimney stack at the farther end of the roof a white form noiselessly emerged a form that in the moonlight was recognizably ivor's spreading his arms to right and left like a tight-rope dancer he began to walk forward along the roof-tree of the house he swayed terrifyingly as he advanced mary looked on speechlessly perhaps he was walking in his sleep suppose he were to wake up suddenly now if she spoke or moved it might mean his death she dared look no more but sank back to her pillows she listened intently for what seemed an immensely long time there was no sound then there was a patter of feet on the tiles followed by a scrabbling noise and a whispered damn and suddenly ivor's head and shoulders appeared above the parapet one leg followed then the other he was on the leads mary pretended to wake up with a start oh she said what are you doing here i couldn't sleep he explained so i came along to see if you couldn't one gets bored by oneself on a tower don't you find it so it was light before five long narrow clouds barred the east their edges bright with orange fire the sky was pale and watery with the mournful scream of a soul in pain a monstrous peacock flying heavily up from below alighted on the parapet of the tower ivor and mary started broad awake catch him cried ivor jumping up we'll have a feather the frightened peacock ran up and down the parapet in an absurd distress curtsying and bobbing and clucking his long tail swung ponderously back and forth as he turned and turned again then with a flap and swish he launched himself upon the air and sailed magnificently earthward with a recovered dignity but he had left a trophy ivor had his feather a long-lashed eye of purple and green of blue and gold he handed it to his companion an angel's feather he said mary looked at it for a moment gravely and intently her purple pyjamas clothed her with an ampleness that hid the lines of her body she looked like some large comfortable unjointed toy a sort of teddy bear but a teddy bear with an angel's head pink cheeks and hair like a bell of gold an angel's face the feather of an angel's wing somehow the whole atmosphere of the sunrise was rather angelic it's extraordinary to think of sexual selection she said at last looking up from her contemplation of the miraculous feather extraordinary ivor echoed i select you you select me what luck he put his arm round her shoulders and they stood looking eastward the first sunlight had begun to warm and colour the pale light of the dawn mauve pyjamas and white pyjamas they were a young and charming couple the rising sun touched their faces it was all extremely symbolic but then if you choose to think so nothing in this world is not symbolical profound and beautiful truth i must be getting back to my tower said ivor at last already i'm afraid so the varletry will soon be up and about ivor there was a prolonged and silent farewell and now said ivor i repeat my tight-rope stunt mary threw her arms round his neck you mustn't ivor it's dangerous please he had to yield at last to her entreaties all right he said i'll go down through the house and up at the other end he vanished through the trap-door into the darkness that still lurked within the shuttered house a minute later he had reappeared on the farther tower he waved his hand and then sank down out of sight behind the parapet 
from below in the house came the thin wasp-like buzzing of an alarm clock he had gone back just in time end of chapter nineteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty ivor was gone lounging behind the wind-screen in his yellow sedan he was whirling across rural england social and amorous engagements of the most urgent character called him from hall to baronial hall from castle to castle from elizabethan manor-house to georgian mansion over the whole expanse of the kingdom to-day in somerset to-morrow in warwickshire on saturday in the west riding by tuesday morning in argyle ivor never rested the whole summer through from the beginning of july till the end of september he devoted himself to his engagements he was a martyr to them in the autumn he went back to london for a holiday crome had been a little incident an evanescent bubble on the stream of his life it belonged already to the past by tea-time he would be at gobley and there would be zenobia's welcoming smile and on thursday morning but that was a long long way ahead he would think of thursday morning when thursday morning arrived meanwhile there was gobley meanwhile zenobia in the visitor's book at crome ivor had left according to his invariable custom in these cases a poem he had improvised it magisterially in the ten minutes preceding his departure dennis and mr scogan strolled back together from the gates of the courtyard whence they had bidden their last farewells on the writing-table in the hall they found the visitor's book open and ivor's composition scarcely dry mr scogan read it aloud the magic of those immemorial kings who webbed enchantment on the bowls of night sleeps in the soul of all created things in the blue sea the acrosseronian height in the eyed butterfly's auricular wings and orgied visions of the anchorite in all that singing flies and flying sings in rain in pain in delicate delight but much more magic much more cogent spells weave here their wizardries about my soul crome calls me like the voice of vesperal bells haunts like a ghostly peopled necropole fate tears me hence hard fate since far from crome my soul must weep remembering its home very nice and tasteful and tactful said mr scogan when he had finished i am only troubled by the butterfly's auricular wings you have a first-hand knowledge of the workings of a poet's mind dennis perhaps you can explain what could be simpler said dennis it's a beautiful word and ivor wanted to say that the wings were golden you make it luminously clear one suffers so much dennis went on from the fact that beautiful words don't always mean what they ought to mean recently for example i had a whole poem ruined just because the word carminative didn't mean what it ought to have meant carminative it's admirable isn't it admirable mr scogan agreed and what does it mean it's a word i've treasured from my earliest infancy said dennis treasured in love they used to give me cinnamon when i had a cold quite useless but not disagreeable one poured it drop by drop out of narrow bottles a golden liquor fierce and fiery on the label was a list of its virtues and among other things it was described as being in the highest degree carminative i adored the word isn't it carminative i used to say to myself when i'd taken my dose it seemed so wonderfully to describe that sensation of internal warmth that glow that what shall i call it physical self-satisfaction which followed the drinking of cinnamon later when i discovered alcohol carminative described for me that similar but nobler more spiritual glow which wine evokes not only in the body but in the soul as well the carminative virtues of burgundy of rum of old brandy of lacryma christi of marsala of aliatico of stout of gin of champagne of claret of the raw new wine of this year's tuscan vintage i compared them i classified them marsala is rosily downily carminative gin pricks and refreshes while it warms i had a whole table of carmination values and now dennis spread out his hands palms upward despairingly 
now i know what carminative really means well what does it mean asked mr scogan a little impatiently carminative said dennis lingering lovingly over the syllables carminative i imagined vaguely that it had something to do with carmen carminus still more vaguely with caro carnis and its derivatives like carnival and carnation carminative there was the idea of singing and the idea of flesh rose-coloured and warm with a suggestion of the jollities of my Karim and the masked holidays of venice carminative the warmth the glow the interior ripeness were all in the word instead of which do come to the point my dear dennis protested mr scogan do come to the point well i wrote a poem the other day said dennis i wrote a poem about the effects of love others have done the same before you said mr scogan there's no need to be ashamed i was putting forward the notion dennis went on that the effects of love were often similar to the effects of wine that eros could intoxicate as well as bacchus love for example is essentially carminative it gives one the sense of warmth the glow and passion carminative as wine was what i wrote not only was the line elegantly sonorous it was also i flattered myself very aptly compendiously expressive everything was in the word carminative a detailed exact foreground an immense indefinite hinterland of suggestion and passion carminative as wine i was not ill-pleased and then suddenly it occurred to me that i had never actually looked up the word in a dictionary carminative had grown up with me from the days of the cinnamon bottle it had always been taken for granted carminative for me the word was as rich in content as some tremendous elaborate work of art it was a complete landscape with figures and passion carminative as wine it was the first time i had ever committed the word to writing and all at once i felt i would like lexicographical authority for it a small english german dictionary was all i had at hand i turned up c c a c r c a r m there it was carminative wind treibend wind treibend he repeated mr scogan laughed dennis shook his head ah he said for me it was no laughing matter for me it marked the end of a chapter the death of something young and precious there were the years years of childhood and innocence when i had believed that carminative meant well carminative and now before me lies the rest of my life a day perhaps ten years half a century when i shall know that carminative means vintreibend plus ne suis ce que j'ai été et ne le saurai jamais être it is a realization that makes one rather melancholy carminative said mr scogan thoughtfully carminative dennis repeated and they were silent for a time words said dennis at last words i wonder if you can realize how much i love them you are too much preoccupied with mere things and ideas and people to understand the full beauty of words your mind is not a literary mind the spectacle of mr gladstone finding thirty-four rhymes to the name margot seems to you rather pathetic than anything else mallarme's envelopes with their versified addresses leave you cold unless they leave you pitiful you can't see that apte ne point te cabre eu poste j'ajouterai dia si tu ne fuis onze birou balza chez set heredia is a little miracle you're right said mr scogan i can't you don't feel it to be magical no that's the test for the literary mind said dennis the feeling of magic the sense that words have power the technical verbal part of literature is simply a development of magic words are man's first and most grandiose invention with language he created a whole new universe what wonder if he loved words and attributed power to them with fitted harmonious words the magicians summoned rabbits out of empty hats and spirits from the elements their descendants the literary men still go on with the process morticing their verbal formulas together and before the power of the finished spell trembling with delight and awe rabbits out of empty hats no their spells are more subtly powerful for they evoke emotions out of empty minds formulated by their art the most insipid statements become enormously significant 
for example i proffer the constatation black ladders lack bladders a self-evident truth one on which it would not have been worth while to insist had i chosen to formulate it in such words as black fire escapes have no bladders or les échelles noires manquant de vessie but since i put it as i do black ladders lack bladders it becomes for all its self-evidence significant unforgettable moving the creation by word power of something out of nothing what is that but magic and i may add what is that but literature half the world's greatest poetry is simply les échelles noires manquant de vestie translated into magic significance as black ladders lack bladders and you can't appreciate words i'm sorry for you a mental carminative said mr scogan reflectively that's what you need end of chapter twenty recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty one of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty one perched on its four stone mushrooms the little granary stood two or three feet above the grass of the green close beneath it there was a perpetual shade and a damp growth of long luxuriant grasses here in the shadow in the green dampness a family of white ducks had sought shelter from the afternoon sun some stood preening themselves some reposed with their long bellies pressed to the ground as though the cool grass were water little social noises burst fitfully forth and from time to time some pointed tail would execute a brilliant litzian tremolo suddenly their jovial repose was shattered a prodigious thump shook the wooden flooring above their heads the whole granary trembled little fragments of dirt and crumbled wood rained down upon them with a loud continuous quacking the ducks rushed out from beneath this nameless menace and did not stay their flight till they were safely in the farmyard don't lose your temper anne was saying listen you frightened the ducks poor dears no wonder she was sitting sideways in a low wooden chair her right elbow rested on the back of the chair and she supported her cheek on her hand her long slender body drooped into curves of a lazy grace she was smiling and she looked at gambeau through half-closed eyes damn you gambeau repeated and stamped his foot again he glared at her round the half-finished portrait on the easel poor ducks and repeated the sound of their quacking was faint in the distance it was inaudible can't you see you make me lose my time he asked i can't work with you dangling about distractingly like this you'd lose less time if you stopped talking and stamping your feet and did a little painting for a change after all what am i dangling about for except to be painted gambeau made a noise like a growl you're awful he said with conviction why do you ask me to come and stay here why do you tell me you'd like me to paint your portrait for the simple reasons that i like you at least when you're in a good temper and that i think you're a good painter for the simple reason gambeau mimicked her voice that you want me to make love to you and when i do to have the amusement of running away anne threw back her head and laughed so you think it amuses me to have to evade your advances so like a man if you only knew how gross and awful and boring men are when they try to make love and you don't want them to make love if you could only see yourselves through our eyes gambeau picked up his palette and brushes and attacked his canvas with the ardour of irritation i suppose you'll be saying next that you didn't start the game that it was i who made the first advances and that you were the innocent victim who sat still and never did anything that could invite or allure me on so like a man again said anne it's always the same old story about the woman tempting the man the woman lures fascinates invites and man noble man innocent man falls a victim my poor gambo surely you're not going to sing that old song again it's so unintelligent and i always thought you were a man of sense thanks said gambo be a little objective anne went on 
can't you see that you're simply externalizing your own emotions that's what you men are always doing it's so barbarously naive you feel one of your loose desires for some woman and because you desire her strongly you immediately accuse her of luring you on of deliberately provoking and inviting the desire you have the mentality of savages you might just as well say that a plate of strawberries and cream deliberately lures you on to feel greedy in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred women are as passive and innocent as the strawberries and cream well all i can say is that this must be the hundredth case said gombo without looking up and shrugged her shoulders and gave vent to a sigh i'm at a loss to know whether you're more silly or more rude after painting for a little time in silence gombo began to speak again and then there's dennis he said renewing the conversation as though it had only just been broken off you're playing the same game with him why can't you leave that wretched young man in peace and flushed with a sudden and uncontrollable anger it's perfectly untrue about dennis she said indignantly i never dreamt of playing what you beautifully call the same game with him recovering her calm she added in her ordinary cooing voice and with her exacerbating smile you've become very protective towards poor dennis all of a sudden i have gombo replied with a gravity that was somehow a little too solemn i don't like to see a young man being whirled along the road to ruin said anne continuing his sentence for him i admire your sentiments and believe me i share them she was curiously irritated at what gombo had said about dennis it happened to be so completely untrue gombo might have some slight ground for his reproaches but dennis no she had never flirted with dennis poor boy he was very sweet she became somewhat pensive gombo painted on with fury the restlessness of an unsatisfied desire which before had distracted his mind making work impossible seemed now to have converted itself into a kind of feverish energy when it was finished he told himself the portrait would be diabolic he was painting her in the pose she had naturally adopted at the first sitting seated sideways her elbow on the back of the chair her head and shoulders turned at an angle from the rest of her body towards the front she had fallen into an attitude of indolent abandonment he had emphasized the lazy curves of her body the lines sagged as they crossed the canvas the grace of the painted figure seemed to be melting into a kind of soft decay the hand that lay along the knee was as limp as a glove he was at work on the face now it had begun to emerge on the canvas doll-like in its regularity and listlessness it was anne's face but her face as it would be utterly unillumined by the inward lights of thought and emotion it was the lazy expressionless mask which was sometimes her face the portrait was terribly like and at the same time it was the most malicious of lies yes it would be diabolic when it was finished gombo decided he wondered what she would think of it End of chapter 21 recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter 22 of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter 22 for the sake of peace and quiet dennis had retired earlier on this same afternoon to his bedroom he wanted to work but the hour was a drowsy one and lunch so recently eaten weighed heavily on body and mind the meridian demon was upon him he was possessed by that bored and hopeless postprandial melancholy which the cenobites of old knew and feared under the name of oxidi he felt like ernest dowson a little weary he was in the mood to write something rather exquisite and gentle and quietist in tone something a little droopy and at the same time how should he put it a little infinite he thought of anne of love hopeless and unattainable perhaps that was the ideal kind of love the hopeless kind the quiet theoretical kind of love in this sad mood of repletion he could well believe it he began to write one elegant quatrain had flowed from beneath his pen a brooding love which is at most the stealth of moonbeams when they slide evoking colour's bloodless ghost or some scarce breathing breast or side 
when his attention was attracted by a sound from outside he looked down from his window there they were anne and gambeau talking laughing together they crossed the courtyard in front and passed out of sight through the gate in the right-hand wall that was the way to the green clothes in the granary she was going to sit for him again his pleasantly depressing melancholy was dissipated by a puff of violent emotion angrily he threw his quatrain into the waste-paper basket and ran downstairs the stealth of moonbeams indeed in the hall he saw mr scogan the man seemed to be lying in wait dennis tried to escape but in vain mr scogan's eye glittered like the eye of the ancient mariner not so fast he said stretching out a small saurian hand with pointed nails not so fast i was just going down to the flower garden to take the sun we'll go together dennis abandoned himself mr scogan put on his hat and they went out arm in arm on the shaven turf of the terrace henry wimbush and mary were playing a solemn game of bowls they descended by the yew tree walk it was here thought dennis here that anne had fallen here that he had kissed her here and he blushed with retrospective shame at the memory here that he had tried to carry her and failed life was awful sanity said mr scogan suddenly breaking a long silence sanity that's what's wrong with me and that's what will be wrong with you my dear dennis when you're old enough to be sane or insane in a sane world i should be a great man as things are in this curious establishment i am nothing at all to all intents and purposes i don't exist i am just vox et praeteria nihil dennis made no response he was thinking of other things after all he said to himself after all gambeau is better looking than i more entertaining more confident and besides he's already somebody and i'm still only potential everything that ever gets done in this world is done by madmen mr scogan went on dennis tried not to listen but the tireless insistence of mr scogan's discourse gradually compelled his attention men such as i am such as you may possibly become have never achieved anything we're too sane we're merely reasonable we lack the human touch the compelling enthusiastic mania people are quite ready to listen to the philosophers for a little amusement just as they would listen to a fiddler or a mountebank but as to acting on the advice of the men of reason never wherever the choice has had to be made between the man of reason and the madman the world has unhesitatingly followed the madman for the madman appeals to what is fundamental to passion and the instinct the philosophers to what is superficial and supererogatory reason they entered the garden at the head of one of the alleys stood a green wooden bench embayed in the midst of a fragrant continent of lavender bushes it was here though the place was shadeless and one breathed hot dry perfume instead of air it was here that mr scogan elected to sit he thrived on untempered sunlight consider for example the case of luther and erasmus he took out his pipe and began to fill it as he talked there was erasmus a man of reason if ever there was one people listened to him at first a new virtuoso performing on that elegant and resourceful instrument the intellect they even admired and venerated him but did he move them to behave as he wanted them to behave reasonably decently or at least a little less porkishly than usual he did not and then luther appears violent passionate a madman insanely convinced about matters in which there can be no conviction he shouted and men rushed to follow him erasmus was no longer listened to he was reviled for his reasonableness luther was serious luther was reality like the great war erasmus was only reason and decency he lacked the power being a sage to move men to action europe followed luther and embarked on a century and a half of war and bloody persecution it's a melancholy story mr scogan lighted a match in the intense light the flame was all but invisible the smell of burning tobacco began to mingle with the sweetly acrid smell of the lavender if you want to get men to act reasonably you must set about persuading them in a maniacal manner the very sane precepts of the founders of religions are only made infectious by means of enthusiasms which to a sane man must appear deplorable 
it is humiliating to find how impotent unadulterated sanity is sanity for example informs us that the only way in which we can preserve civilization is by behaving decently and intelligently sanity appeals and argues our rulers persevere in their customary porkishness while we acquiesce and obey the only hope is a maniacal crusade i am ready when it comes to beat a tambourine with the loudest but at the same time i shall feel a little ashamed of myself however mr scogan shrugged his shoulders and pipe in hand made a gesture of resignation it's futile to complain that things are as they are the fact remains that sanity unassisted is useless what we want then is a sane and reasonable exploitation of the forces of insanity we sane men will have the power yet mr scogan's eyes shone with a more than ordinary brightness and taking his pipe out of his mouth he gave vent to his loud dry and somehow rather fiendish laugh but i don't want power said dennis he was sitting in limp discomfort at one end of the bench shading his eyes from the intolerable light mr scogan bolt upright at the other end laughed again everybody wants power he said power in some form or other the sort of power you hanker for is literary power some people want power to persecute other human beings you expend your lust for power in persecuting words twisting them moulding them torturing them to obey you but i divigate do you asked dennis faintly yes mr scogan continued unheeding the time will come we men of intelligence will learn to harness the insanities to the service of reason we can't leave the world any longer to the direction of chance we can't allow dangerous maniacs like luther mad about dogma like napoleon mad about himself to go on casually appearing and turning everything upside down in the past it didn't so much matter but our modern machine is too delicate a few more knocks like the great war another luther or two and the whole concern will go to pieces in future the men of reason must see that the madness of the world's maniacs is canalized into proper channels is made to do useful work like a mountain torrent driving a dynamo making electricity to light a swiss hotel said dennis you ought to complete the simile mr scogan waved away the interruption there's only one thing to be done he said the men of intelligence must combine must conspire and seize power from the imbeciles and maniacs who now direct us they must found the rational state the heat that was slowly paralyzing all dennis's mental and bodily faculties seemed to bring to mr scogan additional vitality he talked with an ever-increasing energy his hands moved in sharp quick precise gestures his eyes shone hard dry and continuous his voice went on sounding and sounding in dennis's ears with the insistence of a mechanical noise in the rational state he heard mr scogan saying human beings will be separated out into distinct species not according to the colour of their eyes or the shape of their skulls but according to the qualities of their mind and temperament examining psychologists trained to what would now seem an almost superhuman clairvoyance will test each child that is born and assign it to its proper species duly labelled and docketed the child will be given the education suitable to members of its species and will be set in adult life to perform those functions which human beings of his variety are capable of performing how many species will there be asked dennis a great many no doubt mr scogan answered the classification will be subtle and elaborate but it is not in the power of a prophet to go into details nor is it his business i will do no more than indicate the three main species into which the subjects of the rational state will be divided he paused cleared his throat and coughed once or twice evoking in dennis's mind the vision of a table with a glass and water bottle and lying across one corner a long white pointer for the lantern pictures the three main species mr scogan went on will be these the directing intelligences the men of faith and the herd among the intelligences will be found all those capable of thought those who know how to attain a certain degree of freedom and alas how limited even among the most intelligent that freedom is from the mental bondage of their time 
a select body of intelligence drawn from among those who have turned their attention to the problems of practical life will be the governors of the rational state they will employ as their instruments of power the second great species of humanity the men of faith the madmen as i have been calling them who believe in things unreasonably with passion and are ready to die for their beliefs and their desires these wild men with their fearful potentialities for good or for mischief will no longer be allowed to react casually to a casual environment there will be no more caesar borgias no more luthers and mohammeds no more joanna southcotts no more comstocks the old-fashioned man of faith and desire that haphazard creature of brute circumstance who might drive men to tears and repentance or who might equally well set them on to cutting one another's throats will be replaced by a new sort of madman still externally the same still bubbling with a seemingly spontaneous enthusiasm but ah how very different from the madman of the past for the new man of faith will be expending his passion his desire and his enthusiasm in the propagation of some reasonable idea he will be all unawares the tool of some superior intelligence mr scogan chuckled maliciously it was as though he were taking a revenge in the name of reason on enthusiasts from their earliest years as soon that is as the examining psychologists have assigned them their place in the classified scheme the men of faith will have had their special education under the eye of the intelligences moulded by a long process of suggestion they will go out into the world preaching and practising with a generous mania the coldly reasonable projects of the directors from above when these projects are accomplished or when the ideas that were useful a decade ago have ceased to be useful the intelligences will inspire a new generation of madmen with a new eternal truth the principal function of the men of faith will be to move and direct the multitude that third great species consisting of those countless millions who lack intelligence and are without valuable enthusiasm when any particular effort is required of the herd when it is thought necessary for the sake of solidarity that humanity shall be kindled and united by some single enthusiastic desire or idea the men of faith primed with some simple and satisfying creed will be sent out on a mission of evangelization at ordinary times when the high spiritual temperature of a crusade would be unhealthy the men of faith will be quietly and earnestly busy with the great work of education in the upbringing of the herd humanity's almost boundless suggestibility will be scientifically exploited systematically from earliest infancy its members will be assured that there is no happiness to be found except in work and obedience they will be made to believe that they are happy that they are tremendously important beings and that everything they do is noble and significant for the lower species the earth will be restored to the centre of the universe and man to preeminence on the earth oh i envy the lot of the commonalty in the rational state working there eight hours a day obeying their betters convinced of their own grandeur and significance and immortality they will be marvellously happy happier than any race of men has ever been they will go through life in a rosy state of intoxication from which they will never awake the men of faith will play the cup-bearers at this lifelong bacchanal filling and ever filling again with the warm liquor that the intelligences in sad and sober privacy behind the scenes will brew for the intoxication of their subjects and what will be my place in the rational state dennis drowsily inquired from under his shading hand mr scogan looked at him for a moment in silence it's difficult to see where you would fit in he said at last you couldn't do manual work you're too independent and unsuggestible to belong to the larger herd you have none of the characteristics required in a man of faith as for the directing intelligences they will have to be marvellously clear and merciless and penetrating he paused and shook his head no i can see no place for you only the lethal chamber deeply hurt dennis emitted the imitation of a loud homeric laugh i'm getting sunstroke here he said and got up mr scogan followed his example and they walked slowly away down the narrow path brushing the blue lavender flowers in their passage dennis pulled a sprig of lavender and sniffed at it 
then some dark leaves of rosemary that smelt like incense in a cavernous church they passed a bed of opium poppies dispetalled now the round ripe seed heads were brown and dry like polynesian trophies dennis thought severed heads stuck on poles he liked the fancy enough to impart it to mr scogan like polynesian trophies uttered aloud the fancy seemed less charming and significant than it did when it first occurred to him there was a silence and in a growing wave of sound the whirr of the reaping machines swelled up from the fields beyond the garden and then receded into a remoter hum it is satisfactory to think said mr scogan as they strolled slowly onward that a multitude of people are toiling in the harvest fields in order that we may talk of polynesia like every other good thing in this world leisure and culture have to be paid for fortunately however it is not the leisured and the cultured who have to pay let us be duly thankful for that my dear dennis duly thankful he repeated and knocked the ashes out of his pipe dennis was not listening he had suddenly remembered anne she was with gambeau alone with him in his studio it was an intolerable thought shall we go and pay a call on gambeau he asked carelessly it would be amusing to see what he's doing now he laughed inwardly to think how furious gambeau would be when he saw them arriving End of chapter twenty two recording by expatria in bangor maine chapter twenty three of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty three gambeau was by no means so furious at their apparition as dennis had hoped and expected he would be indeed he was rather pleased than annoyed when the two faces one brown and pointed the other round and pale appeared in the frame of the open door the energy born of his restless irritation was dying within him returning to its emotional element a moment more and he would have been losing his temper again and anne would be keeping hers infuriatingly yes he was positively glad to see them come in come in he called out hospitably followed by mr scogan dennis climbed the little ladder and stepped over the threshold he looked suspiciously from gambeau to his sitter and could learn nothing from the expression of their faces except that they both seemed pleased to see the visitors were they really glad or were they cunningly simulating gladness he wondered mr scogan meanwhile was looking at the portrait excellent he said approvingly excellent almost too true to character if that is possible yes positively too true but i'm surprised to find you putting in all this psychology business he pointed to the face and with his extended finger followed the slack curves of the painted figure i thought you were one of the fellows who went in exclusively for balanced masses and impinging planes gambeau laughed this is a little infidelity he said i'm sorry said mr scogan i for one without ever having had the slightest appreciation of painting have always taken particular pleasure in cubismus i like to see pictures from which nature has been completely banished pictures which are exclusively the product of the human mind they give me the same pleasure as i derive from a good piece of reasoning or a mathematical problem or an achievement of engineering nature or anything that reminds me of nature disturbs me it is too large too complicated above all too utterly pointless and incomprehensible i am at home with the works of man if i choose to set my mind to it i can understand anything that any man has made or thought that is why i always travel by tube never by bus if i can possibly help it for travelling by bus one can't avoid seeing even in london a few stray works of god the sky for example an occasional tree the flowers in the window boxes but travel by tube and you see nothing but the works of man iron riveted into geometrical forms straight lines of concrete patterned expanses of tiles all is human and the product of friendly and comprehensible minds all philosophies and all religions what are they but spiritual tubes bored through the universe through these narrow tunnels where all is recognizably human one travels comfortable and secure contriving to forget that all round and below and above them stretches the blind mass of earth endless and unexplored 
yes give me the tube and cubismus every time give me ideas so snug and neat and simple and well made and preserve me from nature preserve me from all that's inhumanly large and complicated and obscure i haven't the courage and above all i haven't the time to start wandering in that labyrinth while mr scogan was discoursing dennis had crossed over to the farther side of the little square chamber where anne was sitting still in her graceful lazy pose on the low chair well he demanded looking at her almost fiercely what was he asking of her he hardly knew himself anne looked up at him and for answer echoed his well in another a laughing key dennis had nothing more at the moment to say two or three canvases stood in the corner behind anne's chair their faces turned to the wall he pulled them out and began to look at the paintings may i see too anne requested he stood them in a row against the wall anne had to turn round in her chair to look at them there was the big canvas of the man fallen from the horse there was a painting of flowers there was a small landscape his hands on the back of the chair dennis leaned over her from behind the easel at the other side of the room mr scogan was talking away for a long time they looked at the pictures saying nothing or rather anne looked at the pictures while dennis for the most part looked at anne i like the man in the horse don't you she said at last looking up with an inquiring smile dennis nodded and then in a queer strangled voice as though it had cost him a great effort to utter the words he said i love you it was a remark which anne had heard a good many times before and mostly heard with equanimity but on this occasion perhaps because they had come so unexpectedly perhaps for some other reason the words provoked in her a certain surprised commotion my poor dennis she managed to say with a laugh but she was blushing as she spoke end of chapter twenty three recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapter Twenty Four of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Twenty Four. It was noon. Dennis, descending from his chamber, where he had been making an unsuccessful effort to write something about nothing in particular, found the drawing room deserted. He was about to go out into the garden when his eye fell on a familiar but mysterious object the large red notebook in which he had so often seen jenny quietly and busily scribbling she had left it lying on the window-seat the temptation was great he picked up the book and slipped off the elastic band that kept it discreetly closed private not to be opened was written in capital letters on the cover he raised his eyebrows it was the sort of thing one wrote in one's latin grammar while one was still at one's preparatory school black is the raven black is the rook but blacker the thief who steals this book it was curiously childish he thought and he smiled to himself he opened the book what he saw made him wince as though he had been struck dennis was his own severest critic so at least he had always believed he liked to think of himself as a merciless vivisector probing into the palpitating entrails of his own soul he was brown dog to himself his weaknesses his absurdities no one knew them better than he did indeed in a vague way he imagined that nobody beside himself was aware of them at all it seemed somehow inconceivable that he should appear to other people as they appeared to him inconceivable that they ever spoke of him among themselves in that same freely critical and to be quite honest mildly malicious tone in which he was accustomed to talk of them in his own eyes he had defects but to see them was a privilege reserved to him alone for the rest of the world he was surely an image of flawless crystal it was almost axiomatic on opening the red notebook that crystal image of himself crashed to the ground and was irreparably shattered he was not his own severest critic after all the discovery was a painful one the fruit of jenny's unobtrusive scribbling lay before him a caricature of himself reading the book was upside down in the background a dancing couple recognizable as gombo and anne beneath the legend fable of the wallflower and the sour grapes fascinated and horrified dennis pored over the drawing 
it was masterful a mute inglorious rouvert appeared in every one of those cruelly clear lines the expression of the face an assumed aloofness and superiority tempered by a feeble envy the attitude of the body and limbs an attitude of studious and scholarly dignity given away by the fidgety pose of the turned-in feet these things were terrible and more terrible still was the likeness was the magisterial certainty with which his physical peculiarities were all recorded and subtly exaggerated dennis looked deeper into the book there were caricatures of other people of priscilla and mr barbecue smith of henry wimbush of anne and gambo of mr scogan whom jenny had represented in a light that was more than slightly sinister that was indeed diabolic of mary and ivor he scarcely glanced at them a fearful desire to know the worst about himself possessed him he turned over the leaves lingering at nothing that was not his own image seven full pages were devoted to him private not to be opened he had disobeyed the injunction he had only got what he deserved thoughtfully he closed the book and slid the rubber band once more into its place sadder and wiser he went out onto the terrace and so this he reflected this was how jenny employed the leisure hours in her ivory tower apart and he had thought her a simple-minded uncritical creature it was he it seemed who was the fool he felt no resentment towards jenny no the distressing thing wasn't jenny herself it was what she and the phenomenon of her red book represented what they stood for and concretely symbolized they represented all the vast conscious world of men outside himself they symbolized something that in his studious solitariness he was apt not to believe in he could stand at piccadilly circus could watch the crowds shuffle past and still imagine himself the one fully conscious intelligent individual being among all those thousands it seemed somehow impossible that other people should be in their way as elaborate and complete as he in his impossible and yet periodically he would make some painful discovery about the external world and the horrible reality of its consciousness and its intelligence the red notebook was one of these discoveries a footprint in the sand it put beyond a doubt the fact that the outer world really existed sitting on the balustrade of the terrace he ruminated this unpleasant truth for some time still chewing on it he strolled pensively down towards the swimming pool a peacock and his hen trailed their shabby finery across the turf of the lower lawn odious birds their necks thick and greedily fleshy at the roots tapered up to the cruel inanity of their brainless heads their flat eyes and piercing beaks the fabulists were right he reflected when they took beasts to illustrate their tractates of human morality animals resemble men with all the truthfulness of a caricature oh the red notebook he threw a piece of stick at the slowly pacing birds they rushed towards it thinking it was something to eat he walked on the profound shade of a giant ilex tree engulfed him like a great wooden octopus it spread its long arms abroad under the spreading ilex tree he tried to remember who the poem was by but couldn't the smith a brawny man is he with arms like rubber bands just like his he would have to try and do his muller exercises more regularly he emerged once more into the sunshine the pool lay before him reflecting in its bronze mirror the blue and various green of the summer day looking at it he thought of anne's bare arms and seal sleek bathing dress her moving knees and feet and little loose with the white legs and bouncing barbary oh these rags and tags of other people's making would he ever be able to call his brain his own was there indeed anything in it that was truly his own or was it simply an education he walked slowly round the water's edge in an embayed recess among the surrounding yew trees leaning her back against the pedestal of a pleasantly comic version of the medici venus executed by some nameless mason of the seicento he saw mary pensively sitting hello he said for he was passing so close to her that he had to say something mary looked up hello she answered in a melancholy uninterested tone in this alcove hewed out of the dark trees the atmosphere seemed to dennis agreeably elegiac 
he sat down beside her under the shadow of the pudic goddess there was a prolonged silence at breakfast that morning mary had found on her plate a picture postcard of gobbly great park a stately georgian pile with a facade sixteen windows wide parterres in the foreground huge smooth lawns receding out of the picture to right and left ten years more of the hard times and gobbly with all its peers will be deserted and decaying fifty years and the countryside will know the old landmarks no more they will have vanished as the monasteries vanished before them at the moment however mary's mind was not moved by these considerations on the back of the postcard next to the address was written in ivor's bold large hand a single quatrain hail maid of moonlight bride of the sun farewell like bright plumes molted in an angel's flight there sleep within my heart's most mystic cell memories of morning memories of the night there followed a postscript of three lines would you mind asking one of the housemaids to forward the packet of safety razor blades i left in the drawer of my washstand thanks ivor seated under the venus's immemorial gesture mary considered life and love the abolition of her repressions so far from bringing the expected peace of mind had brought nothing but disquiet a new and hitherto unexperienced misery ivor ivor she couldn't do without him now it was evident on the other hand from the poem on the back of the picture postcard that ivor could very well do without her he was at gobley now so was zenobia mary knew zenobia she thought of the last verse of the song he had sung that night in the garden mary shed tears at the memory she had never been so unhappy in all her life before it was dennis who first broke the silence the individual he began in a soft and sadly philosophical tone is not a self-supporting universe there are times when he comes into contact with other individuals when he is forced to take cognizance of the existence of other universes beside himself he had contrived this highly abstract generalization as a preliminary to a personal confidence it was the first gambit in a conversation that was to lead up to jenny's caricatures true said mary and generalizing for herself she added when one individual comes into intimate contact with another she or he of course as the case may be must almost inevitably receive or inflict suffering one is apt dennis went on to be so spellbound by the spectacle of one's own personality that one forgets that the spectacle presents itself to others as well as to oneself mary was not listening the difficulty she said makes itself acutely felt in matters of sex if one individual seeks intimate contact with another individual in the natural way she is certain to receive or inflict suffering if on the other hand she avoids contacts she risks the equally grave sufferings that follow on unnatural repressions as you see it's a dilemma when i think of my own case said dennis making a more decided move in the desired direction i am amazed how ignorant i am of other people's mentality in general and above all and in particular of their opinions about myself our minds are sealed books only occasionally open to the outside world he made a gesture that was faintly suggestive of the drawing off of a rubber band it's an awful problem said mary thoughtfully one has to have had personal experience to realize quite how awful it is exactly dennis nodded one has to have had first-hand experience he leaned towards her and slightly lowered his voice this very morning for example he began but his confidences were cut short the deep voice of the gong tempered by distance to a pleasant booming floated down from the house it was lunch-time mechanically mary rose to her feet and dennis a little hurt that she should exhibit such a desperate anxiety for her food and so slight an interest in his spiritual experiences followed her they made their way up to the house without speaking end of chapter twenty four recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty five of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty five i hope you all realize said henry wimbush during dinner that next monday is bank holiday 
and that you will all be expected to help in the fair heavens cried anne the fair i had forgotten all about it what a nightmare couldn't you put a stop to it uncle henry mr wimbush sighed and shook his head alas he said i fear i cannot i should have liked to put an end to it years ago but the claims of charity are strong it's not charity we want anne murmured rebelliously it's justice besides mr wimbush went on the fair has become an institution let me see it must be twenty-two years since we started it it was a modest affair then now he made a sweeping movement with his hand and was silent it spoke highly for mr wimbush's public spirit that he still continued to tolerate the fair beginning as a sort of glorified church bazaar crome's yearly charity fair had grown into a noisy thing of merry-go-rounds coconut shies and miscellaneous side-shows a real genuine fair on the grand scale it was the local st bartholomew and the people of all the neighbouring villages with even a contingent from the county town flocked into the park for their bank holiday amusement the local hospital profited handsomely and it was this fact alone which prevented mr wimbush to whom the fair was a cause of recurrent and never diminishing agony from putting a stop to the nuisance which yearly desecrated his park and garden i've made all the arrangements already henry wimbush went on some of the larger marquees will be put up to-morrow the swings and the merry-go-round arrive on sunday so there's no escape said anne turning to the rest of the party you'll all have to do something as a special favour you're allowed to choose your slavery my job is the tea-tent as usual on priscilla my dear said mrs wimbush interrupting her i have more important things to think about than the fair but you need have no doubt that i shall do my best when monday comes to encourage the villagers that's splendid said anne aunt priscilla will encourage the villagers what will you do mary i won't do anything where i have to stand by and watch other people eat then you'll look after the children's sports all right mary agreed i'll look after the children's sports and mr scogan mr scogan reflected may i be allowed to tell fortunes he asked at last i think i should be good at telling fortunes but you can't tell fortunes in that costume can't i mr scogan surveyed himself you'll have to be dressed up do you still persist i'm ready to suffer all indignities good said anne and turning to gambeau you must be our lightning artist she said your portrait for a shilling in five minutes it's a pity i'm not ivor said gambeau with a laugh i could throw in a picture of their auras for an extra sixpence mary flushed nothing is to be gained she said severely by speaking with levity of serious objects and after all whatever your personal views may be psychical research is a perfectly serious subject and what about dennis dennis made a deprecating gesture i have no accomplishments he said i'll just be one of those men who wear a thing in their buttonholes and go about telling people which is the way to tea and not to walk on the grass no no said anne that won't do you must do something more than that but what all the good jobs are taken and i can do nothing but lisp in numbers well then you must lisp concluded anne you must write a poem for the occasion an ode on bank holiday we'll print it at uncle henry's press and sell it at two pence a copy sixpence dennis protested it'll be worth sixpence anne shook her head two pence she repeated firmly nobody will pay more than two pence and now there's jenny said mr wimbush jenny he said raising his voice what will you do dennis thought of suggesting that she might draw caricatures at sixpence in execution but decided it would be wiser to go on feigning ignorance of her talent his mind reverted to the red notebook could it really be true that he looked like that what will i do jenny echoed what will i do she frowned thoughtfully for a moment then her face brightened and she smiled when i was young she said i learnt to play the drums the drums jenny nodded and in proof of her assertion agitated her knife and fork like a pair of drumsticks over her plate if there's any opportunity of playing the drums she began but of course said anne there's any amount of opportunity we'll put you down definitely for the drums that's the lot she added and a very good lot too said gombo i look forward to my bank holiday it ought to be gay it ought indeed mr scogan assented but you may rest assured that it won't be 
no holiday is ever anything but a disappointment come come protested gambeau my holiday at crome isn't being a disappointment isn't it anne turned an ingenuous mask towards him no it isn't he answered i'm delighted to hear it it's in the very nature of things mr scogan went on our holidays can't help being disappointments reflect for a moment what is a holiday the ideal the platonic holiday of holidays is surely a complete and absolute change you agree with me in my definition mr scogan glanced from face to face round the table his sharp nose moved in a series of rapid jerks through all the points of the compass there was no sign of dissent he continued a complete and absolute change very well but isn't a complete and absolute change precisely the thing we can never have never in the very nature of things mr scogan once more looked rapidly about him of course it is as ourselves as specimens of homo sapiens as members of a society how can we hope to have anything like an absolute change we are tied down by the frightful limitation of our human faculties by the notions which society imposes on us through our fatal suggestibility by our own personalities for us a complete holiday is out of the question some of us struggle manfully to take one but we never succeed if i may be allowed to express myself metaphorically we never succeed in getting farther than south end you're depressing said anne i mean to be mr scogan replied and expanding the fingers of his right hand he went on look at me for example what sort of a holiday can i take in endowing me with passions and faculties nature has been horribly niggardly the full range of human potentialities is in any case distressingly limited my range is a limitation within a limitation out of the ten octaves that make up the human instrument i can compass perhaps two thus while i may have a certain amount of intelligence i have no aesthetic sense while i possess the mathematical faculty i am wholly without the religious emotions while i am naturally addicted to venery i have little ambition and am not at all avaricious education has further limited my scope having been brought up in society i am impregnated with its laws not only should i be afraid of taking a holiday from them i should also feel it painful to try to do so in a word i have a conscience as well as a fear of jail yes i know it by experience how often have i tried to take holidays to get away from myself my own boring nature my insufferable mental surroundings mr scogan sighed but always without success he added always without success in my youth i was always striving how hard to feel religiously and aesthetically here said i to myself are two tremendously important and exciting emotions life would be richer warmer brighter altogether more amusing if i could feel them i try to feel them i read the works of the mystics they seem to me nothing but the most deplorable claptrap as indeed they always must to any one who does not feel the same emotion as the authors felt when they were writing for it is the emotion that matters the written work is simply an attempt to express emotion which is in itself inexpressible in terms of intellect and logic the mystic objectifies a rich feeling in the pit of the stomach into a cosmology for other mystics that cosmology is a symbol of the rich feeling for the unreligious it is a symbol of nothing and so appears merely grotesque a melancholy fact but i divigate mr scogan checked himself so much for the religious emotion as for the aesthetic i was at even greater pains to cultivate that i have looked at all the right works of art in every part of europe there was a time when i venture to believe i knew more about tadeo da pagibonsi more about the cryptic amico di tadeo even than henry does to-day i am happy to say i have forgotten most of the knowledge i then so laboriously acquired but without vanity i can assert that it was prodigious i don't pretend of course to know anything about nigger sculpture or the later seventeenth century in italy but about all the periods that were fashionable before nineteen hundred i am or was omniscient yes i repeat it omniscient but did that fact make me any more appreciative of art in general it did not confronted by a picture of which i could tell you all the known and presumed history the date when it was painted the character of the painter the influences that had gone to make it what it was 
i felt none of that strange excitement and exaltation which is as i am informed by those who do feel it the true aesthetic emotion i felt nothing but a certain interest in the subject of the picture or more often when the subject was hackneyed and religious i felt nothing but a great weariness of spirit nevertheless i must have gone on looking at pictures for ten years before i would honestly admit to myself that they merely bored me since then i have given up all attempts to take a holiday i go on cultivating my old stale daily self in the resigned spirit with which a bank clerk performs from ten till six his daily task a holiday indeed i am sorry for you gombo if you still look forward to having a holiday gombo shrugged his shoulders perhaps he said my standards aren't as elevated as yours but personally i found the war quite as thorough a holiday from all the ordinary decencies and sanities all the common emotions and preoccupations as i ever want to have yes mr scogan thoughtfully agreed yes the war was certainly something of a holiday it was a step beyond south end it was weston super mer it was almost ilfracombe End of chapter 25 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 26 of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 26 A little canvas village of tents and booths had sprung up, just beyond the boundaries of the garden in the green expanse of the park a crowd thronged its streets the men dressed mostly in black holiday best funeral best the women in pale muslins here and there tricolour bunting hung inert in the midst of the canvas town scarlet and gold and crystal the merry-go-round glittered in the sun the balloon man walked among the crowd and above his head like a huge inverted bunch of many-coloured grapes the balloon strained upwards with a scythe-like motion the boat swings reaped the air and from the funnel of the engine which worked the roundabout rose a thin scarcely wavering column of black smoke dennis had climbed to the top of one of sir ferdinando's towers and there standing on the sun-baked leads his elbows resting on the parapet he surveyed the scene the steam organ sent up prodigious music the clashing of automatic cymbals beat out with inexorable precision the rhythm of piercingly sounded melodies the harmonies were like a musical shattering of glass and brass far down in the bass the last trump was hugely blowing and with such persistence such resonance that its alternate tonic and dominant detached themselves from the rest of the music and made a tune of their own a loud monotonous seesaw dennis leaned over the gulf of swirling noise if he threw himself over the parapet the noise would surely buoy him up keep him suspended bobbing as a fountain balances a ball on its breaking crest another fancy came to him this time in metrical form my soul is a thin white sheet of parchment stretched over a bubbling cauldron bad bad but he liked the idea of something thin and distended being blown up from underneath my soul is a thin tent of gut or better my soul is a pale tenuous membrane that was pleasing a thin tenuous membrane it had the right anatomical quality tight blown quivering in the blast of noisy life it was time for him to descend from the serene empyrean of words into the actual vortex he went down slowly my soul is a thin tenuous membrane on the terrace stood a knot of distinguished visitors there was old lord molen like a caricature of an english my lord in a french comic paper a long man with a long nose and long drooping moustaches and long teeth of old ivory and lower down absurdly a short covert coat and below that long long legs cased in pearl-grey trousers legs that bent unsteadily at the knee and gave a kind of sideways wobble as he walked beside him short and thick-set stood mr calamay the venerable conservative statesman with a face like a roman bust and short white hair young men didn't much like going for motor drives alone with mr calamay 
and of old lord molen one wondered why he wasn't living in gilded exile on the island of capri among the other distinguished persons who for one reason or another find it impossible to live in england they were talking to anne laughing the one profoundly the other hootingly a black silk balloon towing a black and white striped parachute proved to be old mrs budge from the big house on the other side of the valley she stood low on the ground and the spikes of her black and white sunshade menaced the eyes of priscilla wimbush who towered over her a massive figure dressed in purple and topped with a queenly toque on which the nodding black plumes recalled the splendours of a first-class parisian funeral dennis peeped at them discreetly from the window of the morning-room his eyes were suddenly become innocent childlike unprejudiced they seemed these people inconceivably fantastic and yet they really existed they functioned by themselves they were conscious they had minds moreover he was like them could one believe it but the evidence of the red notebook was conclusive it would have been polite to go and say how do you do but at the moment dennis did not want to talk could not have talked his soul was a tenuous tremulous pale membrane he would keep its sensibility intact and virgin as long as he could cautiously he crept out by a side door and made his way down towards the park his soul fluttered as he approached the noise and movement of the fair he paused for a moment on the brink then stepped in and was engulfed hundreds of people each with his own private face and all of them real separate alive the thought was disquieting he paid two pence and saw the tattooed woman two pence more the largest rat in the world from the home of the rat he emerged just in time to see a hydrogen-filled balloon break loose for home a child howled up after it but calmly a perfect sphere of flushed opal it mounted mounted dennis followed it with his eyes until it became lost in the blinding sunlight if he could but send his soul to follow it he sighed stuck his steward's rosette in his buttonhole and started to push his way aimlessly but officially through the crowd end of chapter twenty six recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty seven of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty seven mr scogan had been accommodated in a little canvas hut dressed in a black skirt and a red bodice with a yellow and red bandana handkerchief tied round his black wig he looked sharp nosed browned and wrinkled like the bohemian hag of frith's darby day a placard pinned to the curtain of the doorway announced the presence within the tent of sesistress the sorceress of ecbatana seated at a table mr scogan received his clients in mysterious silence indicating with a movement of the finger that they were to sit down opposite him and to extend their hands for his inspection he then examined the poem that was presented him using a magnifying glass and a pair of horn spectacles he had a terrifying way of shaking his head frowning and clicking with his tongue as he looked at the lines sometimes he would whisper as though to himself terrible terrible or god preserve us sketching out the sign of the cross as he uttered the words the clients who came in laughing grew suddenly grave they began to take the witch seriously she was a formidable-looking woman could it be was it possible that there was something in this sort of thing after all after all they thought as the hag shook her head over their hands after all and they waited with an uncomfortably beating heart for the oracle to speak after a long and silent inspection mr scogan would suddenly look up and ask in a hoarse whisper some horrifying question such as have you ever been hit on the head with a hammer by a young man with red hair when the answer was in the negative which it could hardly fail to be mr scogan would nod several times saying i was afraid so everything is still to come still to come though it can't be very far off now sometimes after a long examination he would just whisper where ignorance is bliss tis folly to be wise and refuse to divulge any details of a future too appalling to be envisaged without despair sesistress had a success of horror 
people stood in a queue outside the witch's booth waiting for the privilege of hearing sentence pronounced upon them dennis in the course of his round looked with curiosity at this crowd of suppliants before the shrine of the oracle he had a great desire to see how mr scogan played his part the canvas booth was a rickety ill-made structure between its walls and its sagging roof were long gaping chinks and crannies dennis went to the tea-tent and borrowed a wooden bench and a small union jack with these he hurried back to the booth of sesostris setting down the bench at the back of the booth he climbed up and with a great air of busy efficiency began to tie the union jack to the top of one of the tent poles through the crannies in the canvas he could see almost the whole of the interior of the tent mr scogan's bandana covered head was just below him his terrifying whispers came clearly up dennis looked and listened while the witch prophesied financial losses death by apoplexy destruction by air raids in the next war is there going to be another war asked the old lady to whom he had predicted this end very soon said mr scogan with an air of quiet confidence the old lady was succeeded by a girl dressed in white muslin garnished with pink ribbons she was wearing a broad hat so that dennis could not see her face but from her figure and the roundness of her bare arms he judged her young and pleasing mr scogan looked at her hand then whispered you are still virtuous the young lady giggled and exclaimed oh lord but you will not remain so for long added mr scogan sepulchrally the young lady giggled again destiny which interests itself in small things no less than in great has announced the fact upon your hand mr scogan took up the magnifying glass and began once more to examine the white palm very interesting he said as though to himself very interesting it's as clear as day he was silent what's clear asked the girl i don't think i ought to tell you mr scogan shook his head the pendulous brass earrings which he had screwed on to his ears tinkled please please she implored the witch seemed to ignore her remark afterwards it's not at all clear the fates don't say whether you will settle down to married life and have four children or whether you will try to go on the cinema and have none they are only specific about this one rather crucial incident what is it what is it oh do tell me the white muslin figure leant eagerly forward mr scogan sighed very well he said if you must know you must know but if anything untoward happens you must blame your own curiosity listen listen he lifted up a sharp claw-nailed forefinger this is what the fates have written next sunday afternoon at six o'clock you will be sitting on the second stile on the footpath that leads from the church to the lower road at that moment a man will appear walking along the footpath mr scogan looked at her hand again as though to refresh his memory of the details of the scene a man he repeated a small man with a sharp nose not exactly good-looking nor precisely young but fascinating he lingered hissingly over the word he will ask you can you tell me the way to paradise and you will answer yes i'll show you and walk with him down towards the little hazel copse i cannot read what will happen after that there was a silence is it really true asked white muslin the witch gave a shrug of the shoulders i merely tell you what i read in your hand good afternoon that will be six pence yes i have changed thank you good afternoon dennis stepped down from the bench tied insecurely and crookedly to the tent pole the union jack hung limp on the windless air if only i could do things like that he thought as he carried the bench back to the tea tent anne was sitting behind a long table filling thick white cups from an urn a neat pile of printed sheets lay before her on the table dennis took one of them and looked at it affectionately it was his poem they had printed five hundred copies and very nice the quarto broadsheets looked have you sold many he asked in a casual tone anne put her head on one side deprecatingly only three so far i am afraid but i am giving a free copy to every one who spends more than a shilling on his tea so in any case it's having a circulation dennis made no reply but walked slowly away he looked at the broadsheet in his hand and read the lines to himself relishingly as he walked along 
this day of roundabouts and swings struck weights shied coconuts tossed rings switchbacks aunt sally's and all such small hijinks you call it fairy all a holiday but paper noses sniffed the artificial roses of round venetian cheeks through half each carnival year and masks might laugh at things the naked face for shame would blush at laugh and think no blame a holiday but galba showed elephants on an airy road jumbo trod the tight-rope then and in the circus armed men stabbed home for sport and died to break those dull imperatives that make a prison of every working day where all must drudge and all obey sing holiday you do not know how to be free the russian snow flowered with bright blood whose roses spread petals of fading fading red that died into the snow again into the virgin snow and men from all the ancient bonds were freed old law old custom and old creed old right and wrong there bled to death the frozen air received their breath a little smoke that died away and round about them where they lay the snow bloomed roses blood was there a red gay flower and only fair sing holiday beneath the tree of innocence and liberty paper nose and red cockade dance within the magic shade that makes them drunken merry and strong to laugh and sing their ferial song free free but echo answers faintly to the laughing dancers free and faintly laughs and still within the hollows of the hill faintlier laughs and whispers free fadingly diminishingly free and laughter faints away sing holiday sing holiday he folded the sheet carefully and put it in his pocket the thing had its merits oh decidedly decidedly but how unpleasant the crowd smelt he lit a cigarette the smell of cows was preferable he passed through the gate in the park wall into the garden the swimming pool was a centre of noise and activity second heat in the young ladies championship it was a polite voice of henry wimbush a crowd of sleek seal-like figures in black bathing dresses surrounded him his grey bowler hat smooth round and motionless in the midst of a moving sea was an island of aristocratic calm holding his tortoise-shell rimmed pince-nez an inch or two in front of his eyes he read out names from a list miss dolly miles miss rebecca ballister miss doris gable five young persons ranged themselves on the brink from their seats of honour at the other end of the pool old lord molen and mr calamay looked on with eager interest henry wimbush raised his hand there was an expectant silence when i say go 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 he said there was an almost simultaneous splash dennis pushed his way through the spectators somebody plucked him by the sleeve he looked down it was old mrs budge delighted to see you again mr stone she said in her rich husky voice she panted a little as she spoke like a short-winded lapdog it was mrs budge who having read in the daily mirror that the government needed peach stones what they needed them for she never knew had made the collection of peach stones her peculiar bit of war work she had thirty-six peach trees in her walled garden as well as four hot-houses in which trees could be forced so that she was able to eat peaches practically the whole year round in nineteen sixteen she ate forty two hundred peaches and sent the stones to the government in nineteen seventeen the military authorities called up three of her gardeners and what with this and the fact that it was a bad year for wall fruit she only managed to eat twenty nine hundred peaches during that crucial period of the national destinies in nineteen eighteen she did rather better for between january first and the date of the armistice she ate thirty three hundred peaches since the armistice she had relaxed her efforts now she did not eat more than two or three peaches a day her constitution she complained had suffered but it had suffered for a good cause dennis answered her greeting by a vague and polite noise so nice to see the young people enjoying themselves mrs budge went on and the old people too for that matter look at old lord molen and dear mr calamay isn't it delightful to see the way they enjoy themselves dennis looked he wasn't sure whether it was so very delightful after all why didn't they go and watch the sack races the two old gentlemen were engaged at the moment in congratulating the winner of the race it seemed an act of supererogatory graciousness for after all she had only won a heat 
pretty little thing isn't she said mrs budge huskily and panted two or three times yes dennis nodded agreement sixteen slender but nubile he said to himself and laid up the phrase in his memory as a happy one old mr calamay had got on his spectacles to congratulate the victor and lord molen leaning forward over his walking-stick showed his long ivory teeth hungrily smiling capital performance capital mr calamay was saying in his deep voice the victor wriggled with embarrassment she stood with her hands behind her back rubbing one foot nervously on the other her wet bathing dress shone a torso of black polished marble very good indeed said lord molen his voice seemed to come from just behind his teeth a toothy voice it was as though a dog should suddenly begin to speak he smiled again mr calamay readjusted his spectacles when i say go 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 splash the third heat had started do you know i never could learn to swim said mrs budge really but i used to be able to float dennis imagined her floating up and down up and down on a great green swell a blown black bladder no that wasn't good that wasn't good at all a new winner was being congratulated she was atrociously stubby and fat the last one long and harmoniously continuously curved from knee to breast had been an eve by cronach but this this one was a bad rubens go 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 henry wimbush's polite level voice once more pronounced the formula another batch of young ladies dived in grown a little weary of sustaining a conversation with mrs budge dennis conveniently remembered that his duties as a steward called him elsewhere he pushed out through the lines of spectators and made his way along the path left clear behind them he was thinking again that his soul was a pale tenuous membrane when he was startled by hearing a thin sibilant voice speaking apparently from just above his head pronounce the single word disgusting he looked up sharply the path along which he was walking passed under the lee of a wall of clipped yew behind the hedge the ground sloped steeply up towards the foot of the terrace and the house for one standing on the higher ground it was easy to look over the dark barrier looking up dennis saw two heads overtopping the hedge immediately above him he recognized the iron mask of mr bodiham and the pale colourless face of his wife they were looking over his head over the heads of the spectators at the swimmers in the pond disgusting mrs bodiham repeated hissing softly the rector turned up his iron mask towards the solid cobalt of the sky how long he said as though to himself how long he lowered his eyes again and they fell on dennis's upturned curious face there was an abrupt movement and mr and mrs bodiham popped out of sight behind the hedge dennis continued his promenade he wandered past the merry-go-round through the thronged streets of the canvas village the membrane of his soul flapped tumultuously in the noise and laughter in a roped-off space beyond mary was directing the children's sports little creatures seethed round about her making a shrill tinny clamour others clustered about the skirts and trousers of their parents mary's face was shining in the heat with an immense output of energy she started a three-legged race dennis looked on in admiration you're wonderful he said coming up behind her and touching her on the arm i've never seen such energy she turned towards him a face round red and honest as the setting sun the golden bell of her hair swung silently as she moved her head and quivered to rest do you know dennis she said in a low serious voice gasping a little as she spoke do you know that there is a woman here who has had three children in thirty-one months really said dennis making rapid mental calculations it's appalling i've been telling her about the malthusian league one really ought but a sudden violent renewal of the metallic yelling announced the fact that somebody had won the race mary became once more the centre of a dangerous vortex it was time dennis thought to move on he might be asked to do something if he stayed too long he turned back towards the canvas village the thought of tea was making itself insistent in his mind tea 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 but the tea tent was horribly thronged anne with an unusual expression of grimness on her flushed face was furiously working the handle of the urn 
the brown liquid spurted incessantly into the proffered cups portentous in the farther corner of the tent priscilla in her royal toque was encouraging the villagers in a momentary lull dennis could hear her deep jovial laughter and her manly voice clearly he told himself this was no place for one who wanted tea he stood irresolute at the entrance to the tent a beautiful thought suddenly came to him if he went back to the house went unobtrusively without being observed if he tiptoed into the dining-room and noiselessly opened the little doors of the sideboard ah then in the cool recess within he would find bottles and a siphon a bottle of crystal gin and a quart of soda-water and then for the cups that inebriate as well as cheer a minute later he was walking briskly up the shady yew-tree walk within the house it was deliciously quiet and cool carrying his well-filled tumbler with care he went into the library there the glass on the corner of the table beside him he settled into a chair with a volume of saint beuve there was nothing he found like a causerie du lundi for settling and soothing the troubled spirits that tenuous membrane of his had been too rudely buffeted by the afternoon's emotions it required a rest end of chapter twenty seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty eight of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty eight towards sunset the fair itself became quiescent it was the hour for the dancing to begin at one side of the village of tents the space had been roped off acetylene lamps hung round it on posts cast a piercing white light in one corner sat the band and obedient to its scraping and blowing two or three hundred dancers trampled across the dry ground wearing away the grass with their booted feet round this patch of all but daylight alive with motion and noise the night seemed preternaturally dark bars of light reached out into it and every now and then a lonely figure or a couple of lovers interlaced would cross the bright shaft flashing for a moment into visible existence to disappear again as quickly and surprisingly as they had come dennis stood by the entrance of the enclosure watching the swaying shuffling crowd the slow vortex brought the couples round and round again before him as though he were passing them in review there was priscilla still wearing her queenly toque still encouraging the villagers this time by dancing with one of the tenant farmers there was lord Molen, who had stayed on to the disorganized passoverish meal that took the place of dinner on this festal day he one stepped shamblingly his bent knees more precariously wobbly than ever with a terrified village beauty mr scogan trotted round with another mary was in the embrace of a young farmer of heroic proportions she was looking up at him talking as dennis could see very seriously what about he wondered the malthusian league perhaps seated in the corner among the band jenny was performing wonders of virtuosity upon the drums her eyes shone she smiled to herself a whole subterranean life seemed to be expressing itself in those loud rat-tats those long rolls and flourishes of drumming looking at her dennis ruefully remembered the red notebook he wondered what sort of a figure he was cutting now but the sight of anne and gambo swimming past and with her eyes almost shut and sleeping as it were on the sustaining wings of movement and music dissipated these preoccupations male and female created he them there they were anne and gambo and a hundred couples more all stepping harmoniously together to the old tune of male and female created he them but dennis sat apart he alone lacked his complementary opposite they were all coupled but he all but he somebody touched him on the shoulder and he looked up it was henry wimbush i never showed you our oaken drain pipes he said some of the ones we dug up are lying quite close to here would you like to come and see them dennis got up and they walked off together into the darkness the music grew fainter behind them some of the higher notes faded out altogether jenny's drumming and the steady sawing of the bass throbbed on tuneless and meaningless in their ears 
henry wimbush halted here we are he said and taking an electric torch out of his pocket he cast a dim beam over two or three blackened sections of tree trunk scooped out into the semblance of pipes which were lying forlornly in a little depression in the ground very interesting said dennis with a rather tepid enthusiasm they sat down on the grass a faint white glare rising from behind a belt of trees indicated the position of the dancing floor the music was nothing but a muffled rhythmic pulse i shall be glad said henry wimbush when this function comes at last to an end i can believe it i do not know how it is mr wimbush continued but the spectacle of numbers of my fellow creatures in a state of agitation moves in me a certain weariness rather than any gaiety or excitement the fact is they don't very much interest me they aren't in my line you follow me i could never take much interest for example in a collection of postage stamps primitives or seventeenth-century books yes they are my line but stamps no i don't know anything about them they're not my line they don't interest me they give me no emotion it's rather the same with people i'm afraid i'm more at home with these pipes he jerked his head sideways towards the hollowed logs the trouble with the people and events of the present is that you never know anything about them what do i know of contemporary politics nothing what do i know of the people i see round about me nothing what they think of me or of anything else in the world what they will do in five minutes time are things i can't guess at for all i know you may suddenly jump up and try to murder me in a moment's time oh come come said dennis true mr wimbush continued the little i know about your past is certainly reassuring but i know nothing of your present and neither you nor i know anything of your future it's appalling in living people one is dealing with unknown and unknowable quantities one can only hope to find out anything about them by a long series of the most disagreeable and boring human contact involving a terrible expense of time it's the same with current events how can i find out anything about them except by devoting years to the most exhausting first-hand study involving once more an endless number of the most unpleasant contacts no give me the past it doesn't change it's all there in black and white and you can get to know about it comfortably and decorously and above all privately by reading by reading i know a great deal of caesar borgia of st francis of dr johnson a few weeks have made me thoroughly acquainted with these interesting characters and i have been spared the tedious and revolting process of getting to know them by personal contact which i should have to do if they were living now how gay and delightful life would be if one could get rid of all the human contacts perhaps in the future when machines have attained to a state of perfection for i confess that i am like godwin and shelley a believer in perfectibility the perfectibility of machinery then perhaps it will be possible for those who like myself desire it to live in a dignified seclusion surrounded by the delicate attentions of silent and graceful machines and entirely secure from any human intrusion it is a beautiful thought beautiful dennis agreed but what about the desirable human contacts like love and friendship the black silhouette against the darkness shook its head the pleasures even of these contacts are much exaggerated said the polite level voice it seems to me doubtful whether they are equal to the pleasures of private reading and contemplation human contacts have been so highly valued in the past only because reading was not a common accomplishment and because books were scarce and difficult to reproduce the world you must remember is only just becoming literate as reading becomes more and more habitual and widespread an ever-increasing number of people will discover that books will give them all the pleasures of social life and none of its intolerable tedium at present people in search of pleasure naturally tend to congregate in large herds and to make a noise in future their natural tendency will be to seek solitude and quiet the proper study of mankind is books i sometimes think that it may be said dennis he was wondering if anne and gambeau were still dancing together instead of which said mr wimbush with a sigh i must go and see if all is well on the dancing floor they got up and began to walk slowly towards the white glare if all these people were dead henry wimbush went on this festivity would be extremely agreeable nothing would be pleasanter than to read in a well-written book of an open-air ball 
that took place a century ago how charming one would say how pretty and how amusing but when the ball takes place to-day when one finds oneself involved in it then one sees the thing in its true light it turns out to be merely this he waved his hand in the direction of the acetylene flares in my youth he went on after a pause i found myself quite fortuitously involved in a series of the most phantasmagorical amorous intrigues a novelist could have made his fortune out of them and even if i were to tell you in my bold style the details of these adventures you would be amazed at the romantic tale but i assure you while they were happening these romantic adventures they seemed to me no more and no less exciting than any other incident of actual life to climb by night up a rope ladder to a second floor window in an old house in toledo seemed to me while i was actually performing this rather dangerous feat an action as obvious as much to be taken for granted as how shall i put it as quotidian as catching the eight fifty two from surbiton to go to business on a monday morning adventures and romance only take on their adventurous and romantic qualities at second hand live them and they are just a slice of life like the rest in literature they become as charming as this dismal ball would be if we were celebrating its tercentenary they had come to the entrance of the enclosure and stood there blinking in the dazzling light ah if only we were henry wimbush added anne and gambo were still dancing together end of chapter twenty eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty nine of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty nine it was after ten o'clock the dancers had already dispersed and the last lights were being put out tomorrow the tents would be struck the dismantled merry-go-round would be packed into wagons and carted away an expanse of worn grass a shabby brown patch in the wide green of the park would be all that remained chrome fair was over by the edge of the pool two figures lingered no 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 anne was saying in a breathless whisper leaning backwards turning her head from side to side in an effort to escape gambo's kisses no please no her raised voice had become imperative gambo relaxed his embrace a little why not he said i will with a sudden effort anne freed herself you won't she retorted you've tried to take the most unfair advantage of me unfair advantage echoed gambo in genuine surprise yes unfair advantage you attack me after i've been dancing for two hours while i'm still reeling drunk with the movement when i've lost my head when i've got no mind left but only a rhythmical body it's as bad as making love to someone you've drugged or intoxicated gambo laughed angrily call me a white slaver and have done with it luckily said anne i am now completely sobered and if you try and kiss me again i shall box your ears shall we take a few turns round the pool she added the night is delicious for answer gambo made an irritated sound they paced off slowly side by side what i like about the painting of Durga, anne began in her most detached and conversational tone oh damn Durga! gambo was almost shouting from where he stood leaning in an attitude of despair against the parapet of the terrace dennis had seen them the two pale figures in a patch of moonlight far down by the pool's edge he had seen the beginning of what promised to be an endless passionate embracement and at the sight he had fled it was too much he couldn't stand it in another moment he felt he would have burst into irrepressible tears dashing blindly into the house he almost ran into mr scogan who was walking up and down the hall smoking a final pipe hello said mr scogan catching him by the arm dazed and hardly conscious of what he was doing or where he was dennis stood there for a moment like a somnambulist what's the matter mr scogan went on you look disturbed distressed depressed dennis shook his head without replying worried about the cosmos eh mr scogan patted him on the arm i know the feeling he said it's a most distressing symptom what's the point of it all all is vanity 
what's the good of continuing to function if one's doomed to be snuffed out at last along with everything else yes yes i know exactly how you feel it's most distressing if one allows oneself to be distressed but then why allow oneself to be distressed after all we all know that there's no ultimate point but what difference does that make at this point the somnambulist suddenly woke up what he said blinking and frowning at his interlocutor what then breaking away he dashed up the stairs two steps at a time mr scogan ran to the foot of the stairs and called up after him it makes no difference none whatever life is gay all the same always under whatever circumstances under whatever circumstances he added raising his voice to a shout but dennis was already far out of hearing and even if he had not been his mind to-night was proof against all the consolations of philosophy mr scogan replaced his pipe between his teeth and resumed his meditative pacing under any circumstances he repeated to himself it was ungrammatical to begin with was it true and is life really its own reward he wondered when his pipe had burned itself to its stinking conclusion he took a drink of gin and went to bed in ten minutes he was deeply innocently asleep dennis had mechanically undressed and clad in those flowered silk pyjamas of which he was so justly proud was lying face downwards on his bed time passed when at last he looked up the candle which he had left alight at his bedside had burned down almost to the socket he looked at his watch it was nearly half past one his head ached his dry sleepless eyes felt as though they had been bruised from behind and the blood was beating within his ears a loud arterial drum he got up opened the door tiptoed noiselessly along the passage and began to mount the stairs towards the higher floors arrived at the servants quarters under the roof he hesitated then turning to the right he opened a little door at the end of the corridor within was a pitch-dark cupboard-like box-room hot stuffy and smelling of dust and old leather he advanced cautiously into the blackness groping with his hands it was from this den that the ladder went up to the leads of the western tower he found the ladder and set his feet on the rungs noiselessly he lifted the trap-door above his head the moonlit sky was over him he breathed the fresh cool air of the night in a moment he was standing on the leads gazing out over the dim colourless landscape looking perpendicularly down at the terrace seventy feet below why had he climbed up to this high desolate place was it to look at the moon was it to commit suicide as yet he hardly knew death the tears came into his eyes when he thought of it his misery assumed a certain solemnity he was lifted up on the wings of a kind of exaltation it was a mood in which he might have done almost anything however foolish he advanced towards the farther parapet the drop was sheer there and uninterrupted a good leap and perhaps one might clear the narrow terrace and so crash down yet another thirty feet to the sun-baked ground below he paused at the corner of the tower looking now down into the shadowy gulf below now up towards the rare stars and the waning moon he made a gesture with his hand muttered something he could not afterwards remember what but the fact that he had said it aloud gave the utterance a peculiarly terrible significance then he looked down once more into the depths what are you doing dennis questioned a voice from somewhere very close behind him dennis uttered a cry of frightened surprise and very nearly went over the parapet in good earnest his heart was beating terribly and he was pale when recovering himself he turned round in the direction from which the voice had come are you ill in the profound shadow that slept under the eastern parapet of the tower he saw something he had not previously noticed an oblong shape it was a mattress and someone was lying on it since that first memorable night on the tower mary had slept out every evening it was a sort of manifestation of fidelity it gave me a fright she went on to wake up and see you waving your arms and gibbering there what on earth were you doing dennis laughed melodramatically what indeed he said if she hadn't woken up as she did he would be lying in pieces at the bottom of the tower he was certain of that now you hadn't got designs on me i hope mary inquired jumping too rapidly to conclusions 
i didn't know you were here said dennis laughing more bitterly and artificially than before what is the matter dennis he sat down on the edge of the mattress and for all reply went on laughing in the same frightful and improbable tone an hour later he was reposing with his head on mary's knees and she with an affectionate solicitude that was wholly maternal was running her fingers through his tangled hair he had told her everything everything his hopeless love his jealousy his despair his suicide as it were providentially averted by her interposition he had solemnly promised never to think of self-destruction again and now his soul was floating in a sad serenity it was embalmed in the sympathy that mary so generously poured and it was not only in receiving sympathy that dennis found serenity and even a kind of happiness it was also in giving it for if he had told mary everything about his miseries mary reacting to these confidences had told him in return everything or very nearly everything about her own poor mary he was very sorry for her still she might have guessed that ivor wasn't precisely a monument of constancy well she concluded one must put a good face on it she wanted to cry but she wouldn't allow herself to be weak there was a silence do you think asked dennis hesitatingly do you really think that she that gombo i'm sure of it mary answered decisively there was another long pause i don't know what to do about it he said at last utterly dejected you'd better go away advised mary it's the safest thing and the most sensible but i've arranged to stay here three weeks more you must concoct an excuse i suppose you're right i know i am said mary who was recovering all her firm self-possession you can't go on like this can you no i can't go on like this he echoed immensely practical mary invented a plan of action startlingly in the darkness the church clock struck three you must go to bed at once she said i'd no idea it was so late dennis clambered down the ladder cautiously descended the creaking stairs his room was dark the candle had long ago guttered to extinction he got into bed and fell asleep almost at once end of chapter twenty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty of chrome yellow by aldous huxley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty dennis had been called but in spite of the parted curtains he had dropped off again into that drowsy dozy state when sleep becomes a sensual pleasure almost consciously savoured in this condition he might have remained for another hour if he had not been disturbed by a violent rapping at the door come in he mumbled without opening his eyes the latch clicked a hand seized him by the shoulder and he was rudely shaken get up get up his eyelids blinked painfully apart and he saw mary standing over him bright-faced and earnest get up she repeated you must go and send the telegram don't you remember oh lord he threw off the bedclothes his tormentor retired dennis dressed as quickly as he could and ran up the road to the village post office satisfaction glowed within him as he returned he had sent a long telegram which would in a few hours evoke an answer ordering him back to town at once on urgent business it was an act performed a decisive step taken and he so rarely took decisive steps he felt pleased with himself it was with a whetted appetite that he came in to breakfast good morning said mr scogan i hope you're better better you were rather worried about the cosmos last night dennis tried to laugh away the impeachment was i he lightly asked i wish said mr scogan that i had nothing worse to prey on my mind i should be a happy man one is only happy in action dennis enunciated thinking of the telegram he looked out of the window great florid baroque clouds floated high in the blue heaven a wind stirred among the trees and their shaken foliage twinkled and glittered like metal in the sun everything seemed marvellously beautiful at the thought that he would soon be leaving all this beauty he felt a momentary pang but he comforted himself by recollecting how decisively he was acting action he repeated aloud and going over to the sideboard 
he helped himself to an agreeable mixture of bacon and fish breakfast over dennis repaired to the terrace and sitting there raised the enormous bulwark of the times against the possible assaults of mr scogan who showed an unappeased desire to go on talking about the universe secure behind the crackling pages he meditated in the light of this brilliant morning the emotions of last night seemed somehow rather remote and what if he had seen them embracing in the moonlight perhaps it didn't mean much after all and even if it did why shouldn't he stay he felt strong enough to stay strong enough to be aloof disinterested a mere friendly acquaintance and even if he weren't strong enough what time do you think the telegram will arrive asked mary suddenly thrusting in upon him over the top of the paper dennis started guiltily i don't know at all i was only wondering said mary because there's a very good train at three twenty seven and it would be nice if you could catch it wouldn't it awfully nice he agreed weakly he felt as though he were making arrangements for his own funeral train leaves waterloo three twenty seven no flowers mary was gone no he was blowed if he'd let himself be hurried down to the necropolis like this he was blowed the sight of mr scogan looking out with a hungry expression from the drawing-room window made him precipitately hoist the times once more for a long while he kept it hoisted lowering it at last to take another cautious peep at his surroundings he found himself with what astonishment confronted by anne's faint amused malicious smile she was standing before him the woman who was a tree the swaying grace of her movement arrested in a pose that seemed itself a movement how long have you been standing there he asked when he had done gaping at her oh about half an hour i suppose she said airily you were so very deep in your paper head over ears i didn't like to disturb you you look lovely this morning dennis exclaimed it was the first time he had ever had the courage to utter a personal remark of the kind anne held up her hand as though to ward off a blow don't bludgeon me please she sat down on the bench beside him he was a nice boy she thought quite charming and gombo's violent insistences were really becoming rather tiresome why don't you wear white trousers she asked i like you so much in white trousers they're at the wash dennis replied rather curtly this white trouser business was all in the wrong spirit he was just preparing a scheme to manoeuvre the conversation back to the proper path when mr scogan suddenly darted out of the house crossed the terrace with clockwork rapidity and came to a halt in front of the bench on which they were seated to go on with our interesting conversation about the cosmos he began i become more and more convinced that the various parts of the concern are fundamentally discreet but would you mind dennis moving a shade to your right he wedged himself between them on the bench and if you would shift a few inches to the left my dear anne thank you discreet i think was what i was saying you were said anne dennis was speechless they were taking their after luncheon coffee in the library when the telegram arrived dennis blushed guiltily as he took the orange envelope from the salver and tore it open return at once urgent family business it was too ridiculous as if he had any family business wouldn't it be best just to crumple the thing up and put it in his pocket without saying anything about it he looked up mary's large blue china eyes were fixed upon him seriously penetratingly he blushed more deeply than ever hesitated in a horrible uncertainty what's your telegram about mary asked significantly he lost his head i'm afraid he mumbled i'm afraid this means i shall have to go back to town at once he frowned at the telegram ferociously but that's absurd impossible cried anne she had been standing by the window talking to gambo but at dennis's words she came swaying across the room towards him it's urgent he repeated desperately but you've only been here such a short time anne protested i know he said utterly miserable oh if only she could understand women were supposed to have intuition if he must go he must put in mary firmly yes i must he looked at the telegram again for inspiration you see it's urgent family business he explained priscilla got up from her chair in some excitement i had a distinct presentiment of this last night she said a distinct presentiment a mere coincidence no doubt said mary brushing mrs wimbush out of the conversation 
there's a very good train at three twenty seven she looked at the clock on the mantelpiece you'll have nice time to pack i'll order the motor at once henry wimbush rang the bell the funeral was well under way it was awful awful i am wretched you should be going said anne dennis turned towards her she really did look wretched he abandoned himself hopelessly fatalistically to his destiny this was what came of action of doing something decisive if only he'd just let things drift if only i shall miss your conversation said mr scogan mary looked at the clock again i think perhaps you ought to go and pack she said obediently dennis left the room never again he said to himself never again would he do anything decisive camlet west bowlby nipswich for timpany spaven delaware and then all the other stations and then finally london the thought of the journey appalled him and what on earth was he going to do in london when he got there he climbed wearily up the stairs it was time for him to lay himself in his coffin the car was at the door the hearse the whole party had assembled to see him go good-bye good-bye mechanically he tapped the barometer that hung in the porch the needle stirred perceptibly to the left a sudden smile lighted up his lugubrious face it sinks and i am ready to depart he said quoting landor with an exquisite aptness he looked quickly round from face to face nobody had noticed he climbed into the hearse End of chapter 30 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine End of Chrome Yellow by Aldous Huxley